Welcome everyone to my limited set review for Wilds of Eldraine. This review is mostly going to focus on draft and sealed, but there might be a few mentions of constructed formats as well. And today's set review will be using a letter grade system. We've got a rating system going all the way from an S, which is the highest grade a card can get, and all the way down to an F, which is the worst grade a card can possibly get. And to give you a few examples of the previous set, which I guess the last standard set was March of the Machine, and Sunfall here, a perfect example of an S-tier level card. This is a ridiculous bomb, because these cards can often just win you the game on the spot, or make it very difficult for the opponent to recover. Even if you're behind on board, a card like Sunfall, of course, can catch you back up and give you a win condition at the same time. There's very few S-tier level cards in every set, maybe just a handful, so always be on the lookout for them. Next we have the A tier level cards. These are still absolute bombs that can easily win you a game. They might be a little easier to interact with than some of the S tier level cards, but if unanswered these will most definitely win you the game. Cards like Glissa, Herald of Predation, we've got the Zephyr Singer potentially giving some of your creatures flying, also incredibly powerful. And as you'll notice, most A tier and S tier level cards are either rare or mythic. It's pretty unusual for an uncommon to get an A grade. Next up we've got the B tier. These are still great playables, so if you're playing a draft, let's say, and you open a B tier level card, pack one, pick one, and there's no bombs, then you're still pretty happy to pick those up, and of course uh, they'll strongly pull you into its colors. So the best commons in each color will often get a B grade, and uh, unconditional removal, of course, is at a premium and limited, so derision is a B. And even a preening champion, which may not seem like the most exciting card at first glance, but it ended up being a very important role player in the set as an enabler for Convoke, but also just an evasive threat. So again, some of the best commons might get a B grade, but it's mostly uncommons in the B category. And then we get to the C+, which are good playables. So unlike some of the B level cards, C plus removal spells are a bit more conditional in nature. You might have to wait for a creature to be tapped or attacking for a cut short, for instance. But these are still cards you're pretty happy to add to your deck. And if you're playing those colors, you're unlikely to cut them from your sealed deck or draft deck. And another example, a Tidal Terror, just a flexible creature that can be cycled early, has a bit more utility than some of the other cards we'll see. Then we get to the C grade. These are decent filler cards, but it does still mean that sometimes they will get cut from your limited decks. Also depends on synergy. For instance, a Sentinel was a Knight. Knights had a small sub-theme in the set, so if you are a Knight deck, then you might prefer the Sentinel. If you're not a Knight deck, then it may end up getting cut. These are just your bread and butter creatures for limited, and uh, most limited decks will have a decent amount of these. But again, you can often end up cutting them as well. Another example are combat tricks. You might want one or two of these in your limited decks, especially if you're short on removal. These are a way to get your creatures through for damage, attack into larger blockers, but you don't want too many of them, so during the draft you should not really prioritize these C tier level cards. Then we get to the D tier, and these are bad filler cards, cards you're gonna cut from your deck more often than not. Doesn't mean you're never gonna play these, but as a general rule of thumb you're probably better off not including them in your decks, or maybe they are more conditional sideboard cards that you can bring in if you're playing best of three, but you're gonna leave out your best of one deck. Glistening Deluge, a great example as a pretty conditional board wipe. And then a Halo Hopper, also not the most exciting creature, unless you're all in on the Convoke theme, and even then it may not be all that great. And then we get to the unplayables, and there's very few of these in uh, most limited sets these days, but the Perverter of Truth giving the opponent an immediate advantage while you have to wait to untap with your creature is an example of a card that's probably going to do more harm than good, so you're better off not including in your decks whatsoever. So this just a brief overview of the previous set and how I like to grade my cards. And if you represent all these grades on a curve, going from F all the way to an S, and of course plotting the number of cards on the Y axis, you kind of get this nice bell curve where there's very few F tier level cards, very few S tier, and then there's quite a few C and C pluses. Most of your limited decks are gonna have lots of C and C plus cards, hopefully a couple Bs and As, 
but uh, you're not guaranteed to have an S in every deck, but hopefully you can avoid the F and D level cards. And then we can continue explaining the new sets mechanics. And there's quite a few interesting mechanics in Wilds of Eldraine, one of them being the new roll enchantments. So let's take a look at the Unassuming Sage, a 2 mana 2-2. Two, two. When it enters, you can pay 2 mana. If you do, create a Sorcerer token that's attached to it. A token enchantment with the Aura subtype as well as the Roll subtype. And in this case, the Sorcerer says Enchant a Creature. Enchant a Creature gets plus 1 plus 1 and has, whenever this creature attacks, Scry 1. And uh, there's different types of rolls. As we see here, we have another example with the... Ariat's Whisper, a 4 mana sorcery, says target opponent discards 2 cards and then create a wicked roll token attached up to one target creature you control. So as you can see these rolls can appear on creatures, but they can also appear on sorceries and other types of cards as kind of a beneficial effect. And if we take a look at the wicked roll, also gives plus 1 plus 1 to the enchanted creature. And when this aura is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses 1 life. Now, important to note about rolls is that one creature that you control can only be enchanted by a single roll that you control at the same time. So let's say I played my Unassuming Sage, paying two mana, attaching Sorcerer roll to it, and then afterwards play Ariat's Whisper, and I want to put the Wicked roll on my Unassuming Sage, then now the Sorcerer roll will fall off going to the graveyard, and that can also potentially enable some synergies, as we'll see later. There are quite a few cards that care about enchantments ending up in the graveyard, so roll tokens do briefly go to the graveyard before disappearing. But there is kind of an exception, because if we take a look at the cursed roll in the bottom right, it says enchant creature. Enchanted creature has base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. So this is not an effect you typically want to put on your own creature. So you're going to try and target the opponent's creatures with it to turn them into 1-1s. One, but the opponent could still have a different role that they control attached to that same creature that's also cursed. So that's kind of the exception of how a creature could end up with two different roles, but those roles are still controlled by two different players, because if you curse the opponent's creature, you're still the one controlling the cursed aura role. So just to point that out, could be relevant in some situations. And uh, I've also taken the liberty of switching the Cursed and Wicked arts because uh, those got messed up when printing the tokens. So if you're playing paper, I don't want to confuse you, the Wicked and Cursed art might be reversed, but I think they'll fix that for the digital version. So if we go over all the rolls, monsters will get plus one plus one and trample, sorcerers plus one plus one and when they attack, scry one. Then we've got a royal roll giving plus one plus one and then ward one to that creature as well. We've got a young hero saying when this creature attacks, if its toughness is three or less, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So that can grow your tiny creatures into larger threats than wicked plus one plus one and drain one if the aura goes to the graveyard, which of course includes when the creature goes to the graveyard as well. And then cursed, which we're going to try and put on the opponent's creatures. And if our creature is cursed, then hopefully we've got some way of uh, still making use of it. Of course, cursed does not remove any abilities of your creatures, just turns it into a base power and toughness 1-1. One, one. So you could still have some useful abilities on that creature that you can keep using. So these are the aura rolls. Next up, we move on to the celebration mechanic, which appears only on red and white cards in this set. And examples are Ash Party Crasher and the Grand Ball Guest. So in the case of Ash, we have a 2-2 two, two for 2 with haste. And Celebration says when the Party Crasher attacks, if two or more non-land permanents entered the battlefield under your control this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Uh, we've got the guests saying with Celebration it gets plus one plus one and trample as long as two or more non-land permanents entered the battlefield under your control this turn. So Celebration can definitely vary from card to card. It's not always the same effect. It just cares about two or more non-land permanents entering the battlefield under your control. And there's a few ways to achieve that in the set. We've got a couple cards that generate tokens. For instance, we saw the aura rolls. Those also count as non-land permanents. So if you play a creature that generates one of those rolls, you can already enable celebration on your other creatures. And uh, there's also quite a few cards in the set that generate creature tokens. There's kind of a rat tribal deck that generates a whole bunch of rat tokens. And that deck is going to be pretty good at enabling celebration as well, typically in the red-black. So there's a bit of overlap with the red celebration cards. So that's celebration for you. And then another new mechanic is a bargain. 
and bargain can also appear on all sorts of cards all the way from instants to creatures if we take a look at torch the tower one mana instant deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker but if the spell was bargained instead it deals three damage to that permanent and we scry one and either way we also exile that card if it would uh, go to the graveyard and bargain means we can sacrifice an artifact enchantment or token as we cast the spell to enhance it basically and there's quite a few tokens as you can imagine in the set including the aura roll tokens which we can also sacrifice of course there are also enchantments and then there's quite a few food tokens going around as well that we could maybe sacrifice the one thing you cannot sacrifice to bargain is just a random creature so that's important to keep in mind only enchantments artifacts and tokens easy to remember eat enchantments artifacts tokens eat so that's kind of the mnemonic uh, device that i like to use and then the Hamlet Glutton can be bargained as well, in which case it costs two less to cast, so it goes from seven down to five mana if we sacrifice an enchantment, artifact, or token. Okay, so those are all the new mechanics. Now we'll take a look at the archetype breakdown. And most of the decks in this set will end up being two colors. There's a bit of mana fixing, so you might end up splashing a third, but for the most part I expect decks to be two color, which is a bit different from the previous Eldrain expansion where sometimes you were incentivized to go monocolored, so there's no longer that incentive, and instead we'll often end up in two colors. So blue-white, if you end up blue-white, you might have a few cards that care about tapping opposing creatures down. There's cards to enable those synergies, but there's also a few payoffs for tapping opposing creatures down. Then red-white, as we mentioned, is the celebration deck. So you're going to have some cheaper cards with the celebration mechanic. And then you'll be looking for cards that generate tokens when they enter, or those auras can also help you enable celebration. Then blue-black is the fairy archetype, where you've got some control cards as well, some removal, of course, we're used to seeing in blue-black, but there's quite a few fairies and cards that care about controlling fairies. Then black-green is once again the food archetype, so we've got ways to generate food tokens and ways to spend them other than just gaining life. And then a red-green is kind of the ferocious archetype where you care about controlling often a creature with power 4 or greater to maybe enable some other synergies. But as we're used to with the red-green, you just want to play efficient creatures, have some removal, maybe some combat tricks, and that's what a red-green is about. Blue-red, as usual, uh, cares about instants and sorceries, also has a small adventure theme, and most adventures have also an instant or sorcery attached, so those overlap nicely, and adventures is another recurring mechanic from the original Throne of Eldraine, so I didn't go into too much detail since I assume most people are familiar with it. Then a black-white is the bargain and sacrifice deck, so you've got ways to generate tokens, whether it's food tokens, uh, creature tokens, or those aura roll tokens, and then you've got multiple cards with a bargain mechanic that want you to sacrifice an enchantment artifact or token to enhance their effect. Then black-red is the rat token aggro deck, so if you've got multiple ways to generate rat tokens, these will be 1-1 tokens that cannot block, so that's important to keep in mind. So that deck wants to be turning its creatures sideways, maybe sacrificing some of its tokens, maybe pumping them up with various effects, and there's a few cards that can also specifically enhance your rat tokens. And then a green-white is the enchanted creatures archetype, has a pretty high density of the aura roll tokens, in white, we often see the uh, young hero roll, which can grow one of your smaller creatures. Uh, there's the royal roll, which also appears quite often in green and white. And then green also has quite a few monster roll tokens. So these are all common in green-white. And then finally, blue-green is just a big spell ramp archetype, where you've got the mana acceleration in green, and then blue might have some expensive creatures or even adventures that you can sink all that mana into, and a few ways to reward you for casting big creatures or expensive spells. So that's just a quick breakdown of the two-color archetypes. Doesn't mean you're always going to fall exactly into these archetypes if you draft their respective colors, but it's just to keep in mind that way if you are picking one of these colors early, you can guide your draft accordingly and maybe prioritize certain synergies over others. 
And if you like the content, you can help support the channel by subscribing on Twitch, potentially using your free Twitch Prime subscription, or by becoming a Patreon supporter. That way you'll also get access to a spreadsheet with all these limited card ratings that we're discussing today. And I'll also try to keep those ratings up to date as time goes on, because I'm sure some of these card ratings might fluctuate if some cards end up overperforming. So I'll try to reflect that in the updated card ratings as well. And you'll also get access to all my previous set reviews, and there's almost 20 of them now, I think. So plenty of content to get access to by becoming a Patreon supporter. And I like to start by taking a look at the multicolor cards first, because as we mentioned with the archetype breakdown, that gives us a good idea what the set is all about and which cards to pay attention to. And our first card of the set is Agatha of the Vile Cauldron. Red and a green for a 1-1 legendary human warlock at Mythic. Says activated abilities of creatures you control cost X less to activate, where X is Agatha's power. And this effect cannot reduce the mana in that cost to less than 1 mana. And then for 6 mana, other creatures we control get plus 1 plus 1 and gain trample and haste until end of turn. So Agatha reduces its own ability to 5 at the very least. If you've got other ways to increase its power, can make it even cheaper. Still kind of expensive to just give plus 1 plus 1 trample and haste. Assuming you activate the ability, you probably didn't have the mana to cast another creature alongside it, so the haste part doesn't seem super relevant. So yeah, Agatha doesn't strike me like a particularly exciting card. Might be more aimed for the uh, commander format as a fun commander to build around, but as far as limited is concerned, I'm just gonna give it a C. Not the best card out there. Next is the Apprentice Folly. Two, a blue and a red for a rare saga, and the first two chapters are the same. Choose target non-token creature you control that doesn't have the same name as a token you control. Okay, and then create a token that's a copy of it, except it isn't legendary and is a reflection in addition to its other types and also has haste. So ideally, if we play the Apprentice's Folly, we have at least two different creatures in play. That way we're guaranteed to make two different tokens that don't have the same name, so we get a bit more value. Ideally we're also copying either large creatures that can get a nice bit of damage in, or creatures with good enter the battlefield abilities, because on the third and final chapter we have to sacrifice all reflections we control. So we don't get to keep those tokens forever. Maybe we sacrifice some of them to a bargain card, that's another good way to make use of them. So those are the types of synergies you want to look for if you take the Apprentice's Folly. But the power level is pretty high if you can get the most out of all the chapters here. So I'm going to start with a B grade for the Apprentice's Folly. Interesting build around, but um, it's not always going to be amazing. So want to definitely draft around it a little bit. And next is Ash Party Crasher. We've already seen it. 2 mana, 2-2 two, two haste in red-white. And Celebration can potentially give it a plus 1 plus 1 counter. So it can scale quite nicely as the game progresses, but if you can start your curve with a turn 2 Ash, then uh, you can definitely be on the front foot from the start of the game. So Ash seems pretty great as well. Good payoff for the red-white Celebration deck. And there's not a ton of Celebration payoffs, but uh, they're mostly on the cheaper side of the curve. So if you can get the Celebration creatures in play on turn 2 and then enhance them as the game progresses, that's kind of where you want to be with red-white. So Ash gets a B. Next is Ariette of the Charmed Apple, one a white and a black, for a 2-4 legendary human warlock at Mythic, and says each creature that's enchanted by an aura you control can't attack you or a planeswalker you control. So where could this be relevant? Let's say you enchant an opposing creature with the uh, cursed enchantment. It's now a base power and toughness 1-1, one, one. so now it can't attack you even as a 1-1. One, one. So that's where that could potentially come up. And then at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses X life and you gain X life, where X is the number of auras you control. So you'll steadily start draining the opponent if you have other creatures with these aura enchantments attached to them. I guess another situation where it could come up that that creature can't attack you is if you control a creature with an aura attached and then the opponent tries to steal it with like an act of treason effect and then they can no longer attack you with it because you're still the one controlling the aura. I don't think that first ability is going to be super relevant, but slowly draining the opponent with your enchanted creatures certainly is. So Ariat is decent, 3 mana 2, 4, reasonable enough stats. So yeah, let's go with C plus for Ariat. Bit of a build around for sure. Next is the Fawn's Bane Troll 
4 mana for a 4-4 four, four troll in black green at rare. And when it enters the battlefield, create a monster roll token attached to it. So giving it plus one plus one and trample. Then we can pay one mana, sacrifice an aura attached to the troll, and then it fights target creature we don't control. And if that creature would die, exile it instead. You can only use that as a sorcery. So we essentially get a four mana 5-5 five, five trampler that for one mana can turn into a 4-4 four, four and fight. That seems pretty good. And there might be ways to put more aura rolls on the troll afterwards and then you can potentially fight once again so there's even more potential there so yeah this seems like an absolute bomb definitely an a level card and a strong incentive to go black green or potentially even splash this especially in green there might be more mana fixing so you could splash the black half of it next is the goose mother x a green and a blue for a rare legendary bird hydra at least a 2-2 with flying and it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. And when it enters, create half X food tokens rounded up. So let's say we cast this for X equals one. It will be a three, three flyer that generates one food token. Not bad. And whenever the goose mother attacks, we may sacrifice a food if we do draw a card. So then we can turn those extra food tokens into card advantage. So this card seems awesome. Even if this is the only food-related card in your deck, it's great by itself. But in a more dedicated food deck, it gets even better, as you can maybe use those food tokens for other abilities, and you might have more food to sacrifice in general. So yeah, the Goose Mother, another bomb-level card for sure. I'll give it an A. Next is Greta, Sweet Tooth, Scourge. One, a black and a green for a 3-3 legendary human warrior at Uncommon. And when she enters the battlefield, create a food token. Can pay a green, sacrifice a food to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. Activate only as a sorcery. Or we can pay one on a black, sacrifice a food, and then we draw a card and lose one life. So we've got multiple ways to use food tokens. Can of course always just pay two mana, sack a food, and gain three life. But uh, potentially getting those plus one counters or drawing cards can be a bit more exciting. But the fact that we get both here and a lot of different uh, options to choose from is great. So Greta seems like an awesome build around for the black green food deck where you're going to be looking for more ways to generate food tokens. So you can potentially uh, keep using those card draw or plus one counter abilities. So Greta gets a B. Next is Hilda of the Icy Crown, and this is another one of our witches in the set. Two, a white and a blue for a 3-4 legendary human warlock at Mythic, and says whenever we tap an untapped creature an opponent controls, we can pay one generic mana. When we do, choose between creating a 4-4 white and blue elemental creature token, putting a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control, or we can scry two and then draw a card. So all three of these abilities are obviously amazing, only need to pay one mana to get to choose one of them. Now the problem is, how do we enable Hilda? It's not like she enables her own abilities by tapping opposing creatures down. So it's definitely a build around card. If you open this pack one, pick one, probably worth taking and trying to build around. Time will tell how much uh, Hilda is gonna contribute to your win percentage but uh, definitely seems worth a try at the very least. So I'm gonna go with B for Hilda. Not a bomb like some of the other cards we've seen so far, because it does require quite a bit of setup. But assuming you draft the blue-white tap opposing creatures down deck, then Hilda is gonna be probably the best payoff available. And uh, yeah, definitely excited to build around it. So we'll go for a B. Next is Johan Apprentice Sorcerer, two a blue and a red for a 2-5 legendary human wizard at Uncommon. So it's got a pretty large behind and says we may look at the top card of your library at any time. And once each turn we may cast an instant or sorcery spell from the top of our library. Okay, so important to note about Johan's ability is that we can also cast the instants and sorceries that are attached to adventure cards because often adventure creatures will have an instant or sorcery we can cast first. So if we see one of those adventure creatures on top of the deck, we can cast the adventure part of it. So we can't simply cast a creature half. We have to start with the actual adventure. So that's an extra synergy that could be relevant with Johan. Now, truth be told, most limited decks only have so many of these instants and sorceries. So it's not like you're going to get to cast a spell off the top of the deck every other turn even. So you have to kind of 
moderate your expectations with the card advantage that Johan can provide. But hopefully you've got a lot of creatures that also have the adventure, so you can at least uh, have a higher density of spells you can cast off the top of the deck. So I'm going to start with a C plus for Johan, but I can definitely see it overperforming in a deck that has mostly just adventure creatures, where you can cast even more stuff off the top of the deck. Otherwise you might only have like a handful of instants and sorceries in your deck. But of course, blue red also incentivizes you for having a lot of them. So I'm going to go with C+, but could easily end up in the B range instead. And next is Likeness Looter, a blue and a black for a 1-1, a rare fairy shapeshifter. Has flying, and then it has the looting ability, can tap to draw a card and then discard a card. And uh, it's easy to underestimate how powerful this effect is in Limited. Once you're in the late game and you're drawing lands you don't need, you can just ship them to the graveyard and hopefully find more action. And then there's more. We can pay X mana and then the looter becomes a copy of target creature card in your graveyard with mana value X, except it has flying and this ability, and we can only use that as a sorcery. So yeah, we can keep upgrading the looter into better and better creatures potentially once we no longer need to tap to draw and discard. So the looter is awesome and uh, at the very least gets a B grade. It is still just a 1-1 flyer. There are a couple effects in this set to punish one toughness. So there is a little bit of uh, risk involved with running too many one toughness creatures. But the effects here are all very powerful and this is a very strong incentive to go blue-black fairies. Next is Neva, stalked by nightmares. Two a white and a black for a 2 2 legendary human noble at uncommon. She has menace, and when Neva enters the battlefield, return target creature or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. So it can provide immediate card advantage. And whenever an enchantment you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on Neva and then scry one. So four mana for a 2 2 menace, definitely on the smaller side. But assuming you can get immediate card advantage when she enters, that's definitely gonna help her cause. And then uh, Black White will have quite a few cards with the Aura Roll tokens. So those are enchantments that can naturally end up in the graveyard if that creature dies, or if you maybe sacrifice something to a bargain card, that could also help. So there's quite a bit of synergy here, and uh, Neva seems quite strong. Now, I'm hesitant to go all the way up to B for Neva since it is still kind of on the smaller side in terms of power and toughness. And uh, if you're trying to play this on curve, there may not be anything in the graveyard yet. So then you're not getting full value, but uh, at the very least a C plus and still, of course, a great incentive for the black-white sacrifice deck. Next is Obira, a dreaming duelist, blue and a black for an uncommon fairy warrior. It's also legendary. It's a 2-2 with flash and flying, and whenever another fairy enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life. So they don't want you to have multiple Obiras on the battlefield, I guess it would be a little bit too powerful. But uh, yeah, this card is great. Having flash means you can maybe keep up your mana to cast a counter spell. There's quite a few in this set, and other instant speed removal. But then you can always flash in Obira end of turn, and then start attacking while draining the opponents as you play more fairies. So this card also seems excellent, and uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna go for a B on Obira, just a very cheap and efficient threat. Next is Rowan, Scion of War, one a black and a red, for a 4-2, a legendary human wizard at Mythic, and Rowan has Menace, and can also tap, saying spells you cast this turn that are black and or red, Cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you lost this turn. Can only use it as a sorcery. So I don't think there's many situations where you can actively use that ability to discount your spells. There's like maybe one or two cards that can make you pay life in addition to uh, its other costs. So that's maybe a way to get a discount. But yeah, I don't expect that mana discount ability to be super relevant. So essentially getting a three mana 4-2 with Menace. Okay, so nothing too exciting, definitely doesn't deserve to be a mythic at that rate, but uh, maybe in other formats there's more ways to build around the ability, of course. So as far as limited is concerned, probably C+. I don't think I would cut this from my black-red decks, 4 2 minus for 3 seems good enough, but definitely not an incentive to take it early and go black-red, but if I happen to already be in black-red, I'll happily play it. Next is Ruby, a Daring Tracker. 
a red and a green for a 1-2 uncommon legendary human scout. Ruby has haste and can tap to add a red or a green to our mana pool, so this can help us ramp into our bigger spells. And whenever Ruby attacks while we control a creature with power 4 or greater, she gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So Ruby is a perfect way to ramp into your bigger stuff, but in the late game can still attack as a 3-4, so that's pretty significant. So yeah, this seems like an awesome uncommon to uh, build your red-green deck around, and we'll get a B. Next is Sheree of Numbing Depths. Two a uh, white and a blue for a 2-3 legendary merfolk wizard and uncommon. And when Sheree enters the battlefield, tap target creature an opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. So stun counters are back. For those that aren't familiar, they say if a permanent with a stun counter would become untapped, remove one from it instead. So the opponent's creature won't be untapping in their next turn. So we can uh, yeah lock down a creature for quite some time. And whenever we tap one or more untapped creatures your opponents control, draw a card, and this only triggers once each turn. So Sheree works very nicely with other tap abilities, and there's quite a few in blue-white as we'll see later. So a very nice build around, provides immediate value when you play her, tapping a creature down and drawing a card. So another very fun build around uncommon, and will work very nicely with the uh, Hilda of the Icy Crown as well, of course. Next is Sir Armand the Redeemer, 3 a green and a white for a 4-4 legendary human knight at uncommon, and when Sir Armand enters the battlefield, create a monster roll token attached to another target creature you control, and enchanted creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1. So yeah, Sir Armand seems pretty awesome. Now the only drawback is that it cannot enchant itself with a monster roll token, that would be even better in case we don't have any other creatures in play but uh, usually not a problem in green-white, creatures will be plentiful. And there's even the upside of potentially growing a creature that's enchanted by an opposing cursed roll token. So if the opponent turns a creature into 1-1, one, one, it will still get plus 1 plus 1 thanks to Sir Armand, so it's not completely useless. So another very fun build round for the green-white enchanted deck, which will have a high density of these roll tokens, so it gets a B. Next is Talion, the Kindly Lord. Two, a blue and a black. For a legendary fairy noble at Mythic, it's a 3-4 with flying. So already 3-4 flying for 4, pretty decent. And then as Talion enters battlefield, choose a number between 1 and 10. Okay, and whenever an opponent casts a spell with mana value, power or toughness equal to the chosen number, that player loses 2 life and we draw a card. So this ability seems awesome and will lead to some pretty interesting uh, thought experiments about which number is the most ideal to name. can probably crunch the numbers already and figure out the ideal number. Uh, as far as constructed is concerned, I'm guessing the ideal number will be 2. That way if the opponent tries to remove your talion with, let's say, uh, go for the throat, you'll at least get to draw a card and make the opponent lose two life. In limited it might be a little bit different since most removal spells tend to cost a bit more mana, but um, yeah I'm guessing like two or three is probably gonna be the ideal number to name. So yeah, very powerful card, interesting to think about, but uh, in terms of card rating it's definitely an absolute bomb, so at the very least an A. Might even inch its way into the S tier, but it is still a creature that can be removed with most removal spells. Uh, just make sure that your answer is not cursing it with the 1-1 uh, frog enchantment, because it's still going to have the ability, and that's what you care about the most. Next is Totenton's Swarm Piper. One, a black and a red for a 2-3 a legendary human warlock bard at uncommon. And this will be a nice build around for the rats aggro deck, because whenever Totentons or another non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token that cannot block. And for one on a black target attacking rat we control gains a death touch until end of turn. So a good incentive for the opponent not to block your rats is if you can give them death touch at any point. So then only maybe first ranking creatures will be able to block them profitably, and there's not many of those, at least not on defense. So yeah, Totentons will be an awesome build around for the black-red deck. 
Now, outside of the red synergy deck, maybe not the most exciting, a 2-3 that will maybe generate one or two red tokens. So definitely need to be committed to the red theme. But yeah, assuming you've got a lot of ways to generate red tokens and maybe ways to sacrifice them, then uh, I imagine this will be pretty solid. I'm going to start with a C+, since again, you do need to be pretty committed to the theme and uh, maybe not as powerful as some of the other uncommons we've seen so far. But uh, yeah, at the very least, a C+. Plus. Next is Troyan Gutsy Explorer 1, a green and a blue for a 1-3 legendary Vidalcan Scout at Uncommon. Can tap to add green and blue to our mana pool, but we can only spend it to cast a spell with mana value of 5 or greater, or spells with X and their mana costs. And we can also pay a blue, tap it, and then draw a card and then discard a card. So it has that looting ability, which as we mentioned is incredibly valuable. So Troyon seems great for the blue-green deck, where we're going to try and ramp into some expensive spells. Then in the late game, once you're out of spells to cast, it can still help you find more. So it kind of does it all. Gets a B for sure. Then we've got Will, Scion of Peace. This is a Rowan's counterpart and doesn't get much better. This a 3-mana 2-4 in blue-white has Vigilance instead of Menace and can tap, saying spells you cast this turn that are white and or blue cost X less to cast, where X is the amount of life you gained this turn, and can also only use it as a sorcery. So there are probably more ways to gain life and enable Will's ability as there are to lose life in your own turn, so lifelink creatures will be at a premium if you've got Will in the deck, but um, yeah, I don't expect to use that ability very often. Can maybe synergize with food tokens, although if you're paying two mana to gain three, you're only really netting one mana total, so it's still not that exciting. Although at least, thanks to Vigilance, you can potentially attack with Will and then afterwards still tap it for mana, so that could be somewhat useful. But yeah, I'm still not particularly excited about this card, so if I'm already blue-white, sure I'll play it, but it's not a card that's an incentive for me to go blue-white. So somewhere in the C, C plus category. Next is Yena, a red tooth regent 2, a green and a white for a 4-4 legendary elf noble at rare and can pay 2 mana, tap it and choose target enchantment we control that doesn't have the same name as another permanent we control. Okay, and then I create a token that's a copy of it except it isn't legendary and if the token happened to be an aura like our various roll aura tokens then untap Yena and Scry 2, and then only activate this as a sorcery. So there's quite a bit going on here, but TLDR, Yena copies your enchantments, and you can't necessarily copy the same enchantment more than once. Pretty good ability, and the green-white deck, as we saw, cares about the aura roll tokens, so hopefully you've got a wide range of them, so you can copy different ones and hopefully you also have a lot of creatures to enchant, because again, a creature can only have one roll on it at the same time, but uh, still a 4-mana 4-4, four four, so at the end of the day, still decent stats. So yeah, Yana seems great, and uh, at the very least, worthy of a B. Next, we have Beluna, Grand Squall, green, blue, and red, so one of the few three-color cards in the set might actually be the only one, and this is a legendary giant noble at Mythic, and it's an adventure creature, so we can either just go straight for the creature half, which is 3 mana 4-4 four, four, trample, saying permanent spells we cast that have an adventure cost 1 less to cast, so pretty good effect and a nice build around for the adventure deck, or we can first cast the Seek Thrills, which is a 5 mana instant, saying mill 7 cards and then put all cards that have an adventure from among the milled cards into your hand, and then the Baluna will go to the exile zone, where it's waiting to be cast as its creature half. It is a little awkward in the sense that curving out, it would be nice to be able to play this on turn three and then later play the adventure, but that's not how it works. So we have to commit to casting the five mana instant first if we also wanna get the creature half afterwards. So we'll have to wait a little bit longer. So that makes it maybe a little bit more awkward than I would like it to be. But I guess, on the other hand, if you're trying to play a three-color deck, you're not guaranteed to have all three colors on turn three, so it might take you some time to find your missing third color, in which case you'll have time to first cast the instant adventure, and then afterwards the creature, which is still pretty good, even in the late game as a 4-4 trampler. 
So a pretty good card. The only potential hurdle you have to deal with is that it is three colors and not all decks are equipped to splash a third color. So you will need to prioritize mana fixing. So I'll give Baluna a B. Very powerful in the right deck, but a pretty big commitment to both mana fixing as well as getting enough adventures to get the most out of it. Then we get to some of our multicolor adventures, which is something we haven't seen in Throne of Eldraine. So this is new. We have creatures that have an adventure in a different color altogether. So ideally we are playing a black red deck if we're putting a Kalos Salsword in our deck, but in a pinch you could also play this outside of a black red deck if you just want to cast the creature half. Pretty rare that you only want to cast the adventure side of it, but that's also possible if you don't have the mana fixing and uh, still need to get enough playables for your deck. But uh, let's assume we are playing a black-red deck or the corresponding multicolor deck when evaluating these most of the time. And the Sellsword is a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two add uncommon human soldier. And when the Sellsword enters a battlefield, it enters with a plus one plus one counter on it for each creature that died under your control this turn. So can maybe set up an attack, some creatures trade, play this second main phase, picks up one or two counters. But we could also use the adventure first to help enable the plus one counters because we can burn together for a single red. It's a sorcery saying target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to any other target, including the opponent directly if you want to, but you also have to sacrifice it. So that's the drawback, but by sacrificing a creature, there's one more creature that died. So that's one more plus one counter on the cell sword. So yeah, if you play this on turn two, it's not that exciting. So ideally you can play this in your rat aggro deck where you can maybe sacrifice a rat token to finish off a one toughness creature or maybe after attacking, you can finish off a different creature that blocked something that uh, attacked. Let's give the cell sword a C plus overall. Seems pretty solid, bit quirky and not always all that easy to set up. But assuming you're red black and relatively aggressive, I think you'll get good value out of this. Next up we have the Cruel Somnophage, which is a rare adventure creature. So one on a black, if we just want to cast the creature right away, which has power and toughness equal to the number of creature cards in all graveyards. So both your graveyard as well as the opponent's. But you can also cast the Sorcery first, which is one on a blue, and then a target player mills four cards. This card I could easily see playing outside of blue-black if you're just playing black as something that can scale pretty nicely as the game progresses. The only problem is don't play this on turn two when graveyards are empty, because then this will quickly fill your graveyard for you, which is not where you want to be. But uh, yeah, in blue-black especially, this can mill both the opponent as well as yourself. There's probably more payoffs for milling yourself in this set. It's not all that realistic to fully mill the opponent out, so that's not really a supported archetype unlike the original Throne of Eldraine. So milling yourself has the advantage of potentially putting some creatures there that you can recur with other effects, and of course will also grow the Somnophage. So I like B for Somnophage. Seems pretty sweet. Then we've got a Decadent Dragon 2 and Double Red for a rare dragon, and just if we cast a creature, it's a 4-4 with flying, trample, and when it attacks, create a treasure token. So already, if that's the entire card, this would have been probably a bomb level card. But there's more. Expensive taste, 2 in a black, instant, saying exile the top 2 cards of target opponent's library phase down, and you may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. So this curves very nicely, can play the three mana adventure and then play the dragon. And then the treasure tokens will help you cast those cards because what it doesn't say with the adventure is that it will automatically fix colors when casting those spells, which is something we're kind of used to seeing on a lot of these effects. So we do have to fix our own colors. So hopefully the dragon survives to make a couple treasures and uh, that will help in casting off-color spells. You can also play a lands from the opponent, because it says you can play those spells, not simply cast. So if we exile a land and then a spell of the corresponding color, that can also help out. Either way, this seems an awesome card, and even if the opponent answers it right away, hopefully we got a bit of value from the adventure. Easy A, and one of the best uh, A grades that I'll be handing out today. 
and easily play this in a red deck even if you don't have black mana because a 4-4 flying trample that makes treasures is great. Next is Devouring Sugar Maw, 2 and double black for a rare horror and it's a 6-6 with menace and trample but it does have a drawback. At the beginning of your upkeep you may sacrifice an artifact, enchantment or token. If you don't then we have to tap the Devouring Sugar Maw. So it does require a little bit of tribute but luckily there's an adventure half for dinner one and a white for an instant saying create a one one white human creature token and a food token so now we've got two things to sacrifice to our sugar maw and uh, yeah that will keep it satisfied for a couple turns so it can hopefully get some nice attacks in and then of course if you're playing other cards that can generate food tokens or other creature tokens like the various rats that's an easy way to keep the Sugar Maw attacking. And then uh, if the opponent does have removal for the Sugar Maw, then you at least hopefully still got to make some tokens in the process. Maybe not quite as inherently powerful as some other rares, but uh, at the very least a B seems pretty powerful in the right deck where you can keep it satisfied. And next is the Elusive Otter, which is a single blue for a 1-1 one -one rare otter with prowess saying creatures with power less than the otter's power cannot block it. Unlikely to just play this out on turn 1, because it does have a pretty powerful adventure, Gross Bounty, X and a green for a sorcery, distributing X plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures we control. So a little bit expensive at times if we want to get the most out of a Gross Bounty, but it does seem like a very powerful kind of game ending effect if we build up a board of creatures have a lot of mana available then a groves bounty to pump up the entire squad although at that point the 1-1 one -one with prowess doesn't seem all that exciting anymore so it is a bit of a strange card in that way but uh, even if we were just playing the groves bounty it would already be a decent card so we just kind of get the 1-1 one -one creature on top of it and occasionally I might see like a blue-red aggressive deck that just wants to play the Otter on turn 1 and then can back it up with cheap instants and sorceries to keep enabling prowess. So that could also come up. And then the evasive ability can also make it so the opponent can't easily block the Otter. So pretty good card. I'll go for B for Otter. Next is the Frolicking Familiar, 2 and a blue for a 2-2 two -two Otter Wizard at Uncommon. And it flies and says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So it's not quite prowess. It doesn't trigger off, let's say, enchantments or artifacts, but it's kind of pseudo prowess. And then it also has an adventure, blow off steam, a single red for an instant dealing one damage to any target. So this is one of the couple ways you can punish one toughness creatures in this set. And uh, yeah, this is pretty brutal if you can just kill a creature for one mana and then still play a 2-2 flyer with pseudo prowess afterwards. So this card seems great and uh, also very good in multiples so you can pump up your other familiars with the adventure for just one mana and then add more evasive creatures to the board. So it gets a B for sure. Then we've got the Gingerbread Hunter 4 in a green for a 5-5 giant at uncommon and enters the battlefield creating a food token but we probably want to use the adventure first. Puny Snack is 2 and a black for an instant giving a creature minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn. So pretty solid removal effect. Minus 2 minus 2 usually better than dealing 2 damage to a creature because you can shrink it down and then maybe block it if it was attacking or if it's blocking you can shrink it down and it's less likely that your own creature dies. So a great removal effect to have access to. And then a 5-5 five five that makes a food also pretty solid and also curves nicely into each other so you can play the adventure on turn three and then later play the hunter on turn five so another great adventure card gets a b then we've got the heart flame duelist one and a white for a three one human knight at rare saying instant and sorcery spells you control have a lifelink that's an effect we have seen in the past. Of course, you want to pair it with burn spells, giving author instants and sorceries lifelink. Usually not that relevant, but very good in uh, an aggressive deck where you've got a couple burn spells as your removal to deal damage to opposing creatures. Now you gain that much life as well. And the duelist also comes with an adventure. Heart Flame Slash is 2 and a red to deal 3 damage to any target at instant speed. 
Now, this creature is a little awkward in terms of sequencing. If you want to use the adventure, it costs you three mana, so then you didn't get to play the duelist on turn two, and so maybe you're not curving out perfectly. But uh, still a very efficient package here. Three mana for a three damage at instant speed would already be a very playable card, and we get a free creature on top of it that might gain us some life as well. So perfect for an aggressive red-white deck. I would also play this in just a red deck. Probably wouldn't play this in an only white deck, but of course if you're red-white you'll get the most out of this. So a card seems great, and uh, yeah, at the very least a B. Next is Imodane's Recruiter, which is 2 and a red for a human knight at uncommon. It's a 2-2, two, two, and when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0 and gain haste until end of turn. That does include itself, so if we're just playing this on turn 3, even if we don't have anything else in play, it's essentially a 3-2 with haste, and then it will shrink back down to a 2-2 afterwards. But uh, ideally, we can use the adventure first, 4 and a white, to create two 2-2 two, two white knight creature tokens with vigilance. So a pair of knight tokens with vigilance, and then we can play the recruiter afterwards to bump up the entire squad and to give it haste as well. So it seems pretty great for the right aggressive deck. And train troops by making those knight tokens can also enable our various celebration synergies that care about permanence entering the battlefield. So yeah, the recruiter seems pretty solid as well. And uh, this is also a card I could potentially see myself playing in just a red deck or just a white deck. Both halves of the card are somewhat reasonable. The sorcery may be a bit overpriced at 5 mana. Would expect to pay 4 mana for that effect. But the 3 mana 2-2 two -two that pumps up the team is pretty decent, even in a non-white deck, I would say. But of course, as with most of these adventure cards, ideally you have both colors. So I'll go with B. Next we have Kellen, the Fey-Blooded 2 in a red for a 2-2 legendary human fairy at Mythic. Has a double strike and says other creatures you control get plus one plus so for each aura and equipment attached to Kellen. Okay, so already seems like a very powerful card, but there's more. We have an adventure. The Birthright Boon is one in a white for a sorcery, letting us search our library for an aura or equipment card, reveal it and put it into our hand. So this could be an awesome commander for sure. As far as limited is concerned, there's not actually that many auras or equipment we can search up with the boon, because a lot of the auras in this set come from the aura roll tokens, but those aren't cards you can physically search up in your deck. There's only a single equipment in the entire set. So the birthright boon actually not that amazing, as it turns out, but we still have a 3 mana 2-2 two -two double strike that can potentially get additional power bonuses. Seems like a great card, even if we're not using the Birthright Boon, and of course wants to be paired with other cards that can give it the aura rolls, so we can enhance it and bump up the rest of our team. So at the very least a B for Kellen. If the adventure was actually useful in the set, it might have gotten an A, but uh, yeah, it's just going to be difficult to have a lot of targets for the Boon. But again, just by itself, 2-2 two, two double strike for 3, already a great card. And then can maybe still enhance other creatures as well. So next up we've got the Mosswood Dread Knight. 1 and a green for a 3-2 Trampler at rare. And when it dies, we may cast it from our graveyard as an adventure until the end of our next turn. And the adventure is also pretty great. 1 and a black for a sorcery that lets us draw a card and we lose one life. So ideally, we start by playing the adventure, draw a card, lose one life, then play the 3-2 Trampler for two, then it dies, then we've got a turn to replay the adventure once again, and if we cast the adventure, it goes back into exile where we can replay it as a creature, so it keeps coming back over and over while drawing us cards, so if the opponent can't exile it or maybe shut it down with some sort of enchantment or aura, then you can keep looping it back. And a 3-2 Trampler tends to demand at least a, a trade or some other answer, so it's a powerful recursive threat that provides card advantage, and uh, yeah, seems like an excellent card overall, and I'm potentially even willing to give it an A grade. It's maybe not the biggest creature, but for 2 mana it's just incredibly efficient, 
and uh, the recursion is also great. So very nice incentive for a black green deck. Probably not that exciting outside of black green, but uh, yeah, ideally you've got both colors. Then we've got a Picnic Ruiner 1 and a red for a 2-2 Goblin Rogue and Uncommon. And when the Ruiner attacks, while we control a creature with power 4 or greater, it gains double strike until end of turn. Okay, so play this on turn 2, maybe turn 4 we get a 4-powered creature in play, and then it gains double strike. That's not bad. But we can also use the Adventure, Stolen Goodies, 3 and a green for a sorcery, distributing 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters among any number of target creatures we control. So that's an easy way to achieve a 4-powered creature to give the Ruiner double strike. This card also seems amazing in multiples, as we can potentially stack a bunch of counters onto the double striker. But of course, if we're using the Adventure first and then playing the creature, it won't be able to target itself unless you've got another copy. But uh, yeah, still pretty flexible. You can play it on turn 2 if needed, and then hopefully give it double strike later. But the adventure is certainly worth casting if you've got the colors for it. So another B-level card. Then we've got uh, Pollen Shield Hair, which is 1 and a white for a rare rabbit. It's a 2-2, two -two, saying creature tokens we control get plus 1 plus 1. Now, there aren't actually that many creature tokens outside of the 1-1 one -one rats that cannot block. And if you are playing the rat deck, you're more likely to be black-red. So it's a little bit awkward to get the most out of this ability if you're playing a white deck. Of course, there is a bit of overlap. If you're like a white-red deck, you might have a few rat token makers. Or if you're black-white. But uh, in green-white specifically, you're not going to get a ton of tokens outside of maybe a couple of knights. And then we can also cast the adventure first, Hair Raising, which is single green to give target creature we control Vigilance and plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures we control. So that's a pretty nice bonus if you are a deck that can somehow go wide with a bunch of tokens. Doesn't quite fit into the green-white archetype perfectly, so that's keeping it from getting a super high grade, but easily a C plus still if I'm a green-white. Next is Questing Druid, one and a green for a rare human druid. And if we just want to cast a creature, it's a 1-1, one, one, saying whenever we cast a spell that's white, blue, black, or red, put a plus one plus one counter on Questing Druid. So similar to Quirion Dryad, a blast from the past. But this card is quite a bit better, since it also has an adventure. Seek the Beast is one and a red for an instant, saying exile the top two cards of your library, and until your next end step, you may play those cards. So a very nice kind of impulse draw effect, but even just playing this on turn two and growing it over time seems pretty sweet. So it doesn't take much for Questing Druid to make the deck, and uh, both halves of the card are potentially playable individually, even if you're not a red-green. So important to keep your eye out for these uh, multicolor adventures, because you might discredit the Questing Druid as a playable if you're not playing green, but as it turns out, the adventure by itself is pretty decent, so we'll give it a B. Then we've got Scalding Viper, 1 and a red for a 2-1 Elemental Snake at rare. Says whenever an opponent casts a spell with mana value 3 or less, the Viper deals 1 damage to that player. Okay, 2-1, not that exciting, but the ability could certainly add up over time. And it also has an adventure, Steam Clean, one and a blue for a sorcery, returning a target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. So it is a sorcery, can't quite play the adventure at instant speed, which would make it a lot better. But by bouncing an opposing permanence, maybe we're enabling the ability on the creature half of it, at the very least worthy of a C+, and uh, could potentially go up in value if you're a very aggressive deck that can make a lot of uh, use out of the one damage that kind of adds up over time. Next is Shrouded Shepherd, one and a white for a spirit warrior at uncommon. It's a 2-2 two -two, and when it enters the battlefield target creature you control gets plus two plus two until end of turn. But we can also use the Cleave Shadows first which is one on a blank for a sorcery saying creatures your opponents control get minus one minus one until end of turn. And that ability could be backbreaking if you're facing the rat deck, which will have a bunch of 1-1 one -one tokens in play. And this is yet another way to potentially punish one toughness creatures. 
So that's why I maybe won't be giving those one toughness creatures a very high grade as we'll evaluate some of our cards later, just because there's quite a few effects to punish them. But uh, yeah, as a package, the Shepherd seems pretty decent, and uh, we'll be getting a C plus at the very least. Even if you're only a white deck, it's a 2-2 with a little bit of upside, so it's still potentially playable, but uh, especially in black-white, this card rules. Then we've got the Spell Scorn Coven, three and a black for a 2-3 Fairy Warlock at Uncommon. It flies, and when it enters a battlefield, each opponent discards a card. So already, if we're not even looking at the adventure, this card is pretty decent. 2-3 Flyer makes the opponent discard, and there's more. We can also cast the adventure, take it back, which is a 2 and a blue instant, returning target spell to its owner's hand. So can only target something that's currently on the stack, and then ideally, if it's sending the opponent's only spell back to their hands and they're empty-handed otherwise, we can then follow it up by playing the Coven and making the opponent discard their only card. So that could be an awesome answer to some expensive bomb. But uh, yeah, still, even if we're just playing the 4-mana 2-3 flyer to make them discard, this card's pretty decent. So the blue instant is just upside. And in a blue-black fairy deck, you're going to have more tools to just pass the turn with all your mana untapped, so it will be easier to also keep up the adventure. And if they don't play into it, you might have some other instant speed card draw effect to uh, keep it going. So Coven gets a B, another nice multicolor adventure. Then we've got the Tempest Heart, which is a 3 and a green 3-4 elemental elk at Uncommon. It has Trample, and whenever we cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So it can scale quite nicely as the game goes on. Also important to note about some of these large green creatures, it's always better if they have some sort of ability that could still be relevant if the opponent manages to curse or creature. Because let's say they turn it into a 1-1, then at least the heart will still keep all its plus 1 counters making it bigger, and it will keep the ability to pick up more and more plus 1 counters over time. So just something to keep in mind when evaluating larger green creatures is if they have some sort of ability that stacks nicely with the Cursed Aura. And then we can also cast the Adventure. Scan of the Clouds is one and a blue for an instant, letting us draw two cards and then discard two cards. So no card advantage, but just a bit of card selection. And again, we don't have to cast it, we can just play the heart by itself. But uh, it's just upside that it has that additional adventure. So this will be at its best in blue-green, not only because we can cast both halves of it, but also because we're going to have a higher density of expensive spells to grow the Tempest Heart, because we'll have a bit of ramp and just more expensive cards in general. So I think this is another very solid uncommon, and I'll give it a B. Then we've got the Threadbind Clique, three and a blue for an uncommon fairy, has flying, it's a 3-3, not the most exciting card in modern magic, but still very playable. But it also has an adventure, rip the seams, two and a blue, or two and a white rather, for an instant, destroying target tamped creature. Pretty nice removal effect, especially if you're blue-white, you'll have ample ways of tamping opposing creatures down. So now, even if the opponent has a vigilant creature, for instance, you can still maybe get it with the adventure half. Yeah, if you can curve rip the seams into Threadbind click on turn 4, that's also a very nice curve. So the adventure plays well with the creature in terms of mana. So yeah, another very solid uncommon adventure gets a B. And I would potentially even consider that card for just a white half or even maybe just a blue half. So the flexibility there is nice too, because it does mean that if you pick one of these multicolor adventures as your pack one, pick one, you can still go in a ton of different directions. It's not quite like picking a straight up a multicolor card, pack one, pick one, which uh, commits you to two colors, at least by taking one of these adventures. You can go into a lot of different directions still, which is always very nice and limited if you can keep your options open, stay flexible, see what colors end up being open then you'll end up with a more powerful deck. Either way, next up is Twining Twins, two and double blue for a rare Fairy Wizard. It's a 4-4 with Flying, Vigilance and Ward 1. So a lot of very useful abilities. And there's more, it also has an adventure, Swift Spiral, one and a white for an instant, 
exiling target non-token creature, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So we can essentially blink or flicker one uh, non-token creature, which is a very flexible and useful ability. We can use it to essentially save one of our creatures from removal. We can also use it to essentially get rid of an opposing curse that the opponent might have put on one of our creatures. If they cursed our creature turning it into a 1-1, if we flicker it, then the curse will fall off and then we get the original creature back. Also can be used to re-enable enter the battlefield abilities. We can maybe block a large creature that the opponent's attacking with and then flicker our blocker so it doesn't die but we still soaked up an attack. So the options are endless and we still get a huge flyer even if we're not using the adventure. So again a lot of value to be had with the uh, twins and this seems like a bomb level card to me so it gets an a then we've got the uh, woodland acolyte two and a white for a two two human cleric at uncommon when it enters the battlefield draw a card i'm already sold don't need to add anything else but it also has an adventure mend the wilds is a single green for an instant putting target permanent card from our graveyard on top of our library so if we want to cast both in the same turn, it's essentially 4 mana for a pseudo-eternal witness-like ability, since we'll immediately draw whatever card we put back on top. So that's very nice, but we can also split it up, and uh, even just a 2-2 that draws a card for 3 mana is totally fine. So I think this is like high end of C+, plus, low end of B, so I'll give it a B. And that was our last multicolor card of the set. First white card, Archon of the Wild Rose. We start with a very powerful card here, two and double white, for a rare Archon, 4-4 four, four flyer, saying other creatures you control that are enchanted by auras you control have base, power and toughness, 4-4, four, four, and have flying. Even without any aura rolls, just a 4-4 four, four flyer, 4-4 four, four is already pretty efficient, but uh, doesn't take much to get a lot more value out of this, and could potentially even close out the game the turn we play it if we control a few enchanted creatures. So incredibly powerful, easily a bomb level card, and a strong incentive to go green-white, but even other colors have a good amount of aura roll tokens, but uh, Archon is an awesome first pick, and uh, can easily win the game by itself. Next is Archon's a Glory, a single white for an instant at common, and it has Bargain, so this target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn, if this spell was bargained, it also gains flying and a lifelink until end of turn. Okay, so pretty efficient combo trick, and the bargain makes it significantly better, of course. If you've got a disposable thing to sacrifice, it can also be very good on defense as kind of a surprise flying blocker. And uh, the lifelink also makes it nice in a racing situation. can also use it to just close out the game if the opponent doesn't have any flying blockers back. So, very versatile, but it is a combo trick. Usually you don't need to prioritize them, and you only have room for a couple of these in your limited decks. So, still just gets a C, but as far as combo tricks go, this is a very good one. And next is Armory Mice 1 and a white for a 3-1 mouse at common. It does have Celebration, giving it 2 extra toughness, as long as 2 or more non land permanents enter the battlefield under our control this turn. So there's a couple ways, as I mentioned, to punish one toughness creatures. Not the best card unless you're a very dedicated uh, red-white celebration deck where you can consistently give it extra toughness. But the fact that it will have one toughness during the opponent's turn will expose it to some of those one damage effects. And uh, most opposing two drops will be able to block it if you don't enable celebration. So not the best card late game either as it's just a 3-1 with no relevant utility. So yeah, not completely sold on the Armory Mice. Probably a fine filler to drop for those aggressive red-white decks, but I don't think I would want it in many other decks. So I'll go with a D for Armory Mice. Next is the Besotted Knight, three and a white for a 3-3 human knight at common. And it also has an adventure, creating a royal roll token attached to target creature you control. So that will give it plus one plus one and award one. So definitely better if we can use the adventure first because a four mana three three is pretty unexciting. 
these days. But um, yeah, if we can cast a royal roll and enchant one of our creatures, we can get quite a bit more value. If we wait until turn 5, play the adventure and play the knight in the same turn, that's another way to enable the celebration cards. So that could also be useful. So it seems like a fine role player in a lot of decks. I think I'm still gonna just give it a C, just because the creature half of it is pretty inefficient. But I uh, can definitely see this uh, working out pretty nicely in red-white, but even green-white where you care about those enchantments a bit more. And then black-white might have ways to sacrifice the enchantment as well. So it does fit into multiple archetypes, even if it's kind of unexciting in most of them. And then we've got Break the Spell, a single white instant at common, destroying target enchantments, and if a permanent we controlled or a token was destroyed this way, we also get to draw a card. I'm gonna go with D for Break the Spell. I don't think we'll be seeing too much of this, but if the opponent has some crazy bomb enchantments that you need to take out, then by all means you can add this out of the sideboard. And next is the Charmed Clothier. For a white, for a fairy advisor at common, it's a 3-3 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, create a royal roll token attached to another target creature you control. So it cannot enchant itself with the roll, so that does make it a little bit weaker, but hopefully you'll have something else to enchant. And then you get a 3-3 flyer, immediate extra power and toughness, and ward ones also nice. So we do get a decent amount of stats for 5 mana and most of it will be evasive. So I think I still like a C+. It's also fairy, and there's a couple of cards that care about the fairy creature type, so that also helps it in its rating here. Then we've got the Cheeky House Mouse, a single white for a 2-1 uncommon mouse, but we can also use the Adventure First. Squeak by is a single white sorcery, giving a creature plus one plus one until end of turn, and it cannot be blocked by creatures with power 3 or greater this turn. So in a very aggressive deck, so ideally red-white, I could see this being a fine card if you can play it turn 1, can deal a bit of damage, but later in the game you can still use the adventure to good effect and add a cheap creature to the board to maybe enable your celebration abilities. So red-white might want a cheeky house mouse or two outside of that deck, I don't think you're going to be super interested. So that means I'm just going to give it a C. Then we've got Cooped Up, which is our new pacifism effect. One in a white for an aura at common, enchants a creature, and the enchanted creature cannot attack or block. So that can shut down the opponent's bombs. But this can actually also potentially take out some utility creatures, because for two in a white we can exile the enchanted creature. So one potential issue with pacifism effects, preventing a creature from attacking or blocking, is that if they have some powerful activated ability or some other ability that can trigger as the game progresses, then your pacifism doesn't solve that problem. But now if we spend the extra mana, we can also exile the enchanted creatures, so that's great. There aren't actually very many auras in this set, because a lot of it comes from the aura roll tokens. So this is actually one of maybe only three or four auras in the entire set. Either way, uh, Cooped Up gets a B, just a very efficient removal spell, and uh, hopefully you can spend the mana exiling the creature so you don't need to worry about the opponent removing your enchantment or maybe messing with it in some other way. If they can, let's say, blink their own creature, they can maybe free it. So it's always safer to just exile the creature for good. Then we've got the Cursed Courtier, which is two and a white for a 3-3 human noble and uncommon. It has a lifelink, so that seems great. But there's an interesting twist. When it enters the battlefield, create a cursed roll token attached to it. So we're turning our own 3-3 into a 1-1. One, one. They'll still have lifelink, but why would we spend 3 mana for a 1-1 one, one lifelink? Well, as it turns out, there's quite a few ways to sacrifice our own tokens and enchantments with a bargain mechanic. So especially in like a black-white deck, you'll have a pretty high density of bargain cards. Blue-white might also have quite a few. I think bargain is pretty evenly spread across most colors. So there's a lot of ways to sacrifice our own curse to roll token. And then we'll be left with a 3-3 lifelink, which is pretty great. And we get to enhance one of those bargain spells. So that's what you'll be 
looking for if you pick up some of these three drops. And uh, there's also a few effects in the set that care about enchantments going to the graveyard, so that can also potentially enable those for you. So better than it seems at first glance, once you kind of know the context of the set a little bit more. So overall grade, I think C+. Plus. Still requires you to build around it a little bit, it's not going to be awesome by itself. But in the right deck, this can be a pretty solid inclusion. And it also can enable celebration synergies by producing two permanents, so that's also relevant. Then there's the Discerning Financier, two and a white for a 2-3 human noble and so common. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, create a treasure token. And for two and a white, we can choose another player. That player gains control of target treasure we control, and we get to draw a card. So a very slow ability that takes a little bit of time to set up, but uh, yeah, could technically turn into a card draw engine over time. Mostly interested in a 2-3 that will occasionally make a treasure token, which is fine, but not particularly exciting either. So I think this just gets a C filler card at best. Then there's the dutiful griffin, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four griffin at uncommon, has flying, and for 2 and a white we can sacrifice 2 enchantments to return the griffin from our graveyard to our hand. Doesn't put it straight onto the battlefield, so it's still a bit of a process. It's going to be 8 mana to get it back from the graveyard and then replay it, but it is a recursive threat, and a 4-4 four, four flyer is pretty big, so it can close out the game in just a couple attacks. And uh, yeah, we can also sacrifice some of those aura, or roll tokens to potentially get it back, so that also helps out. I think I'm still leaning more C+, plus as opposed to B, just because it is quite the challenge to get it back. So 5 mana 4-4 four, four flyer with slight upside falls somewhere in the C+, plus category, I think. Next is Eerie Interference, 2 and a white for an instant at uncommon. It says prevent all damage that would be dealt to you and creatures you control this turn by creatures. So it's a little bit like a fog effect, but it doesn't prevent the damage from your creatures. So it's uh, potentially pretty powerful if you play this in the middle of combat, if the opponent's attacking you with their whole team. Not only do you prevent all damage dealt to yourself, but you can also potentially line up some favorable blocks without losing any of your creatures in the process. So that's kind of the ideal situation to use the interference. Now that does require a bit of setup. You need the opponent to have kind of an established board, you need to have some creatures of your own, and then hopefully you need the opponent to attack all out. Not super likely to happen. Interference is going to be sitting in your hand for quite some time, but that's definitely the best case scenario can also use this to attack with your own team and potentially prevent them from taking out any of your attackers, but that's not the most exciting use case. So this definitely seems better in a more defensive deck compared to an aggressive deck, where you can, uh, again, line up some blocks and then hopefully take out a few attackers. Could also be interesting in a racing situation where both players are attacking back and forth, and then now you can kind of fog the opponent and kill them on the way back. So just this card existing in the format means you'll have to pause before making that final attack, because if the opponent has an interference, they might be able to get you on the way back. So definitely an interesting card, uh, better than kind of your classic fog effect, of course, but still somewhat situational and kind of expensive to keep open three mana at all times. So I'm going to go with C on interference. Definitely has a potential of being an amazing card, but just uh, the use cases are somewhat narrow. And next is Expel the Interlopers. Got to have a white sweeper at rare in most sets, and this is the one 5 mana for a sorcery, choosing a number between 0 and 10, and then destroy all creatures with power greater than or equal to the chosen number. So if we just want to wipe the entire board, we choose 0, but this could also be a somewhat one-sided board wipe. If the opponent only has large creatures in play, and we've got kind of smaller tokens, then we can choose like two or three, and then maybe only wipe the opponent's creatures away. So it has even more potential than just being a board wipe, which makes it very powerful indeed. So I think A level bomb sweepers always overperform and limited, and this is no exception. 
Then we've got the Frost Bridge Guard, one on a white for a 2 2 Elemental Soldier at common. And this is one way to enable some of those synergies that we saw in blue white that care about tapping opposing creatures. Although it does come at a price here, two and a white, tap the Frostbridge Guard to tap target creature. So these tap abilities are usually pretty strong and limited, just because we can use them to prevent the opponent's largest creature from attacking. And then once we take our turn, the opponent's largest creature is tapped, we can maybe tap the second largest creature down and then go for a nice attack. So it does have that flexibility of tapping two creatures down in one turn cycle. But it is 3 mana to activate, so that's the main hurdle. If this costs a single white, this would be an awesome card. But for 3 mana total, it means you won't be able to do much else besides activate the Frostbridge Guard. So I think this card will be playable in the very dedicated blue-white tap decks. But I don't think it's going to be an automatic inclusion in other white decks which is probably a good place for it to be, because that means that if you are drafting blue-white, you should be able to pick these up pretty late and potentially be happy with a couple of them. But uh, yeah, I think this is just a C. I don't think I see myself playing this in most other decks. Then we've got a Gallant Pie Wielder, 2 and a white for an uncommon Dwarf Knight. It's a 2-3 first strike, but with Celebration, if two or more Nolan permanents entered the battlefield under our control this turn, it has a double strike instead. Pretty powerful ability, if we can keep enabling it turn after turn, 2-3 double strike, plays well with anyways to enhance its power, and of course with all those aura rolls giving it plus one plus one, that's one easy way to accomplish that. And uh, could also potentially give a double strike at instant speed, so there might be a few ways to create permanence at uh, instant speed, and then the pie wielder could uh, surprise the opponents. So that's also very nice. Easily a C plus in the right deck could even go up to a B if you've got a lot of instant speed ways to enable celebration. But uh, just curving out two power double strike is very nice. And then also a first striker on defense for what it's worth can hold off opposing death touch creatures for instance. And there's a few other situations where a first striker on defense can be quite handy. So good on both offense and defense, but red-white is probably the best home for it. So C plus for the Pie Wielder. Next is Glass Casket, one of the few reprints in this set. Of course we'll see a lot of reprints in the Enchanting Tales, but uh, in the main set there's actually very few of them. Glass Casket is one on a white for an artifact at Uncommon. When it enters, exile target creature and opponent controls with mana value 3 or less until the casket leaves the battlefield. So always a very solid removal option, great at dealing with opposing tokens, since those won't be coming back even if they answer our artifact. Although there aren't a ton of artifact removal spells in the set, just a handful in green mostly. But uh, yeah, Glass Casket's always a solid inclusion, and uh, I think I'm willing to give it a B, just because of the efficiency here. Next is Hopeful Vigil, one in a white for an enchantment at common. And when it enters the battlefield, create a 2-2 white knight creature token with Vigilance. And when the Vigil is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, scry 2. And we can sacrifice the Vigil itself for 2 and a white. Now I don't think you'll be wanting to pay 2 and a white very often to sacrifice Vigil. Instead, this is the perfect sacrifice fodder for your bargain cards. So we've seen a few cards with bargain already. And uh, this is perfect to play on turn 2, make your knight token and then later sacrifice it to scry 2 for free, essentially, while powering up your bargain cards. So this card seems to have a lot of potential. It also generates two permanents for celebration, the enchantment itself and the knight. So this card will slot very nicely into a lot of different archetypes, and a very good two drop to just play on turn 2 and get more value from later. So C+, I'm pretty high on this card. Then we've got Kellon's Light Blades, one and a white for an instant at common, and this is one of a few bargain cards in white. We've seen the pump spell at one mana, now there's the Light Blades, and then the Light Blades deals three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. If this spell was bargained, destroy that creature instead. So pretty decent removal spell, uh, usually better in the more defensive decks, because if you're taking out a blocking creature, it means you kind of lose out on a little bit of damage from the creature that's currently being blocked. But especially in like a black-white sacrifice deck that wants to be a bit more defensive, wants to 
extract value from its bargain cards and try and get as many two for ones as possible. Those decks are going to be very interested in the Light Blades as a defensive removal spell. So easily a C plus for the Light Blades, just uh, better in again more defensive decks compared to let's say a red white deck where you want to be pushing damage as much as possible. Then we've got the Knight of Doves, two and a white for an uncommon human knight, it's a 1-3, saying whenever an enchantment we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white bird creature token with flying. So this is a very interesting build round. So a 1-1 one, one token with flying is quite useful, it's easy to underestimate how good those tokens are and they can quickly add up. So if I could consistently generate two bird tokens with Knight of the Doves, like a couple turns after we played it, it would be an amazing card. Now the problem is we need to jump through quite a few hoops to have an enchantment we control end up in the graveyard. We can just play a creature that maybe comes with an aura roll token, then that creature might die, and then we can enable Knight of the Doves. So it might be easier to instead play a non-aura enchantment, like the one we saw earlier, that makes a knight token, sacrifice it to bargain, and then generate a bird token that way. So that's probably the best use case for Knight of the Doves, kind of a more defensive black-white deck where we're sacrificing enchantments that aren't necessarily auras, but if we do happen to have a few creatures with those roll tokens, then they can also enable Knight of Doves. It is still just a 1-3, so 3 mana 1-3, definitely below the curve in terms of power and toughness. And if we can consistently enable it, it's a bit lackluster. Yeah, I think I'm just going to end up giving it like a C plus at best. Yeah, it just takes quite a bit of time to get it going. And if we only make a single bird, then we probably didn't get enough value out of it. So yeah, C plus seems conservative enough that uh, I'm happy with it. But a black white, I imagine, is the best home for Knight of Doves. Moment of Valor, two and a white for an instant at common. Choose one. We can untap target creature, giving it plus one plus so and indestructible until end of turn, or destroy target creature with power four or greater. So the second mode is probably what we're most interested in, and uh, that can indeed be a very nice effect to have access to, just to take out the opponent's bombs. But on the other hand, you also don't want to have too many of those in your deck, because if the opponent's kind of a low-curve aggressive deck, maybe black-red or white-red, then they might not have a ton of four-powered creatures, and then this might be stranded in hand. But at least you still have the second mode, so we've got that extra flexibility as well. Hesitant to give it a C+, but uh, at the very least a C. I think most decks will be happy with one copy, the second copy a little bit more dubious, because... 3 mana is kind of expensive for a comma trick. Ooh, the White Crater Hoof Behemoth, as it's been dubbed. Moonshaker Cavalry is 8 mana, which, if we just pause a second, 8 mana is a lot. Most limited decks play 17 lands. If you don't have any other ramp cards, that's about half of your lands need to be in play in order to cast the Cavalry. So it better be good, but this one delivers. It's a 6-6 six, six Spirit Knight at Mythic with flying, and when it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain flying and get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. So there's a lot of board states where playing cavalry will win you the game on the spot. And if it doesn't, you still have a 6-6 flyer that can likely get there on the following turn. So the main hurdle here is getting to 8 mana. And ideally we also need to have a couple creatures in play, otherwise just a 6-6 flyer, probably not worth 8 mana. So a powerful effect. Definitely game ending if we can cast it, but getting to cast it is going to be a bit of a challenge. Also depends whether this format ends up being very aggressive or a bit more mid-rangey, because if we have time to kind of hit our land drops, get to 8 mana, then Cavalry is of course going to be a much better card compared to a format where games can be over on turn 5 or 6. So I'm going to start with a relatively high grade and uh, give this an A. But if the format ends up being a little too aggressive, then the grade is going to slowly go down over time. But it um, just seems like a sweet finisher. And ideally, we have a bit of ramp so we can get to 8 mana before the game is over. Next is Plunge into Winter. One and white for an instant at common. 
says tap up to one target creature, scry one, and then draw a card. So yeah, very versatile effect. I think we saw a blue variant of this in the Lord of the Rings expansion, and uh, this also lets us scry one, so it's very versatile. You can tap an opposing attacker down before it gets a chance to turn sideways to preserve a bit of life total. But we can also use this to set up a better attack by tapping the opponent's best blocker down. And this will be at its best in the blue-white deck if that has a few payoffs for tapping opposing creatures down in the first place. But uh, even outside of the blue-white deck, this is a card I would be very happy to play in a lot of different decks, just as kind of a, a cantrip with added utility. You can usually find a good use for it. So C plus for Plunge into Winter. Next is the Princess Takes Flight 2 and a white for a Saga. Chapter 1, Exile up to one target creature. So if this was the entire card, it would already be pretty strong, but it keeps going. Target creature you control gets plus 2 plus 2 and gains flying until end of turn. So this seems awesome, but there's a bit of a caveat. Chapter 3, return the exiled card to the battlefield under its owner's control. Okay, so it doesn't permanently exile an opposing creature, unless, unless we have a way to sacrifice our saga before it reaches the final chapter. So this is an awesome thing to sacrifice to bargain. First exile an opposing creature, then give a creature plus two and flying, and then before the turn is over, sacrifice the saga to bargain, and then we don't have to return the exiled creature. So that seems great. Could also potentially use it to exile our own creature as well, if the opponent maybe enchanted it with a curse, turning our creature into a 1-1. Now we exile it and a little bit later we'll get it back in its uh, original state. So that could also be an application. But I think ideally you play this in a bargain heavy deck and you can sacrifice it before reaching the final chapter. So has a lot of potential, but it is a bit of a build around. I don't think it's going to be awesome in every white deck necessarily. Maybe still okay in a very aggressive red-white deck, for instance, where just removing the opponent's largest creature for a couple turns and then giving a creature plus two and flying to get in a nice hit is good enough, even if the opponent does eventually get their creature back. But if you don't close out the game within those turns, then you're probably going to be in trouble once the opponent gets their creature back. So I think C plus overall for the princess takes flight. Next is Protective Parents, 2 and a white for a human peasant at common, it's a 3-2. And when it dies, create a young hero roll token attached to up to one target creature you control. So 3-2 for 3, not that exciting, but it does have a useful ability when it dies. Now, the parents dying, pretty tragic, but uh, also requires you to have another creature in play that you can enchant with the token. Probably just a C for parents. In a sacrifice-heavy black-white deck, for instance, this might be okay just to generate multiple permanents and things you can sacrifice, but I'm not particularly excited either. Next is the Regal Bunnycorn, one and white, for a rabbit unicorn at rare. Has power and toughness each equal to the number of a non-land permanents we control. So non-land permanents include all our creatures. So already power toughness equal to the number of creatures we control at the very least. So if we play this as the only permanent or non-land permanent in play, at the very least a 1-1. One, one. But we'll also grow with all our aura tokens, other artifact tokens we might have. So does steadily grow over time. Yeah, seems like a very solid 2-drop that will usually be able to attack as a 2-2 two, two on turn 3, but might even have a 3-drop that generates a token, in which case it can already get in for 3. I think a B for Bunnycorn seems fitting. Then we've got a Return a Triumphant 1 and white for a Sorcery at Common, returning a target creature card with mana value 3 or less from our graveyard to the battlefield, and create a Young Hero roll token attached to it. I think I forgot to show this one earlier with uh, Protective Parents, but uh, yeah, the enchanted creature has when this creature attacks, if its toughness is 3 or less, put a plus one plus one counter on it, which uh, yeah is fine, but it means it's not as exciting on defense, because we need that creature to at least get an attack in to enable the ability. So better in more aggressive decks for sure. And uh, here we're casting a 2-mana sorcery that 
is a bit conditional in nature. If there's nothing in the graveyard, then this is uh, not that exciting. And then once we do get to the late game where there are some creatures in the graveyard to get back with Return Triumphant, are we really that interested in getting back like a two or three drop? Is that really going to swing the battle in our favor? Unlikely. Uh, the roll token, I guess, could help. But uh, yeah, usually by the time we can cast Triumphant, getting back a creature, getting back that two or three drop may not really make a huge impact. So pretty hesitant on Return Triumphant. I think I'm uh, leaning towards D for it. But uh, there might be a strategy where there's a very powerful two or three drop that you want to absolutely get back and then this will maybe get a bit better. A Rhyme Fur Reindeer is three and a white for a 3-4 elk at common. And elks in magic, especially white ones, are known to tap creatures down. And this one delivers. Whenever an enchantment enters a battlefield under our control, tap target creature and opponent controls. It's another very nice addition for the blue-white decks, but uh, even outside of blue-white, this is potentially very nice in an aggressive deck that can steadily generate enchantments. All the aura roll tokens will enable it. There's other enchantments as well, of course. C plus for a rhyme for a reindeer. Better in aggressive decks. Also has synergy in blue-white, so it does fit into multiple archetypes quite nicely. Savior of the Sleeping is 2 and a white for a 2-3 human knight at common, has vigilance, and says whenever an enchantment we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one plus one counter on Savior of the Sleeping. So similar to the three drop that generate bird tokens, not all that easy to enable, and the payoff here is significantly less exciting than making a 1-1 bird. So not super high on the Savior of the Sleeping, and... Uh, I think I'm going for C. 2-3 uh, Vigilance for 3. Not the worst stance in the world, but uh, if you don't get a, at least one or two counters from it, then it seems a bit below the curve. So C seems appropriate. Also, I guess, important to note about some of these cards that care about enchantments dying, is if you do enchant an opposing creature with your cursed roll, and then that creature dies, you're still considered the one controlling the curse, so that can also help you enable these abilities. Slumbering Keep Guard is a single white for a human knight at common. It's a 1-1 one, one, and says whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. And for two and a white, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn for each enchantment we control. So one drops have gotten better in limited over the years, and this is a pretty decent one, I would say. Played early, gives you a bit of card selection, provides a body that you can maybe enchant with your various roles, a cheap creature that can maybe be played alongside something else to enable your celebration synergies. If it uh, is sacrificed to an effect, that's also decent. Although, do keep in mind, Bargain does not let you sacrifice creatures unless they're tokens, so it's not like we can sacrifice the keep guard all that easily. But it still has a nice activated ability as well. Once we get to the late game, this could easily get plus two, plus two or more, turning it into an actual threat. Yeah, I like the keep guard quite a bit, for a one drop at least. And uh, I'll give it, I think a C is fine. One drops that are playable are not that easy to find, and this is at least playable enough. Solitary Sanctuary is two and a white for an uncommon enchantment. And when it enters a battlefield, tap target creature an opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. And whenever we tap an untapped creature an opponent controls, we also get to put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. So at the very least, Sanctuary taps something down, stun counter on it, and gives us a plus one plus one counter. But as an enchantment, it will stick around. And if we have more effects that tap opposing creatures down, we can get more plus one plus one counters, potentially even at instant speed. Remember the uh, two mana uh, plunge into winter, I believe. That can also tap an opposing creature down. So that could also potentially give us a plus one counter at instant speed, which could be pretty useful. So yeah, Sanctuary seems like a fun build around. At its best in blue-white, C+. Then we've got the Spellbook Vendor, one and a white for a 2-2 human peasant at rare. It has Vigilance. And at the beginning of combat on our turn, we can pay one generic mana. When we do, create a sorcerer roll token. That's plus one plus one. And whenever this creature attacks, scry one to target creature we control. 
so it can target itself with that sorcerer role and then can slowly build up some of our other creatures now keep in mind a creature can only have one role attached to it at the same time from the same controller so it's not like we can stack multiple sorcerer roles onto the same creature although i will say this is potentially a way to enable some of those synergies that care about enchantments going to the graveyard because if you do end up putting the same sorcerer role on a creature then one of them goes to the graveyard and you enabled your enchantment goes to the graveyard synergies so that's actually a pretty interesting application of the spellbook vendor and uh, one mana is not a huge investment and then of course the scry one from the sorcerer role can also give us more card selection as the game progresses I think Vendor actually sneaks its way into the bomb category. It may seem unassuming, but two drops that generate incremental value over time tend to be pretty strong and limited, just because you get to play them early. Even if you don't have a lot of lands, at least the card will be impactful. And it's an awesome mana sink as well. Enables a lot of synergies across multiple archetypes. And just inherently powerful on turn 3, this could already be attacking as a 3-3 letting us scry one so yeah there's a lot to like about the vendor and i think it's bomb worthy next is stockpiling celebrant two and a white for a 3-2 dwarf knight at common when a celebrant enters the battlefield we may return another target non-land permanent we control to its owner's hand if we do scry two so this could play well with a couple of cards we've seen so far the two mana enchantment that makes a knight token we could maybe pick back up, replay it, make another knight while getting to scry in the process. Uh, also good with any creatures or cards that generate roll tokens. Uh, could be good in red-white celebration decks where you've got a lot of cards that generate tokens and then uh, this can give you a bit more value. If we play it without picking anything up, three mana, three, two, definitely below the curve, would get a D. So... This might be good enough to get to a C at the very least, but definitely not higher than that. And next is Stroke of Midnight, two and a white for an instant and uncommon, destroying target a non-land permanence, and its controller creates a 1-1 white human creature token. So it's unconditional removal in white, but it does have a bit of a drawback, giving the opponent a 1-1 token in return, which it's easy to kind of underestimate a 1-1 token could maybe chum block a large creature buy the opponent an extra turn can give them a creature to potentially enchant when they maybe wouldn't have anything else but for a white deck you don't get many of these so at the very least a c plus a tail for the ages is a one and a white enchantments at rare saying enchanted creatures you control get plus two plus two so this would go well in your probably green-white decks ideally, where you've got a lot of those aura roll tokens going around. The question we have to ask ourselves is how many of those are we going to have consistently in our deck, and is this card worth it? And I don't actually think this card will be good enough to make most of your decks, even if you take this somewhat early and try and build your deck around it. I think it's still going to end up falling a little bit short, where you might maybe have one or two creatures in play with the benefit but uh, you might have to play some overcosted cards to enable this. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm buying a Tale for the Ages. I'm happy to be proven wrong because it does seem like a pretty sweet ability. So I'll go for a D for a Tale for the Ages. At least the uncommon 5-drop in green-white comes with an enchanted roll token when it enters. So it kind of enables itself. A Tale for the Ages, if it's the only card you play, it doesn't necessarily do anything. Yeah, I guess it does have the upside that if your opponent enchants your creature with a cursed roll, then it actually does get plus two, plus two. So maybe that's keeping it from a D and pushes it up to the C tier. But I would just warn people not to necessarily first pick and build around it. Next is three blind mice, two and a white, for a saga at rare, saying create a 1-1 one, one white mouse creature token on chapter one. Chapters 2 and 3 create a token that's a copy of target token we control. So we could copy the mouse if it's still alive, but we could also copy maybe some aura roll tokens. That sounds fun, as long as we have creatures to enchant. And then finally, creatures we control get plus on plus one and gain vigilance until end of turn. So far from a wedding announcement, 
but uh, pretty good card overall, especially for limited. So I'm gonna give it a B. Lots of tokens for some of our token synergies. Can potentially even sacrifice the Saga itself before it reaches a final chapter to a bargain card. So there's a decent amount of synergy throughout multiple archetypes. Next is the Twin Veil Guide. Three and a white for a fairy scout at common. It's a 2-3 flyer and it has celebration, giving it plus one plus O and lifelink if two or more non-land permanents entered the battlefield under our control this turn. Can also potentially be enabled at instant speed, but uh, yeah, ideally we can attack with a three power flying lifelinker that makes it harder for the opponent to race. There's no shortage of cards that enter the battlefield generating a token, and those are all great ways to enable the guide. So I'm leaning C+. I think it's not going to be too difficult to consistently make this a three power lifelinker, in which case this seems pretty good. Unassuming Sage is next. We've already seen it earlier when discussing our examples. One and white for a 2-2 human peasant wizard at common. When it enters, we may pay two mana. If we do, we create a sorcerer roll token attached to it. So we don't have the flexibility of enchanting a different creature. So it's either a two mana 2-2 two two or a four mana 3-3. Three three. That's when it attacks Scry 1. Still a way to potentially enable some celebration synergies. In the sacrifice decks, we can use the sorcerer token as sacrifice fodder. Playable, maybe, in some decks, but far from exciting. Next is Virtue of Loyalty, and this is one of the few S-tier level cards in the set. So first off, we probably want to play the Adventure, which is even an instant, creating a 2-2 white knight creature token with Vigilance. And then once we get to 5 mana, play the enchantment saying at the beginning of our end step, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature we control, and as if that weren't enough, untap those creatures as well. So your creatures are very quickly going to outgrow whatever the opponent has going on. The fact that it generates at least one token to start you out is also very helpful, so you're less likely to play Virtue of Loyalty on an empty board. And yeah, it's like two turns maybe, and you've probably taken over the game already. This card is ridiculously powerful, and if I open this even in pack three, I might try and pivot into white just for it. It's that powerful. And then our final white card, at least as far as the main set is concerned, we'll still have the enchanting tales later, is a Werefox Bodyguard 1 and double white for a 2-2 Elf Fox Knight at rare, it has flash, and when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one author target non-fox creature until the bodyguard leaves the battlefield, and can also be sacrificed for one and white to gain two life. The sacrifice ability is a little strange, but I suppose if the opponent tries to remove it and you've got some mana untapped, you can at least gain two life in response. Perfect for exiling opposing uh, tokens for good, because even if they answer the bodyguard, the token will stay exiled. And uh, yeah, the fact that it has flash can potentially set up an ambush, maybe enable celebration synergies at instant speed. That could also be pretty fun. Yeah, very powerful card, and I think bomb worthy. A removal stapled onto a creature with a few other upsides makes it into an A. And this will certainly be constructed playable as well, especially once uh, Brutal Cathar is no longer around, although that's still going to take a, a while now. Okay, so those were all the white cards, and now it's time to move on to blue. First, a blue card, Aquatic Alchemist, is a 2-mana 1-3 elemental at common, saying whenever we cast our first instant or sorcery spell each turn, the alchemist gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So, pretty nice effect. But we can also use the adventure, bubble up for two and a blue, a sorcery, putting target instant or sorcery card from our graveyard on top of our library. So we can maybe get back a powerful removal spell and then potentially enable other creatures or other synergies that care about casting lots of instants and sorceries. So the alchemist seems like a pretty playable card in a dedicated blue-red spells deck especially. So I'll go for a C. I don't think too many decks are going to be fighting over this card. Archive Dragon is a 6 mana 4-6 Dragon Wizard at Uncommon, has Flying, Ward 2, 
and when the dragon enters a battlefield, scry 2 as well. And scry 2 is incredibly valuable on expensive creatures like this, because once you get to 6 mana, you probably don't need to draw more lanes, so getting to bottom those lanes with a scry ability is incredibly valuable. So B for Archive Dragon, awesome curve topper, makes sure you don't flood out afterwards, especially good in the blue-green decks that are interested in ramping and they'll more easily get to 6 mana, but even outside of blue-green, 6 mana is still achievable, and then this is a pretty nice threat. Now maybe not the best if the opponent has a curse turning it into a 1-1, one -one. does have ward 2, so at the very least they'll have to pay the 2 extra mana, but if you're left with a 1-1 one -one flyer, that's not super exciting. I, I guess flying at least makes it a little bit better. Uh, but just something to keep in mind when playing expensive creatures, when the opponent might have access to ample curses. Next is Asinine Antics. Two in a blue for a mythic rare sorcery. And we can cast it as though it had flash if we pay two extra mana. So then it's six mana to play it at instant speed saying for each creature your opponent's control, create a cursed roll token attached to that creature. So every opposing creature turns into a 1-1. One -one. They might still have other plus one counters or maybe their own roll tokens that will stay attached, because again, we can have a roll attached to an opposing creature because we are the ones controlling the curse, but the opponent might have their own roll token that they control, so a creature can potentially have two auras attached if they're from two different controllers. Still, this seems like a very powerful effect, um, especially if the opponent has a developed board with lots of large creatures without too many utility effects, then uh, yeah, this can be very effective, especially when played at instant speed. That way the opponent might be attacking or maybe even blocking and then you'll shrink down the opponent's team at instant speed when they don't see it coming, so we can immediately take out all their creatures before they get a chance to maybe remove those enchantment tokens. So Asinine Antics, I think worthy of an A, seems pretty fitting. Next is a Balunas a Gatekeeper. Five and a blue for a giant soldier at common, just a 6-5. So if we were just rating this without the adventure, not that exciting, easily a D, but it does have an adventure, and that does make it substantially better. Entry denied, one and a blue for a sorcery, returning target creature you don't control with mana value three or less to its owner's hand. It is a sorcery, so whenever these bounce effects are instant speed, they get substantially better. That being said, it's still an effective way to kind of stall for time, and I imagine this will be at its best in kind of your blue-green ramp decks, where you just want to make sure the opponent doesn't run you over at the start of the game. Entry denied can stall and buy you an extra turn or two, and then you can in the meantime maybe develop your mana, get to 6 for the gatekeeper, and that can potentially help you stabilize. It is just a vanilla 6-5 with no extra abilities, so can be too excited about it, but I think this is actually quite playable and uh, especially blue-green will be happy with it. Uh, maybe a blue-red spells deck is also happy just for the cheap adventure. Somewhere between a C and a C+, I'm gonna be a bit optimistic and go for a C plus on the Gatekeeper, but uh, time will tell if this is more of a C instead. A Bitter Chill, one and a blue for an uncommon aura enchanting a creature. And when Bitter Chill enters the battlefield, tap Enchanted Creature, it doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So this is not going to mess around with the stun counters, creatures just not untapping whatsoever. And there's more, when Bitter Chill is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, we can pay one mana, if we do, scry one and then draw a card. So if the opponent somehow finds a way to maybe sacrifice their own creature, then you could still maybe get a bit of value from your Bitter Chill, also, you could potentially sacrifice the Bitter Chill to bargain. So let's say the creature you tap down no longer super relevant, you don't mind if the opponent untaps it, but you do have a bargain card you want to enable. Then if you've got a spare mana, you can sacrifice your Bitter Chill and then still scry one and draw a card at the very least, in addition to powering up your various effects. So yeah, this card seems very versatile. I think this is, again, one of the few actual auras in the set, uh, especially outside of the Enchanting Tales. There's Bitter Chill, 
there's the white kind of pacifism effect and there might be one more but uh, most auras in the sets come from the aura roll tokens so that's also kind of unique about bitter chill and it will play very nicely in your blue white decks especially when you've got a couple payoffs for tapping opposing creatures down so overall very effective removal spell gets a b chancellor of tales is three in a blue for a fairy advisor at uncommon a 2-3 flyer saying whenever we cast an adventure spell we may copy it and we may choose new targets for the copy so this is a card that could pair very well with let's say the baluna's gatekeeper the six mana giant that can bounce something with the adventure if we get to copy it and bounce two things instead so especially good in the blue red decks blue green i think also has a pretty high density of adventure creatures so kind of the teamer color combinations is where chancellor will shine and uh seems like a powerful build around two three flyer for four not embarrassing stats but uh without adventures i wouldn't really be too interested but just a couple of adventures copied by chancellor can easily swing the game in your favor so i'm gonna go with b diminisher which is two and a blue for a three two human warlock at common has bargain and when the witch enters the battlefield if it was bargained create a cursed roll token attached to target creature and opponent controls so that turns it into a one one okay so three mana three two by itself again not too exciting but let's say we can play this a little bit later in the game once the opponent has a larger creature we want to shrink down then uh, yeah hopefully we've got a few ways to easily enable bargain and then this turns into a very effective card a three two that also acts as removal may not quite get to the c plus range i think most blue decks will be happy with it but uh, especially decks that focus more on the bargain synergy so blue black perhaps has a pretty good combination of bargain enablers and payoffs although this is unfortunately not a fairy so it does not have those fairy synergies otherwise that might have bumped it up to a c plus this Daveful stroke is back now as an uncommon so one on a blue instant counter target spell with mana value four or greater pretty solid in this set there's a lot of powerful four plus mana cards uh, of course adventures are part of that too and uh, it's not going to be too difficult to keep up mana in some decks especially blue black the fairy archetype has a few spells we can play at instant speed including flash creatures so those make your counter spells better too and uh, two mana is not too difficult to keep up especially once we get to the later stages of the game when disdainful stroke would be effective so c plus for disdainful stroke one of the better counter spells extraordinary journey is a very interesting card double x double blue for a rare enchantment when it enters the battlefield exile up to x target creatures for each of those cards its owner may play it for as long as it remains exiled and then this is where things get interesting whenever one or more non-token creatures enter the battlefield if one or more of them entered from exile or was cast from exile we get to draw a card only triggers once each turn so if the opponent now wants to replay their creature we get to draw a card but there's more this also works very well with adventures if either the opponent or if uh, we cast an adventure creature from exile then we also get to draw a card this will work very well in especially kind of your blue red adventure decks but blue green might also make a good use of this being able to ramp out a more expensive journey to bounce multiple creatures if we cast it for four mana bounce one thing if we cast it for six mana bounce two creatures so it's a pretty good rate a nice tempo play that also acts as card advantage and uh yeah hopefully we've got a few adventure creatures to play alongside it so it can be a steady stream of extra cards can even play this just on turn two x equals zero and then start casting our creatures from exile could also work so it does have that flexibility so yeah pretty high on the extraordinary journey i think at the very least b territory might even sneak its way into the bomb category but also need to keep in mind that playing creatures from exile as adventures tends to be a bit slow 
So it's not that we necessarily need more card advantage when casting adventures. We just need to make sure we don't get run over in the meantime, because adventures inherently provide card advantage. So it's not like we need to necessarily draw extra cards alongside it. But yeah, still pretty interesting build around card. Next is Farsight Ritual. Two and a double blue for an instant at rare has bargain. If we cast it without bargain, look at the top four cards of our library. If we do cast it with bargain, look at the top eight instead. And then either way, put two of them into our hands and the rest on the bottom of our library. So reminiscent of Memory Deluge, although of course missing flashback. Still a powerful card draw effect. It is an instant. Plays well with our other counter spells and instant speed plays. So pretty solid card draw. Uh, C plus I think is fair will be better in the more dedicated bargain decks, but there's usually no lack of card advantage in those decks anyways. Freeze in place is one and blue for a sorcery at common, tapping a target creature and opponent controls and putting three stun counters on it. We also get to scry two. So it doesn't permanently remove a creature, but it does lock it down for quite some time. We'll be at its best in blue-white. Scry 2 also helps us set up our next play nicely. Still not super excited by Freeze in Place because it doesn't replace itself unlike the white instant, but uh, C I think is fitting. Good in more aggressive blue-red decks and then of course a blue-white decks where you've got some payoffs for tapping stuff down. A Gadwick's first duel. One on a blue for an enchantment saga. Chapter 1, create a cursed roll token attached to one target creature. Could even enchant our own creature if we wanted to, although probably better to enchant an opponent. Chapter 2, we get to scry 2. And finally, when we cast our next instant or sorcery spell with mana value 3 or less, we get to copy that spell and choose new targets for the copy. And that lasts until end of turn. Yeah, even if we just got the first chapter, this could almost be playable. But the fact that we also get to Scry 2 and then later copy something makes it very powerful, I think. Scry 2 also helps us dig towards an instant or sorcery if we didn't have one already to get to copy. So I'm sold. Gandwick's first duel gets a B. Galvanic Giant is 3 and a blue for an uncommon giant wizard. If we cast it as a creature, it's just a 3-3, saying whenever we cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater, tap target creature and opponent controls and put a stun counter on it. So not a bad payoff, especially for your blue-green decks. But we can also cast the Adventure, although it does come at a price 7 mana for Storm Reading, an instant drawing 4 cards and then discarding 2 cards. So decent uh, late-game mana sink if we can cast the Adventure first. Although, again, a bit awkward, because we would prefer to have the creature in play when casting the adventure. I guess that just means we need to draft multiple copies. C plus for Galvanic Giant. Nice ramp payoff. Then we've got the Horned Loch Whale, which is 6 mana for a rare whale. Can cast it as a creature, a 6-6 six, six with Flash and Ward 2. Although, sadly, it wouldn't be ambushing opposing attackers with it, because it enters the battlefield tapped unless it's our turn. But we can also cast the Adventure, a 2-mana instant for 1 and a blue, saying the owner of target attacking creature we don't control puts it on the top or bottom of their library. So that makes the Horned Lock Whale pretty powerful, getting that effect for 2-mana when we're often paying 4-mana for that ability. Although there is the condition that the creature needs to be attacking. Either way, very powerful card. I think bomb status, just because of the adventure. Just a creature by itself. Actually kind of disappointing when it enters tapped, but the adventure more than makes up for it. Next is Ice Out, a 3 mana instant at common. Has bargain, and it costs 1 less to cast if it's bargained, and it just counters target spell. So it's kind of your classic 3-mana counter with the set's mechanic. And uh, yeah, getting a discount can certainly be useful when you can afford to keep up 3-mana. But uh, yeah, still not blown away by this, so it just seems like a playable blue counter spell gets a C. And next is the Ice Rot Sentry. 2 in a blue for an uncommon elemental soldier. It's a 2-3 with Vigilance. 
And when it attacks, we can pay one on a blue. When we do, tap target creature and opponent controls. So, yeah, pretty useful ability. But there's more. When we tap an untapped creature and opponent controls, Sentry gets plus two plus one until end of turn. So let's say we play this on turn three, attack on turn four, paying the one on the blue. Then now we are tapping an opposing blocker down and turning this into a 4-4 four, four with Vigilance. So that hits incredibly hard. But of course it also works very well in multiples. Just imagine having two sentries. Now we can attack with both of them, pay four mana, and then they both get plus four plus two. So they're now attacking as six five creatures each. So that quickly adds up. Also works well with author tap abilities. And Vigilance means we'll still have them on defense. So I think there's enough going on here that I'm willing to give these a B. They work kind of by themselves, but they're also nice if we can uh, support them with additional tap abilities. So they'll be at their best in blue-white. But uh, even outside of blue-white, I'm very happy to run this. Ingenious Prodigy, X and a blue for a human wizard at rare. Has Skulk, don't see that ability very often these days. So a creature with Skulk cannot be blocked by creatures with greater power. So this is kind of the reverse ability of the Otter that we saw in the multicolor section. And then the Prodigy enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if the Prodigy has one or more counters on it, can remove one of them and draw a card. So ideally play this for as much mana as possible, and then it turns into a solid card draw engine while potentially getting some damage in as well. Yeah, very solid card. Of course, if the opponent removes it right away, then we won't have uh, drawn any cards off of it, but still kind of demands an answer, otherwise it can run away with the game. So easily a B. Into the Fey Court is a 5 mana sorcery at common, drawing 3 cards and creating a 1-1 one, one blue fairy creature token with flying that can only block creatures with flying. So a bit of a, a drawback here for sure, but uh, still 5 mana draw 3. Not bad for a common. There might be ways to discount this, so we're not paying the full price. And then the 1-1 one, one token can maybe chip in for a bit of damage, so we'll make it decent for kind of a blue-red spells deck. But it's also a token we can potentially sacrifice to bargain, so blue-black might have some uh, bargain synergies with this as well. So seems like a solid role player that can fit in a few different decks and if we're lacking card draw this will certainly do. Still 5 mana so a bit pricey so can give it more than a C but it's the type of card that always feels nice to cast when you get to it. Then we've got Johan's Stopgap, 3 and a blue for a common sorcery, has bargain in which case it gets a 2 mana discount and then returns target a non-land permanent to its owner's hand, and we get to draw a card. So if bargains, it's kind of like having a, a kicked into the royal, but uh, it is a sorcery. So being a sorcery is keeping it from a higher grade. I think I'm still gonna just end up giving this a C. If this were an instant, easily C+, and would be one of the better commons in blue. As a sorcery, it definitely loses some points. A Living Electern is one and a blue for an artifact creature construct at common. An 04 can be sacrificed for one mana, but only as a sorcery, in which case we not only draw a card, but we also create a sorcerer roll token attached to up to one other target creature we control. Now the fact that we can only sacrifice this as a sorcery is keeping it from being significantly better. Because imagine you can sacrifice it at instant speed, then now you could maybe block a larger creature with it, still sacrifice it for value while getting to maybe pump up a creature at instant speed. So that's not going to happen here. Just an 0-4 can maybe save you a bit of damage early on if the opponent's an aggressive deck, and then at some point when you no longer need it, can still be exchanged for a card and a token. So, you know, it's not a lot of mana to invest in it, and you will potentially get your card back as well as an extra piece of uh, material with your sorcerer roll. So it's not a bad card by any means, but still not particularly exciting. Uh, probably the card you're going to see go pretty late in the draft as one of the last few picks. So is this a C or is this more of a D? That's kind of the question. I don't think this card necessarily has an amazing home for it. 
but uh, it is also an artifact, so you could potentially sacrifice it to bargain. So I guess uh, there's another small upside. Yeah, let's just go for C for Living Lectern, although it could easily end up more in the D category. Next is a Merfolk Coral Smith. Two and a blue for a Merfolk at common. It's a 2 3. Not particularly impressive, but it can also pay one mana to give it plus one, minus one until end of turn. And when it dies, we get to scry two. So the threat of activation makes this a lot more playable. It means it can attack into larger creatures, even up to four toughness without any other enhancements, and could also play well with any roll tokens, giving it plus one plus one, because then we can also increase its power even more. And then uh, the upside when it dies is also a useful ability. So overall, Merfolk Coral Smith, probably just a C. Don't think it's quite getting in the C plus category, but I'm not ashamed to include this in my blue decks. Misleading Moats is 3 and a blue for an instant at common. Target creature's owner puts it on the top or bottom of their library. I've seen effects like this before. They're usually pretty good for a blue deck, which doesn't get access to a lot of hard removal spells necessarily. So easily a C, might even get to the C plus range, depending on how the format shakes out. Um, also gets better in maybe a blue-red spells deck, where you can give it a discount or get other synergies from casting instants or sorceries, but uh, most blue decks will be happy to have a couple of these. And Mocking Sprite is 2 and a blue for a 2-1 Fairy Rogue at common, it has flying, and says instant and sorcery spells you cast cost 1 less to cast. So this is not only a payoff for the Fairy deck, being a Fairy, but it also will discount your spells for the blue-red spells deck especially. So it fits into a lot of different decks. Two-powered flyer for three, also decent enough. So this seems like a pretty high quality common uh, in blue. Now there is one major downside, one toughness as we mentioned. There's a couple ways to potentially punish those creatures. And uh, it would definitely hurt to get this removed for just one mana or some incidental ETB effect. But I'm Definitely hopeful, and I'll start with a C plus. Next is Obira's Attendance, four and a blue for a three four fairy wizard. At common, it flies, and it has an adventure. Desperate party is a one and a blue instant, saying a target creature gets minus four minus O until end of turn. So a useful effect if we have a bit of an established board, so we can shrink down a large attacker, set up some double blocks to take it out, perhaps without losing any of our own creatures. And then a 3-4 flyer is definitely a solid win condition. So the fact that we can potentially get a 2 for one out of this while also getting a finisher makes it into a C+, I believe. Next is the Picklock Prankster. One and a blue for a 1-3 Fairy Rogue at Uncommon. It has flying and vigilance, and it also has an adventure. Free the Fey is a one and a blue instant, milling four cards, and then we can put an instant or sorcery or fairy from among the milled cards into our hand. So this will be incredibly effective in the blue-black decks especially, where we've got a high density of fairies and other removal effects. And uh, a 1-3 Flying Vigilance is actually not bad once we enhance it with one of our roll tokens, giving it extra power, especially the Sorcerer roll token where it gets to scry one when it attacks. So has a, a couple extra synergies going for it and uh, yeah the flexibility of potentially casting it just as a creature right away when facing aggressive decks is also a nice upside so overall c plus for picklock prankster next is quick study two and a blue for an instant at common draw two cards that's it so we now get our divination and instant speed which is a significant upgrade, especially for the fairy archetype, which may want to keep up its mana to represent counter spells. But even a blue-red deck that cares about casting spells might like this as maybe an instant speed prowess enabler. So C plus for quick study, solid addition for a lot of blue decks. Sleep Cursed Fairy is a single blue for a rare fairy wizard. A 3-3 flyer with ward 2. So if that's the entire card, I'm sold. But sadly, it does come with a pretty major drawback. It enters a battlefield with three stun counters on it. 
We can, however, pay one and a blue to untap Sleep Cursed Fairy, which will essentially remove a stun counter if it has any left. And then in the late game, we can give it Pseudo Vigilance by untapping it for one and a blue. But yeah, let's kind of do the math here. So play Fairy turn one, turn two, it doesn't untap stun counters down to two. We can potentially pay one on a blue if we don't have any other two drops. So now we're down to one stun counter. So turn three, it still doesn't untap. And then finally turn four, we can attack with fairy after having spent three mana. It can start attacking for three in the air. But that's kind of the ideal sequence where we actually played it on turn one and we managed to activate it on turn two, which is not always going to be the case. But what happens if we top deck it later? I guess we'll have more mana to untap it, so it doesn't take as long to necessarily start attacking with it. But it's still kind of an investment, so yeah, this card seems a little bit uh, awkward and not that amazing of a payoff for all the effort that uh, is required. So I'm leaning D for Sleep Cursed Fairy. Might be closer to a C, but I just don't want people to uh, pack one, pick one and go into the fairy deck because they opened Sleep Cursed Fairy. So this is your warning. Sleight of Hand is a single blue sorcery at common, and this is a, a nice reprint that we haven't had on standard for quite some time. Look at the top two cards of your library, putting one of them into your hand and the other on the bottom of your library. So fine cantrip, especially useful for the blue red decks that care about casting instants and sorceries and maybe filling the graveyard with instants and sorceries as well. So blue red is the best home for this. Other blue decks will be happy to include a couple sleight of hands to kind of smooth out their draws. But you do want to make sure that blue is your primary color. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck with a cantrip in hand that you cannot cast. So yeah, C for sleight of hand, nothing amazing here, but a fine filler card for a lot of decks. Snare Master Sprites is a single blue fairy wizard at common. It's a 1-1 flyer, and when it enters a battlefield we can pay 2 extra mana if we do, tap target creature and opponent controls, and put a stun counter on it. So it does have that flexibility. It fits into your blue-black fairy deck as maybe a cheap creature to enable other fairy synergies good recipient of any aura roll tokens and then it can also slot into your blue white decks where that maybe care more about tapping opposing creatures down and even a, a blue red aggressive deck might just want a cheap evasive flyer to get a couple points in so nothing amazing here but i think a fine role player that will slot into a couple different archetypes so easily a c Spell Stutter, a reference to the Spell Stutter sprite, which might have been a little bit too powerful for standard, but uh, the instant is still quite playable and limited. Counter target spell unless its controller pays 2, plus an additional 1 for each fairy you control. And this might also see a bit of standard play if a fairy deck is viable. But uh, yeah, in limited, a 2 mana counter unless you pay 2 is typically playable if unexciting, but the fact that this potentially gets better over time as you get some fairies on the battlefield means this could still be kind of a hard counter in the mid to late game. So it actually uh, kind of retains its power, which is important for a counter spell. And uh, two mana is pretty cheap to keep up, especially if you have other instant speed card draw spells or flash creatures who can play alongside it. In the fairy deck this is probably C plus material as an effective counterspell. Outside of the fairy decks, it kind of drops down to a C, but uh, yeah, judge it accordingly. Splashy Spellcaster, three and a blue for an elemental wizard at uncommon. A two four saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a sorcerer a roll token attached to up to one other target creature we control. So sadly cannot enchant itself but it's very generous in handing out the Sorcerer token. And this is not too difficult to enable, especially in your blue-red spells decks, but also other decks might have some random adventure creatures that can enable it. Getting to the B range, if we can get a couple tokens out of it, I think it's powerful enough. And uh, could also potentially enable it at instant speed for what it's worth. So surprising the opponent with an extra plus one plus one could also come in handy. 
Stormkeld Prowler is one and a blue for a 2-1 human rogue at common. Says whenever we cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater, put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So a 2-drop that has more utility in the late game is always nice. It means that you can play this as an early blocker against aggressive decks. If the opponent doesn't have their own 2-drop, can maybe get a bit of damage in. And then once the board stalls out, the game progresses, and then at some point when you start casting your expensive spells, it actually still turns into a relevant threat on the board. So not much more you can ask from a 2-drop, except for maybe not having one toughness, which could be a bit of a drawback. Easily a C, might even kind of creep its way into the C+, plus, um, but definitely at its best in maybe your blue-green decks, where you'll have the highest density of 5-plus mana cards. Succumb to the cold is 2 and a blue for an instant at uncommon, tapping 1 or 2 target creatures an opponent controls and putting a stun counter on each of them. So the best timing to cast Succumb to the cold is in the kind of beginning of combat step, before the opponent gets a chance to turn their creature sideways. That way not only are they tapped down, but they'll stay tapped down for another entire turn cycle as they won't be untapping anytime soon and then you can potentially get a nice attack in in the meantime. And uh, yeah, this seems like a very nice tempo play. So either play this in an aggressive deck where you can try and take advantage of those tapped creatures by getting in a good chunk of damage, or play this in a deck that can uh, maybe synergize with tapping creatures down, so that would be blue-white typically, or maybe a deck that just wants to stall for time and has some great finishers to close out the game, because it doesn't you know, replace itself, it doesn't draw a card, so this is purely kind of a tempo play to try and get ahead on the board or, uh, you know, try and close out the game. But uh, that being said, C plus for Succumb to the Cold, it's a pretty unique and powerful ability. Talion's Messenger is 2 and a blue for a 1-3 Fairy Noble at rare, it flies, says whenever you attack with one or more fairies, draw a card and then discard a card, so even if you're attacking with multiple fairies, it only triggers once. And whenever we discard a card this way, we can put a plus one plus one counter on target fairy we control. Conveniently, a fairy itself. So even without any other fairies, a 1-3 that lets us loot whenever it attacks and picks up extra plus one counters seems awesome. So I think this even sneaks into the A category here. Of course, if you top deck it late and the opponent already has a large flyer back or reach creature, it's maybe not that exciting but uh, especially in a fairies deck where you can easily enable it, potentially even the same turn you play it, if you have a two-mana fairy in play, then this is going to be awesome for you. Tenacious Tome Seeker is two and a blue for a human knight at uncommon, a 3-2 with bargain, and when it enters the battlefield, if it was bargained, return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. Pretty nice for the more controlling bargain decks, that might have some powerful uh, removal spells to get back in the late game. So yeah, just need to make sure you've got your bargain enablers. And then a Tome Seeker seems like a pretty solid inclusion. C+. Vantress Transmuter, 3 in a blue for a 3-4 human wizard at common. And has an adventure, Croaking Curse, 1 in a blue sorcery. Tap target creature and create a cursed roll token attached to it. So yeah, does double duty makes the uh, blue-white deck happy by tapping an opposing creature down, and then also makes sure that creature stays shrinked down as a 1-1. So just the adventure by itself is already pretty solid, and then we get a 3-4 creature on top of it, which may not be exciting, but it's kind of upside since the adventure is what we're most interested in. So C plus for Transmuter will fit into a variety of decks as well. Next is Virtue of Knowledge. So this is kind of part of a Mythic Rare Enchantment cycle. The white one got an S grade. What does the blue one get? So we get a two mana instance adventure saying copy target activated or triggered ability you control and you may choose new targets for the copy. Bit of an awkward instant since you need to both cast something with an activated or triggered ability and then also have the one in a blue to kind of cast alongside it. So not that easy to set up, but maybe the enchantment itself is good enough. 
So 5 mana, saying if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Okay, so we've seen effects like this in the past, and they're usually fun build rounds for constructed. In limited, it kind of depends uh, on uh, what else the card offers and how many ETB effects there are in the set. This set's got a couple, maybe a few ways to generate aura tokens that now can be doubled. But we still have to pay 5 mana, and this doesn't necessarily immediately impact the board when we play it. So this one feels like a bit of a trap, and I'm leaning D for Virtue of Knowledge. Now, you can still potentially pick it up and build around it and double some triggers. Probably still gonna lose that game anyway, but at least you'll have fun. Next is Water Wings, one in a blue for an instant, at common. Until end of turn, target creature you control has base power and toughness, 4-4, four, four, and gains flying and hexproof. So effects like this are also pretty common. Uh, this one has the twist of giving flying as well, so that can be a useful way to close out the game by maybe pumping up a small creature. Hexproof can be used defensively, but it doesn't necessarily replace itself, and it's often still worse than just a regular pump spell that adds extra power and toughness on top of your creature. So not a huge fan of effects like this. I'm gonna go with a D, but there might be some decks that just uh, are interested in cheap instants and sorceries, maybe blue-red, and then this can also help you deal a couple extra points of damage to close out the game. But uh, I'm kind of reaching here. And I believe that was the last blue card. Ashok Wicked Manipulator is 5 mana for a 5 loyalty Planeswalker. And nowadays, Planeswalkers are one of a kind in limited sets, so this will be the only Planeswalker in Wilds of Eldraine, making them a little bit uh, more of a rarity to come across. It says if we would pay life while we have at least a couple cards in our library, then exile that many cards from the top of our library instead. So. Not too many ways to pay life in the set, so don't think that passive is going to come up all that often. The plus one lets us look at the top two cards of our library, exile one of them, and put the author into our hand. So a plus one that is usually better than drawing a card, because we get a bit of card selection, uh, just have to worry about maybe running out of cards in our library at some point. The minus two creates two one one black nightmare creature tokens, saying at the beginning of a combat on our turn, if a card was put into exile this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. So interesting to note about the nightmare creatures is that not only do they synergize with Ashiok itself, potentially exiling cards with the plus one ability, for instance, but they also work with adventures. Let's say we cast an adventure, it goes into exile in the adventure zone, so that can also help grow the nightmares. But we do need to make sure that we cast the adventure in our first main phase if we want to pick up that plus one counter, since it only triggers at the beginning of combat. And then the minus seven, if we can get to it, says target player exiles the top x cards of their library, where x is the total mana value of cards we own in exile. That could synergize well with adventures, because usually if we use the plus one, we want to keep the powerful expensive cards and let the lands and cheaper cards go to exile. So those won't necessarily enable the minus seven, but if we have some expensive creature in exile that we use the adventure, then now it can also contribute towards the minus seven, and that can potentially threaten to mill the opponent out essentially. So all three abilities are potentially quite useful, although I imagine you're mostly going to alternate between the minus two and the plus one. So Ashok can protect itself with the minus two ability, making those nightmares. What it doesn't do is remove creatures outright. So if the opponent has, let's say, a flying creature in play, that does kind of threaten to take out Ashok in a couple attacks. Uh, so then you might be more interested in using the plus one to dig for answers to those flying creatures. But even still, Ashok will likely draw you a couple extra cards and uh, essentially gain a bunch of life in the process. Somewhere between A tier and S tier, just because of that vulnerability to flying creatures mostly. Uh, it may not necessarily survive for too long, 
but especially on a board that's somewhat stalled, where uh, the opponent isn't making any progress, Ashok will definitely take it home for you. So I think I'm willing to go S tier for Ashok. There's not many in the set, this being our only Planeswalker. I'll go for an S here. Next is Ashok's Reaper, 3 and a blank for a 3-3 three, three Nightmare at Uncommon. Says whenever an enchantment we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. So we've seen a couple of these payoffs in white already. This one, 4 mana, 3-3, three, three, bit on the pricey side in terms of power toughness, but it could be an effective card draw engine. Again, I need to jump through a couple hoops to enable it. But the payoff is certainly there if we can get a couple extra cards out of this. So I'm going with a more conservative C+. I don't think it quite goes all the way up to a B. Because it's not the most uh, reliable card to enable, let's say. But in the right deck, I think this will be quite serviceable. And decks that don't enable it reliably are just not going to be taking it whatsoever. So that kind of falls between... Uh, B and kind of an unplayable for some decks. So overall grade C plus I think is fine. Back for seconds, two and a black sorcery at uncommon. Has a bargain, returning up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand. If it was bargained, we may put one of those cards with mana value four or less onto the battlefield instead of putting it into our hand. So pretty significant uh, payoff here getting a 4-drop potentially in play for just 3 mana, plus also getting another card back into our hand is a lot of value. It does require a bit of setup, you're not always going to have 2 or more cards in Graveyard to choose from, so don't want too many of this effect in your deck, but as kind of a one-off to play in the mid to late game, this seems awesome, and uh, Black doesn't lack uh, enablers for bargain, so C plus easily. A Barrow Naughty is one on a black for a 1-3 fairy at common. It flies and has a lifelink as long as we control another fairy. Should not be too difficult, especially in blue-black. And then for two and a black, it gets plus one plus O until end of turn. So not a bad mana sink, especially once it has lifelink. The extra power is going to be quite relevant. So this seems like a very solid playable. Easily a C um, in the fairy decks. It's going to go up in value drastically, but still playable outside of fairy decks, especially if you just have a couple other incidental fairies, which uh, Black has access to as well. Besiege the Mirror is one and triple Black for a Mythic Rare Sorcery with Bargain. Let's just search your library for any card, exile it face down, then shuffle. If the spell was bargained, we may cast the Exile card without paying its mana cost, but only if that spell's mana value is 4 or less. And then, if not, put the Exile card into our hand. So essentially a 4 mana, kind of a tutor effect, similar to a Diabolic Tutor, I believe is the name, although it's triple black to cast, so it's even more difficult than 2 and double black. Although it does have the potential upside of casting the spell for free, but only if its mana value is 4 or less. And usually for tutoring for stuff, we want to tutor for the more powerful things that tend to cost more than 4 mana. So yeah, I'm not too interested in Besiege the Mirror. I think this is a D. Candy Grapple, 1 on a black for an instant at common, does have bargain. Either way, it gives a creature minus three, minus three until end of turn, which for two mana is an awesome removal spell, uh, especially at common. And then if it was bargained, we can give minus five, minus five until end of turn instead. Earlier when going over the uh, multicolor cards, already mentioned how decreasing power and toughness typically ends up being better than dealing damage. And then minus five, minus five is likely to take out most of the opponent's creatures, even the bigger ones especially when combined with an attack. And uh, yeah, Candy Grapple is looking like one of the best commons in black, which is very efficient and instant speed. Conceited Witch to in a black for a common human warlock. Can cast it as a 2-3 with menace, or we can first use the Price of Beauty Sorcery Adventure 
single black to create a wicked roll token and put it on target creature we control. So it doesn't actually mention what the wicked roll does on the card itself, but here it is. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one, and when this aura is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. The wicked roll mostly appears on black cards. If the creature dies, this will go off, but uh, we might have some ways to sacrifice the roll token to our various bargain cards, which will also still make the opponent lose one life. So we've got that going for us. Now, of course, when curving out, it's a little awkward in the sense that we may not be able to use the adventure if we just want to play the witch on turn three, unless, I guess, we have a one-mana creature in play, played on turn one, turn two, cast the adventure, and then turn three, play the witch. That way we can still curve out. But if we just play a two-mana creature on turn two, then it's not going to quite work out if we want to play and use the adventure in the same turn on turn three. So something to keep in mind. The witch does get better if you have a couple extra one drops in your deck that you can uh, enchant with the adventure before playing the witch. So overall C plus I think for the witch. The fact that it generates two different bodies for potential uh, celebration synergies even though they're mostly in uh, red whites could still potentially go black red have a few celebration creatures that the witch can help enable and then for the various bargain sacrifice decks being able to make that extra token can also come in handy so it's good enough going for it then we've got dream spoilers three and a black for a fairy warlock and uncommon has flying just a two two so a bit on the small side but whenever we cast a spell during an opponent's turn, up to one target creature an opponent controls gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. So this could be another way to punish those one toughness creatures. Going to be difficult to enable this more than once uh, during the opponent's turn, but uh, even once could be enough to kill some smaller creatures or shrink them down so we can set up profitable blocks. That's going to keep the opponent guessing when we pass a turn with a bunch of untapped mana. Now, with that being said, we're still paying 4 mana for a 2-2 flyer, which is a bit on the small side. And if we don't have a lot of instants or flash creatures to go with it, it may be a bit disappointing. So I wouldn't go above C for Dream Spoilers. Then there's the Ego Drain, a single black sorcery at Uncommon. Target opponent reveals their hand. We get to choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. So it seems pretty amazing so far, but if we don't control a fairy, we have to exile a card from our hand. Okay, so ideally we're playing this in a fairy deck, so blue-black is the best home for it. Can maybe play a fairy turn 2 or turn 3, and then double spell Ego Drain plus another card on the following turn. Doesn't seem too difficult to set up, and the effect is powerful. This can grab both creatures as well as non-creature spells. So it doesn't have that limitation of, let's say, a duress. And uh, yeah, if we cast this as the last card in our hand, we exile a card from our hand. But if we don't have any cards, then that's not a problem. So another small interaction to keep in mind. Seems playable. Nothing groundbreaking, but I'll give it a C. The end is two and double black for a rare instant, getting a two mana discount if our life total is five or less. Hopefully that's not the case, but I guess a discount is always nice. And then we get to exile, target creature or planeswalker, search its controller's graveyard, hands and library for any number of cards with the same name as that permanent, and exile them. Opponent does get to shuffle, and then draw a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. So it's not like we're going to strip the opponent's entire hand apart without giving them something in return. But yeah, essentially four mana, exile creature, planeswalker, couple extra upsides. And already this would be a B just for the four mana, exile creature, planeswalker part. The extra upside I don't think pushes it into the A tier. I rarely give these removal spells an A since while nice to have, they're not necessarily winning you the game by themselves. But uh Definitely a nice early pick and incentive to go black. Ariat's Whisper, three and a black for a common sorcery. I've seen it earlier. Target opponent discards two cards and we get to create a wicked roll token. 
and attach it to up to one target creature we control. So pretty effective uh, discard spell. We're used to paying three mana for mind rots that make the opponent discard two, but we do get a significant upside with a wicked roll token, easy to underestimate. It's almost as if the plus one plus one also has haste in a way, because we can attach it to a creature that's already in play, maybe enabling attacks that it couldn't uh, set up before. So I like C plus for Ariat's Whisper, especially if the format ends up being a little slower. This goes up in value. The only potential drawback is when facing adventures. The opponent might have a couple creatures in exile that are adventure creatures, and then we of course can't make them discard those adventure cards once in exile. So can necessarily empty the opponent's entire hand if we account for cards in exile as well, but still pretty good. Fairy Dream Thief is a single black uncommon fairy warlock, a 1-1 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, surveil one. So it gives us a tiny bit of card selection, can maybe fill the graveyard to enable some other synergies. And then we can also pay a two and a black, exile the Dream Thief from our graveyard in order to draw a card and to lose one life. So if it ends up getting milled some other way, we can still get value from the graveyard. Cheap fairy to enable some of our other fairy synergies. Nice once it picks up some aura to enhance it. So there's a lot going for the Dream Thief, and I'm happy giving it a C plus. Even outside of fairy decks, this is quite playable as a 1-1 one -one that can get in some damage. Bit of card selection, and then later could chum block and then still draw a card later from the graveyard. Then we've got Fairy Fencing X and a black for an instant at common. Saying target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. And that creature gets an additional minus three minus three until end of turn if we controlled a fairy as we cast it. So the templating here is very specific. It means that if the opponent tries to kill our only fairy in response when we cast fencing, it's still gonna apply that extra minus three. So that's quite nice. And uh, yeah, if we do get the extra bonus, this card is amazing. Outside of a fairy deck, I'm not too thrilled about it since it's still kind of expensive to shrink an opposing creature down. But in a fairy deck, this is an absolute powerhouse and easily gets a B. Could be a single black, essentially, if we cast it for X equals zero and still take something out. Feed the Cauldron, another removal spell. This one, two and a black for an instant at common, destroying target creature with mana value three or less. If it's our turn, we also get to create a food token. So pretty decent. Um, it is a little bit conditional in nature. Mana value three or less means it may not take out the opponent's bombs, but uh, still plenty of powerful cheap creatures that we wouldn't mind taking out. The extra food token is a welcome addition can also enable various synergies across multiple archetypes. So a lot of decks will be happy with Feed the Cauldron, and I'll give it a C plus. Not quite a premium B tier removal spell, since it doesn't deal with the more problematic creatures, but still easily C plus. Fell Horseman, three in a black for a zombie knight at common. A 3-3 three, three, saying when it dies, put it on the bottom of its owner's library. So makes it harder for the opponent to maybe mill you out, I guess. Not super relevant in the set. Again, mill not really a supported archetype like it was in Throne of Eldraine. So that extra ability doesn't seem incredibly relevant. Does have a adventure as well. A deathly ride is one on a black for a sorcery, saying return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So your classic raise dead effect only gets back a single creature, and it does cost two mana, so not the most efficient adventure, although it is still kind of like a two for one if you get something back and then play creature afterwards. The only issue is that the creature's just kind of below the curve. A three three for four mana, and not very exciting, so you better have something to return from the graveyard, and even then this card's not amazing, so I think just a C for a fell horseman can't really give it more than that. A Gumdrop Poisoner is next, two and a black for a human warlock at rare. It's a 3-2 lifelink, 
And when it enters the battlefield, up to one target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the amount of life we gained this turn. And then it can also tempt with treats for a single black. It's an instant, creating a food token. So being able to just play the adventure turn one, when we may not be able to spend our mana otherwise, is pretty nice. And then later in the game, if we have a food token, we could pay two mana, sack it to gain three. And then when the poisoner enters, we can give minus three and take out a pretty large threat from the opponent. So that's nice, although that does mean it, it's going to essentially cost us 5 mana to sack the food and play Poisoner. So it's getting a little bit expensive, but we might have some other lifelink creatures that are attacking to set up the Poisoner, so we can still potentially play it sooner. Also very good in multiples, but of course as a rare it's a bit uh, difficult to end up with more than one, but it could also be a fun build around for Constructed. Either way, Easily a B for Poisoner, perfect for the food decks, but outside of it still very good. And the food token also great to enable Bargain, and speaking of which, High Fae Negotiator is a 5 mana 3 5 fairy warlock at uncommon, with Bargain and flying, and when it enters the battlefield, if it was bargained, each opponent loses 3 life and we gain 3 life. A very nice ability, often worth the sacrifice especially for sacrificing a food token, which would potentially just end up gaining three. Now we also make the opponent lose three life. So pure upside. This seems like another B level card. Next is Hopeless Nightmare, a one mana enchantment at common. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card and loses two life. So if we can play this early, this is going to essentially replace itself by taking away a card from the opponent makes him lose a bit of life, that's nice. And then it's also an awesome bargain enabler as a cheap enchantment we don't mind sacrificing because when it is put into a graveyard from the battlefield we also get to scry to and can also sacrifice it for tuna black. So this is very similar to that white enchantment for two mana making a 2-2 knight token. Instead this makes them discard and lose two life. So another C plus for me, an awesome enabler for especially the black white sacrifice archetype but I'm sure a lot of decks will be able to make use of it. A Lich Knight's Conquest. Four and a black for a rare sorcery. Sacrifice any number of artifacts, enchantments and or tokens. So it kind of has a multi-bargain, if you will. And then return that many creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. So this does require a bit of setup. If we don't have multiple creatures in graveyard, this doesn't do much. If we only have one creature in graveyard, this is a very expensive reanimation effect that also requires a sacrifice. But under the right circumstances where we have two or three things we don't mind sacking and uh, multiple things in graveyard, then yeah, this could quickly swing the tide of battle. Still a bit conditional, requires a bit of setup, but uh, I'll give it a hopeful C plus for now. Lord Skitter, Sewer King, two and a black for a 3-3 legendary rat noble at rare. Says whenever another rat enters the battlefield under our control, exile up to one target card from an opponent's graveyard. So a bit of graveyard hate can be appreciated. And then at the beginning of combat, on our turn, create a 1-1 black rat creature token that cannot block. So turn after turn, we get to make a 1-1 token, perfect for enabling bargain, but especially in red-black, we have other ways of making use of that 1-1 token. So Lord Skitter, easily a B, and uh, a good incentive to jump into the black-red uh, rat deck. But even outside of it, if you're like a black-white sacrifice deck, you'll be very happy with all those 1-1 tokens you can sacrifice. And then Lord Skitter's Blessing also pairs well with all those tokens. One on a black for an enchantment at rare. Says, when it enters the battlefield, create a Wicked Roll token attached to target creature we control. So the Wicked Roll giving plus one plus one. If the enchantment is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. And then at the beginning of our draw step, if we control an enchanted creature, we lose one life and we draw an additional card. So kind of like your Phyrexian Arena, 
Although there is a bit of a drawback if the opponent can answer your only enchanted creature, then the blessing will stop drawing cards. In terms of sequencing, could also be difficult to set this up on turn two, because if you don't have a one mana creature to enchant, then you probably want to wait until you get it going. So not a card you're necessarily going to want to play on turn two, uh, which does decrease its uh, utility somewhat. But uh, yeah, if you've got lots of one drops, this definitely gets better. And then uh, a steady stream of card advantage. I'll happily pay one life to draw a card for uh, most parts of the game. And uh, can always find another way to enchant your creatures, even if they answer the initial creature you enchanted. So B for Lord Skitter's Blessing. I think it's powerful enough that uh, I'm happy to jump through a few hoops to make sure it keeps going. Lord Skitter's Butcher, 2 and a black for a Red Peasant at Uncommon, a 2-3. When it enters the battlefield, choose one, either make a 1-1 Red that cannot block, can sacrifice another creature if we do Scry 2 and then draw a card, or creatures we control gain menace until end of turn. The first two modes are probably the ones we're going to use most often, but yeah, occasionally giving the team menace can help us close out the game as well. Just making an extra token, also good for enabling celebration synergies, and then sacrifice fodder for bargain. And if we already have some tokens we don't mind sacrificing, then scry to draw card on top of a 2-3 seems good enough. So C plus for the butcher. Next is a minstrosity, one on a black for a 3-1 horror at common. When it dies, makes a food token. Yeah, fine filler card especially for the black green food decks can apply a bit of pressure early and then maybe help you double block to trade off for larger opposing creatures while generating a bit of material not dead after all a single black instant and this is the type of effect we've seen in the past until end of turn target creature we control against when this creature dies return it to the battlefield tapped under sonar's control in this case, we also get to create a Wicked Roll token and attach the Wicked Roll token to that creature. So instead of a plus one plus one counter, we get a plus one plus one aura a roll token that has a bit of extra upside. So yeah, nice combat trick effects. Um, don't want to have too many of these in any given deck, but uh, easily a C. The decks that want it should be able to pick it up, especially the more aggressive decks or a uh, decks that have some key threats that you want to protect. A Rankles Prank. Two and a double black for a rare sorcery. Get to choose one or more between each player discards two cards. Each player loses four life and each player sacrifices two creatures. And that final mode is probably what we're most interested in. Let's say we don't have any creatures ourselves. The opponent has two in play. Then now this turns into kind of a board wipe, if you will. And then... Uh, Occasionally, this will be the last card in your hands, and then you don't mind discarding two. And uh, if you're an aggressive deck, the lose four life could also be quite beneficial. So this offers a lot of flexibility. It's never going to be like straightforward to get value of all three modes, um, but I feel like it's still powerful enough that I'm willing to give it a C plus at the very least. Might even sneak its way into the B category. A rat out, a single black instant at common. Up to one creature gets a minus one, minus one until end of turn. And we also get to make a 1-1 one, one rat that cannot block. So pretty cheap uh, removal effects. Another way to punish one toughness. But I don't think a lot of decks are going to be interested in this. Uh, just seems a bit narrow. Minus one, minus one doesn't deal with bigger threats. And the rat token, while it can help in various sacrifice decks, still has somewhat limited utility and not necessarily worth a whole card, but uh, maybe a very dedicated red-black rats deck will be happy with one or two of these, but it should be kind of the last pick in most drafts, I think. So it gets a D. Rowan's Grim Surge, two and a black for an instant at common, has bargain, and if it was bargained, we get to look at the top four cards of our library, putting two of them back on top of our library in any order, and then the rest in our graveyard, and otherwise simply draw two cards and lose two life. 
pretty normal for a three mana card draw effect in black to cost us a bit of life. This is an instance, so plays well alongside our other blue instant speed counter spells perhaps. So will fit quite nicely in blue black, black white has a lot of bargain enablers as we've seen. So this one seems pretty solid for a card draw effect and I'm also happy giving it a C plus even though it does cost life compared to the blue version. The bargain giving us more card selection I think makes up for it. Scream Puff 4 and a black for a horror at common. It's a 4-5 with death touch and when it deals common damage to a player we get to create a food token. So pretty expensive um, but death touch means it's going to be a little bit more difficult for the opponent to answer even if the opponent let's say has a cursed roll that they can put on the screen puff it still is a 1-1 with death touch so it will still end up trading for an opposing creature most likely and uh, yeah getting to make food tokens especially useful for black green decks but even the bargain decks will be happy to have a steady stream of tokens they can sacrifice so fine role player five mana a little bit pricey and doesn't necessarily have an immediate ETB effect but uh, seems playable enough that I'm giving it a C. Shatter the Oath, five mana sorcery at common, destroying target creature or enchantment and we get to create a wicked roll token and attach it to up to one target creature we control. Yeah we're uh, kind of used to seeing five mana removal spells at common nowadays that are more unconditional in nature. This one offers a pretty significant upside with that wicked roll token. So I'm happy giving this a C plus. Not quite as efficient as some of the B tier removal, but still a card I'm happy to include, even if uh, it may be a little bit slow when facing the more aggressive decks. Spectre of Mortality, a five mana rare Spectre, a three three flyer. When it enters the battlefield, we may exile one or more creature cards from our own graveyard. When we do, each author creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of cards exiled this way. So Spectre has the potential of being an awesome board wipe that still leaves behind a 3-3 flyer, assuming we have enough creatures in graveyard to set it up. We don't have to exile anything, could just be a 3-3 flyer for 5, not the most exciting, but at least it has that flexibility. But I imagine it's not going to be too difficult to set up a powerful Spectre. Because let's say you don't have a lot of creatures in Graveyard already. You might have some in play. Now you can set up an attack. If the opponent lines up a couple of blocks, now you've got more fuel in the Graveyard to set up your Spectre. And the opponent's creatures also took a bit of damage, making it easier to clean them up with a minus X minus X. So you require fewer creatures to exile in the first place. And if the opponent takes the damage, then now you're in a racing situation and hopefully you're still favored there. So Spectre has the potential of just being board wipe plus threat, which in limited is incredibly powerful. So I think I'm willing to go up to an A for Spectre. Not always going to be easy to set up, but uh, yeah, the potential certainly there. Next is the Spiteful Hexmage, single black for a 3-2 human warlock at rare. When it enters the battlefield, create a cursed roll token and attach it to target creature you control. So it doesn't have to enchant itself necessarily, but if you play this on turn one, it's probably the only thing you've got in play. Unless you're maybe playing like a historic format where you can enchant an ornithopter, turning it into a 1-1 flyer, that could be pretty sweet. So yeah, the Hex Mage is essentially a 1 mana 1-1 one, one if it enchants itself, but we can sacrifice the Cursed Roll to maybe a Bargain effect and then be left with a 3-2 while powering up our Bargain cards. So that's probably its most common use case, which is pretty decent. Um, still, you know, not a bomb level card, it's still just a, a cheap creature, but uh, it fills a pretty unique role as a cheap Bargain enabler. So a spiteful hex mage, I'll go C plus. The decks that uh, are interested in playing a lot of bargain cards will be happy with it. Stingblade Assassin, a four mana three one fairy assassin at common has flash and flying, and when it enters the battlefield, destroy target creature an opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. So nice uh, finisher effect, 
and uh, plays well in the blue-black fairy deck, of course, where you want to keep up a bunch of mana anyway, so this having flash works out nicely. A three-powered flyer is also a significant clock, doesn't take many turns to kill the opponent with a three-powered flyer. One toughness is maybe the only thing that's holding this back and keeping it from a C+, but easily C level playable card. Now, I will say at least the rat tokens cannot block, so if the opponent's keeping back their rat tokens, it's not like they can block a large attacker and then finish it off with the assassin, but the reverse could happen, where they attack with a rat token, and then assassin can now finish off your uh, blocker. So there are definitely a lot of ways to keep those rat tokens attacking, even into larger blockers, and this is one of them. Sugar Rush is another, one on a black for an instant at common. Target creature gets plus 3 plus 0 until end of turn, and we get to draw a card. So a pump spell that does replace itself is always a nice deal. Now it doesn't pump toughness, so this is unlikely to save your creature from any uh, interaction or fight. So it's purely meant to push damage through, even if you use this on an evasive creature. You can kind of view it as 2 mana to deal 3 damage and draw a card, so that's pretty good. I mean, damage to the opponent, that is. But uh, this is ideal to get those rat tokens to keep attacking. If the opponent blocks with up to 4 toughness, you can still trade for their creature while drawing, so that's a pretty nice exchange. And if they take the damage, then now the 3 damage going upstairs at some point could also help close out the game, and can still potentially use it elsewhere. So very flexible. C plus replaces itself. I think uh, this will be a very nice role player for a lot of black decks, especially black red. Sweet Tooth Witch is two and a black for a three two human warlock at common. When it enters battlefield, create a food token. So already enables celebration by itself, and the food token will be useful for a variety of effects, including potentially paying two mana to sacrifice it and make the opponent lose two life. So now we can use all our food tokens to potentially drain the opponent to death as opposed to gaining a life ourselves. But we could also sacrifice the food token to maybe a bargain effect. So very flexible card. And I'm always kind of interested in these uh, cheap creatures that provide multiple bodies, not only for celebration, but also for bargain and other synergies. So C+. Taken by Nightmares, 2 and double black for an uncommon instant, says Exile target creature, if we control an enchantment, scry 2. So I think this is probably better than the rare 4 mana instant, the end, that could also exile planeswalkers I guess is the main upside, but a scry 2 seems pretty easy to achieve in this set with all these aura enchantments, so another B removal spell. Tangled Colony, one on a black for a 3-2 a rat at rare. It cannot block, which is a pretty significant drawback. And when the colony dies, create X 1-1 one, one black rat creature tokens that also cannot block, where X is the amount of damage dealt to it this turn. So the idea is you play your colony, it's gonna keep on attacking until the opponent has had enough, blocks it with maybe like a let's say a 4-4. Then the colony dies, but you still get four 1-1 one, one tokens in return, which is a pretty good deal, admittedly. The only issue is if you're on the back foot, then colony doesn't block, and the tokens you potentially generate also don't block, so it's completely useless there. So colony really wants to be played in a very aggressive deck that can keep up the pressure and eventually will force the opponent to give you those 1-1 one, one tokens. I probably wouldn't be too happy with this in like a controlling black-white sacrifice deck, even though the rank tokens it generates could be good sacrifice fodder. We may never get them if we're on the back foot and the colony doesn't end up taking damage. So, bit of a, a mixed bag here, but uh, I'll go with probably C plus for Tangled Colony, since it does seem pretty good in the more aggressive ranked decks. Then the Twisted Sewer Witch is 5 mana for a 3-4 Human Warlock at Uncommon. And when it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 Rat creature token that cannot block. And then for each rat we control, we get to create a Wicked Roll token attached to that rat. 
So this seems awesome, even by itself, if we don't have any other rant tokens in play. Play the Sewer Witch, make a 1-1, one -one, attach a token to it. So now we got 5 power and 6 toughness worth of stats. Admittedly, 2 of that is bound to a 1-1 one -one token, or I guess now a 2-2 two -two token that cannot block, so it might also not have the best time attacking. But at least if it dies, it still makes the opponent lose one life. And this is kind of the worst case scenario where we don't have any other rants or synergies in play. If we actually have multiple rants, this seems uh, pretty amazing. Especially if we have more ways of uh, essentially getting those rant tokens to keep attacking. So I'll go for B for the Twisted Sewer Witch. This is a type of card I want to pick up early and then build my red-black rant deck around. As opposed to, you know, taking some weaker payoff card. Next is Virtue of Persistence, 7 mana, Mythic Rare Enchantment. So the white one got an S, the blue one I think I gave a D. And we'll see what's next. We can cast a 2 mana Adventure at Sorcery Speed, Lochthwain Scorn, 1 on a black, giving a target creature minus 3 minus 3 until end of turn. We also gain 2 life. So already just the Adventure has me very interested and I would easily include this in uh, most of my decks. But there's more. For 7 mana we can cast the enchantment after having cast the adventure saying at the beginning of our upkeep put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. It says a graveyard which means also the opponent's graveyard potentially. So yeah this card is ridiculous and gets an S as well joining the white mythic rare enchantment and expect to see that card in Constructed quite a bit as well. Next is Voracious Vermin, 2 and a black for a common rat, a 2-1 that when it enters generates a 1-1 rat that cannot block, and whenever another creature we control dies, put a plus humble swan counter on the vermin. So again, makes multiple bodies, good for sacrifice synergies, and of course at its best in the rat's aggressive deck, and uh, what do we give it as a overall grade? Definitely verging on C+, I think I'm convinced. Just because uh, it has enough synergies and can fit into more than just a black-red deck as something that provides multiple bodies. Also good for enabling the celebration synergies. Next is the Warehouse Tabby, single black for a common cat. It's a 1-1. Says whenever an enchantment we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, Get to make a 1-1 one, one rat that cannot block. And for 1 and a black it also gains a death touch until end of turn. So a death touch on demand is always very useful. So if uh, our opponent wants to attack into our creatures and we've got 2 mana untapped, they might have to reconsider. So the threat of activation is very useful. Can potentially attack with it a few times before the opponent has decided that they've had enough. So yeah, very useful abilities on a 1-drop. And we've seen a few cards that reward us for having a 1-drop in play on turn 1, like the uh, Common Witch that can give the uh, Wicked Roll to one of our creatures with the 1-mana adventure. So this could be a nice recipient for that aura as well. So don't think I'm going C plus for the Tabby, but as far as 1-drops go, this one seems quite playable. Wicked Visitor is next, one on a black for a 2-2 Nightmare at Common and says whenever an enchantment we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. This one I'm not quite as interested in. The decks that are probably best at enabling this effect are going to be those defensive black-white sacrifice decks, and I don't think they really want a 2-2, and they probably don't care about making the opponent lose life either, so this feels like the last pick kind of card that no one's interested in for good reason. So it gets a D. The Witch's Vanity is a 2 mana saga for 1 on the black at uncommon. First chapter, destroy target creature and opponent controls with mana value 2 or less. Okay, a little bit narrow in scope perhaps, but if it can efficiently take out the opponent's 2 drop, this seems pretty useful so far. Chapter 2, create a food token. Chapter 3, create a Wicked Roll token attached to target creature we control. So we're getting a lot of value here, an enchantment, 
a foo token and then another aura enchantment token all things we can also sacrifice to bargain in the meantime so another awesome two mana saga and we've seen a couple of these so far we'll give this a b and that was our final black card our first red card belligerent of the ball two and a red for a ogre warrior a 3-3 three, three at uncommon and it has celebration saying at the beginning of combat on our turn if we enable celebration target creature we control gets plus one plus oh and gains a menace until end of turn so already a base 3-3-4-3 three, 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 definitely getting to playable territory the celebration ability is certainly a relevant upside can choose any creature to get uh, plus one plus oh and menace so it can potentially enable that the same turn we played belligerent if we played something else alongside it to enable celebration so yeah three three with solid upside gets a c plus bellowing bruiser a five mana four four with haste at common but it also has an adventure for two and a red beat a path up to two target creatures cannot block this turn a little bit on the pricey side for a 4-4 creature may not always have a great time attacking uh, even with haste by the time we can cast it but you know the adventure offers a bit of flexibility and uh, yeah if the opponent doesn't have any great blockers lined up it this uh, can certainly deliver the beatdowns so I think playable C not quite uh, C plus bespoke battle garb the only equipment in the set although i guess there is one exception that we'll get to with artifacts that can sort of turn into an equipment so spoilers ahead but uh, yeah bespoke battle garb one and a red for an equipment at common equipped creature gets plus two plus oh and it equips for two mana so if that were it it's a little bit on the pricey side to move around but we can get around it thanks to celebration so now we don't have to pay the two mana to equip it which certainly helps out you can maybe play the battle garb and something else in the same turn to immediately equip it in the red white aggressive celebration deck this seems quite useful and also in the red black rat deck i think might actually make best use of this equipping a rat token into a 3-1 now it's much more likely to keep attacking and then if it ends up trading for a creature we can pretty easily move the battle garb somewhere else if we can make more rat tokens for instance so probably just a c for the battle garb kind of narrow in uh, which decks it will go in but yeah red white and black red seem like great homes for this a boundary lands ranger one and a red for a 2-2 human ranger at uncommon at the beginning of combat on your turn if you control a creature with power four or greater we may discard a card if we do draw a card so a two drop that can be played early and in the late game still provides useful utility that's what i like so we'll get a c plus will probably be at its best in red green where we have lots of high powered creatures to enable the ability but uh, most decks will be happy with this charming scoundrel one and a red for a one one human rogue at rare has haste and when it enters a battlefield we can choose one between a discard a card draw a card can make a treasure token or we can create a wicked roll token attached to target creature we control so it doesn't have to target itself necessarily although if we play this on turn two i imagine we probably want a two two haste with that uh, wicked roll token so yeah could even potentially see some constructed play as an aggressive two mana haste creature and then has the extra utility of potentially ramping out your four drop ahead of schedule giving you some card selection so it seems like a card that could see play in a wide variety of settings as far as limited is concerned i think i'm even willing to give this a b just because of the flexibility cut in is three and a red for a common sorcery can deal four damage to target creature so it seems like a pretty solid removal spell but there's more we also get to create a young hero roll token attached to up to one target creature we control so this is a sorcery not an instant speed removal but uh, yeah for four mana we're probably gonna answer most opposing creatures outside of some of the larger green creatures perhaps and then uh, we also get a roll token can help enable 
various synergies all the way from celebration to bargain. So I like C plus for cut in. A little bit on the pricey side for removal. Not instant speed, not always unconditional, but there's still enough going for it. Actual pack is 3 under red for a common dog. It's a 3-3 with menace, and when it enters we also get to make a 1-1 rat that cannot block. I think I'm gonna stop saying that rats cannot block, because it applies to all the rat tokens in this set, so that'll save us some time. But yeah, the pack, another card that can enable various synergies, great with celebration in your red-white aggressive decks, as an evasive creature that makes a token, so we'll create two non-land permanents for you to enable those celebration synergies, and then the rat token will be great for any red-black rat deck, as well as potentially sacrifice fodder for your bargain decks. So this fits into a lot of different archetypes. It's never going to be amazing in any of those decks, but as a 4-drop it uh, ticks a lot of boxes, so gets a C. Next is Embereth Veteran, 1 mana, 2 1 Human Knight at Uncommon. Can pay 1 mana, sacrifice the Veteran, and create a young hero or role token attached to another target creature. At least we can sacrifice the Veteran at instant speed, but yeah, this is not the most exciting 1 drop. If we play it on turn 1, can get a bit of damage in, so at its best in those aggressive decks that I mentioned earlier, and uh, in the late game. Once it can no longer attack and block profitably, can maybe chum block with it and then on the way out enhance one of our other creatures. So seems playable, but still not a card I'm particularly excited about. Gets a C. Flick a coin, two in the red for an instant at common. Deals one damage to any target and we create a treasure token and we get to draw a card. So this is the ultimate way to punish one toughness creatures. We take them out, we draw a card and make a treasure all at once. This seems great for those uh, blue-red spells decks. Can be a way to enable prowess at instant speed. Can uh, finish off a creature that's been dealt a bit of damage already. And uh, can also help you ramp into more expensive spells. So this kind of does it all and you don't even feel bad just cycling this, targeting the opponents and then uh, at least you'll still get a card and a treasure token in return. So I have a lot of good things to say about Flick a Coin. And uh, yeah, could even be constructed playable in the right setting. Food Fight is one and a red for a rare enchantment. Saying artifacts we control have pay two mana, sacrifice this artifact, and then it deals damage to any targets equal to one plus the number of permanents named Food Fight we control. So assuming we're playing limited and are being realistic, we only have one food fight in play. It essentially deals two damage when we sacrifice an artifact, because we have one damage plus one food fight. So we're sacrificing probably food tokens for the most part to deal two damage. I might have some treasure tokens as well. So yeah, if we can sacrifice, let's say, three artifacts for a total of six damage, then this could be pretty effective, but I think it's going to be somewhat difficult to enable. If this were a black or green card, then um, it would be a lot better going alongside all the other food generators. Um, there's a limited amount of treasure makers in red, so that's probably the best uh, pairing in red itself. So yeah, I'm hesitant to give this a very high grade. Go with D for food fight. But if you get lucky and somehow get multiples, I guess you can make it work. Frantic Firebolt, 2 and a red for an instant at common, dealing X damage to target creature, where X is 2, plus the number of cards in our graveyard that are instant cards, sorcery cards, and or have an adventure. So pretty wide range of cards, especially if you're playing a more dedicated instant sorcery adventure deck. And uh, yeah, this plays well with those cheap cantrips like Sleight of Hand to fill the graveyard early to kind of power up your frantic firebolts. So this seems like another C plus common removal spell alongside Flick a Coin. Knowing Crescendo is 2 and red for an instant at common, saying creatures we control get plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. And whenever a non-token creature we control dies this turn, we get to make a 1-1 rat token. 
a trumpet blast effect that works both offensively as well as defensively is nice. Although assuming you're playing this alongside a few rats that cannot block, it's probably better used on offense than uh, defense. But yeah, this is exactly the type of card we want to keep those rat tokens attacking. And it can potentially make a few more in the process. So in the very aggressive uh, rat decks, this should be pretty useful. Uh, gets a C. I don't think many other decks will want it. A Godric Cloaked Reveler. One and double red for a 3-3 a legendary human noble at rare. Has haste, so it can attack right away. And has celebration, turning it into a 4-4 flying dragon. That also has fire breathing, so we can pay a red mana to increase its power by one. Okay, now we're talking. If we play this early, get an attack in for three, and then if we can consistently enable celebration with all those token makers, then uh, yeah, four damage turn after turn is going to add up quickly, so we should be able to end the game in a hurry. So easily B for Godric, and uh, yeah, if we can play this on turn three and keep enabling celebration, this might even kind of feel more like a bomb level A. Grabby Giant, 4 mana, Giant at common, has an instant speed adventure for 1 and a red, creating a treasure token, and then a 4-3 a reach creature that can also pay 2 and a red, sacrifice an artifact or land to draw a card. So the adventure helps us cast a giant on turn 3, so it has that kind of built-in synergy, and uh, yeah, can also preserve the treasure token to cast some of our more expensive spells, can use it to fix our colors as well, which could be relevant if we're splashing. And a 4-3 reach for 4, not exciting, but certainly playable. So overall, C plus for Grabby Giant has enough going for it. And then late game, if we don't need lands anymore, can also be a source of card advantage there. A Grand Ball a Guest, 1 and a red for a Human Peasant at common, a 2-2 with Celebration giving it plus 1 plus 1 and Trample until end of turn. So yeah, this is the perfect two drop to start your aggressive curve in those red-white celebration decks. I guess you could also start with a one drop and play this on turn two, but uh, as long as you can consistently keep enabling celebration, this seems like a uh, very scary two drop to face, especially if you're on the draw. So I'll go C plus for the guest. This is probably one of the cornerstones of the aggressive celebration archetype and will potentially slot in nicely into the red-black rats archetype as well, which is good at enabling celebration. Harried Spearguard is a single red for a 1-1 human soldier at common. It has haste, and when it dies it leaves behind a rat token. So another nice aggressive card to start out in your uh, red-black rats deck, and uh, can potentially enhance it with various abilities to increase its power, and then if it does eventually trade, it will still leave behind a token, so you can keep up the pressure, and uh, yeah, goes well with equipment. We've seen the pump spell in black for two mana, giving it three extra power and drawing a card, so I think it's quite playable in the right deck, which is red-white and red-black for the most part. Gets a C. Next is Hearth Elemental. 6 mana uncommon elemental, that's a 4-5, but it does get a X mana discount essentially where X is the number of cards in our graveyard that are instant, sorcery, or adventure cards. So it's pretty realistic to cast this for maybe 3 or 4 mana even as we approach the mid to late game. So pretty good deal if we can get a 3 mana 4-5 for instance. It also has an adventure for 1 and a red. A sorcery letting us discard our hands to then draw two cards. So ideally we cast this when empty-handed, although it could also be used as sort of a ritual effect, discarding some uh, instant sorcery or adventure cards to then fuel the discount to cast a very cheap hearth elemental. So it does have that flexibility I suppose, but yeah, probably don't want to ditch your entire hand if possible. But uh, very flexible and Seems like a nice role player, especially in the blue-red decks, but maybe red-green has a nice overlap with enough instant sorceries and adventures as well. So at the very least a C+, might even verge on a B. Next up we've got the Pyrohammer, 4 mana for a 4-4 four, four 
a legendary human knight at rare. Says whenever an instant or sorcery spell we control that targets only a single creature deals damage to that creature. Instead, it deals that much damage to each opponent. So this turns our creature burn spells into face burn spells, essentially. So we can still take out opposing creatures while getting extra damage. Yeah, we've seen a few removal spells, uh, even at common. There's the three mana uh, frantic firebolt, I believe, which uh, could end up dealing quite a bit of damage if we have a full graveyard full of instant sorceries and adventures. And then now the pyro hammer can uh, lay down the hammer and close out the game pretty quickly as well. So in the right deck, this seems pretty strong, easily a B. And then a four mana four four is still pretty solid stance. Then we've got Kindled Heroism, a single red for an instant at common, giving a creature plus one plus so, and first strike until end of turn. We also get to scry one. We've definitely seen cheap tricks like this before. This one tends to be a bit low impact, only one extra power. I'm gonna give this a D. Maybe better in the red-white decks where you've got higher powered creatures compared to red-black, but even there you can probably do better. Then we've got Corvolt and the Noble Thief. So we're no longer working with a 2-mana Saga. This one is 4-mana. And uh, yeah, this one's decidedly worse than the 2-mana counterparts we've seen so far. Create a treasure token on chapter 1 and 2. And finally, exile the top 3 cards of target opponent's library. And we may play those cards this turn. So it doesn't automatically fix colors to cast the exiled cards. But of course, we'll likely have some treasure tokens left over to help cast those exiled cards. Still seems pretty mediocre to me, even though there are ways to sacrifice the treasure tokens to enable bargain, for instance. The more treasures we sacrifice, the less likely we are to get value from the final chapter. Maybe this is a sideboard card that you can bring in if the opponent's playing exactly the same colors as you are. So you're more likely to be able to cast those exiled cards. Um, but yeah, I'm still not entirely sold, so I'll give this a D. And then there's the Merry Bards, 2 and a red for a human bard at common, a 3-2. When it enters the battlefield, we can pay 1 mana. When we do, create a young hero roll token and attach it to target creature we control. So we can attach it to the bards itself. And uh, also a great enabler for celebration if we cast it for 4 mana making two a non-land permanence and the token can also be sacrificed to bargain so there's no lack of synergy and i think overall that pushes it into the c plus range where it can fit into a lot of different decks probably at its best in red white still next is the minecart daredevil two and a red for a four two and common also as an adventure we could play first one and a red for an instant a right the rails saying a target creature gets plus two plus one until end of turn. Okay, not bad. Um, a way to potentially pump up our rat tokens. A 4-2, also a cheap creature to potentially enable those kind of ferocious synergies that we'll see more in green that care about controlling a four-powered creature. And it's also an adventure, so it fits pretty well into the blue rat spells deck as an adventure and as an instant if we use the adventure. So this is kind of a decent role player that fits into a lot of decks. It's still probably worthy of a C+. Pretty decent when played on curve, just as a 3-drop. But the flexibility of the pump spell makes it quite a bit better. And then, uh, yeah, if we have any way of enhancing it or removing opposing blockers to clear path, then this hits pretty hard. Monstrous Rage is a single red instant at uncommon, saying a target creature gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn, and we get to create a monster roll token attached to it. Monster roll is plus one plus one and trample. So assuming our creature didn't already have a roll token attached that the monster roll replaces. This is essentially one mana for plus three plus one and trample. And the plus one plus one and trample part is permanent. Also a way to enable celebration at instant speed by making that a roll token. So that could certainly be relevant. Just imagine giving your uh, first striking white three drop double strike all of a sudden in addition to three extra power. That could be a blowout. So those are kind of the scenarios where Monstrous Rage will shine. Definitely better in a more aggressive deck 
where you can leverage the extra power and trample and uh, yeah also potentially decent in a, a rat aggro deck but probably still at its best in kind of your red white celebration decks and red green perhaps where giving a large green creature trample can help out overall c plus usually i stick to c for most pump spells but this has enough going for it part of the pump effect is also permanent with a roll token so i'm willing to go c plus on this Raging Battle Mouse is one in red for a 2 1 mouse at rare, saying the second spell we cast each turn costs one less to cast, and it also has Celebration, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, if we enable Celebration, then target creature we control gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Yeah, this is very effective at helping us double spell and therefore also enabling Celebration, so it kind of enables itself. Now it is a one toughness creature. You would hate to get this removed by someone's uh, flick a coin, for instance. So that's a bit of a drawback. And uh, probably at its best in, of course, red-white. Don't know if many other decks are interested in it. So a bit of a narrow card in scope, um, but could be pretty reasonable in the right deck. So I'll go C plus on the Battle Mouse. Next is the Rat Catcher Trainee, one on a red for a common human peasant, a 2-1, saying as long as it's our turn, the Rat Catcher Trainee has first strike. So pretty nice again in the more proactive, aggressive decks that have pump spells to back it up. And it also has an adventure pest problem, two on a red for an instant, creating two rat tokens. So we can potentially play this at instant speed to enable celebration by making two 1-1 one, one tokens. So that's very nice. And then uh, of course we'll be at its best in red-black, but yeah, even red-white will be very happy with an instant speed celebration enabler. So again, has enough kind of overlapping synergy that I'm willing to give this a C plus. Fine to play on turn two, but ideally we get to also cast the adventure first. Then there's the Realm Scorcher Halkite. 6 mana for a 4-6 mythic rare dragon, it has bargain, it has flying, it has haste, and when it enters the battlefield, if it was bargained, we get to add 4 mana in any combination of colors. Probably gonna have at least 2 red mana among those colors, because for 1 and a red, the Hellkite deals 1 damage to any target. So let's say we bargained the Hellkite, we don't have any other mana otherwise, but now we're back up to 4 mana, we can activate the ability twice already, so we can immediately deal 2 damage, take out some smaller creatures from the opponent, and of course attack for 4 in the air. So this will close out the game in a hurry, and uh, yeah, hopefully the opponent doesn't answer it right away. But even if they do, let's say they have the uh, cursed roll to put on the Hellkite, it can still keep activating to deal damage, so that seems very nice indeed. Uh, is this an S tier level bomb? I think it's still more of an A than an S, but uh, I don't think it really makes a big difference since most packs will only have so many rares or mythics in them that you're always going to first pick this when given the chance. Next is the Red Cap Gutter Dweller. 4 mana for a 3 3 Goblin Warrior at rare. It has menace. And when it enters a battlefield, create two rat tokens. At the beginning of our upkeep, we may sacrifice another creature. If we do, put a plus one plus one counter on the gutter dweller, and we also exile the top card of our library. We may play that card this turn. Can also play a lance with that ability. So yeah, the gutter dweller once again creates multiple bodies, has menace, has a bit of built innovation, can keep growing once we put counters on it. If the opponent answers it right away to prevent us from getting card advantage, then we still at least got a few rat tokens left over. If they don't answer it, then the card advantage could snowball into a quick victory. So yeah, a lot of good things to say about the Gutter Dweller. And uh, yeah, I think I'm giving this bomb status as well. Even if it may not be as flashy as the Hellkite, still very good. Then we've got the Red Camp Thief, 2 and a red for a 2-3 Goblin Rogue at common. When it enters the battlefield, create a treasure token. So once again enables Celebration all by itself. And there's plenty of other ways to use the treasure token besides ramp and mana fixing. So 
think C+. This has enough overlapping synergy once again that I'm happy with this in a lot of different red decks. Blue-red might be the worst home for it, since it doesn't really work too well with instants and sorceries, no adventure, but in red-green this can maybe help ramp out a bigger green creature ahead of schedule. In red-white it enables celebration, still seems useful enough. Rotisserie Elemental is a single red for a rare elemental, a 1-1 one -one with menace, and when it deals combat damage to a player, put a skewer counter on it, and then we may sacrifice it. If we do, exile the top X cards of our library, where X is the number of skewer counters on the elemental, and we may play those cards this turn. This seems decidedly worse than what Beaumont Courier used to do. Menace gives it built-in evasion, but it doesn't have haste, so that kind of makes up for it. And we have to play the cards we exiled right away, it's not like we can keep them in hand. I guess we don't have to discard our hand as the upside, but yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Best case scenario, of course, we play this on turn one, but any other scenario where we don't play this on turn one, it's unlikely to ever draw us any extra cards. So D4 Rotisserie Elemental could be playable and constructed, where you can consistently play uh, cheap spells and play this on curve, but uh, yeah, it just feels a bit iffy and limited. Skewer Slinger is one in a red for a 1-3 Dwarf Knight at common, has reach, and when the Slinger blocks or becomes blocked by a creature, it deals one damage to that creature. So this is a pretty clean answer to any 1-1 Death Touch creatures out there, as we can take them out before they get a chance to deal damage to the Slinger. Um, a reach, also pretty useful at holding off any one or two toughness flying creatures on the other side of the battlefield. So yeah, the ability is uh, definitely better than it looks at first glance. Also maybe a way to punish first strike creatures, although again there's not too many of those. Um, still not an exciting card. If we're just attacking with a one-powered creature, the opponent can just take it and then they only take one damage. So definitely better on defense than offense. Um, and red tends to be more interested in playing the aggressor role. So that does make it a little bit awkward. But uh, if you're light on removal or answers to flying creatures, this might do the trick. Then we've got Song of Tottentons. X and a red for a rare sorcery, creating X rat tokens. And creatures we control gain haste until end of turn. Okay, so not quite a burn spell that goes face. But sometimes this could be better if we get to attack with the rat tokens over the course of multiple turns, especially if they got a nice hidden on the first attempt. Then this could be more than just X damage to the opponent. And then we might have other synergies with the rats as well. Um, still requires a lot of mana, so it won't be effective until later in the game. So I land somewhere around C+. Stone Splitter Bolts, X and the Red for an uncommon instant with Bargain, deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker. If it was bargained, it deals twice X damage instead. So if we don't bargain anything, this is pretty ineffective. Definitely worse than the fairy uncommon instant that shrinks a creature down. And uh, yeah, even if we double the damage here, it's not the most effective removal spell out there. So yeah, it seems a bit clunky to me. Probably just a C. Tattered Ranter is next. One and a rat for a 2-2 human peasant at uncommon. Whenever a rat we control becomes blocked, it gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. Alright, so that's one way to disincentivize the opponent from blocking our rats. Uh, although once they get some larger creatures down, they could still potentially block profitably. Or just take out our Tattered Ranter. And then we'll be back to having 1-1 one, one rant tokens. You know, still a solid role player for the rant aggressive uh, decks out there. So mostly red-black, but maybe red-white has a bit of overlap with it as well. I think ends up being closer to a C, since it doesn't actually increase our damage output necessarily. Just helps our rants to uh, keep attacking. So even though it does work well with other rant tokens, it's not the most amazing payoff. So this isn't the type of card I would want to take early and then go into the rant deck. 
this is more of a card you should be looking to pick up relatively late in the pack if you're already established in the rats archetype. Torch the Tower is next, a 1 mana instant at common with bargain. It deals 2 damage to target creature or planeswalker. If it was bargained, it deals 3 damage to that permanent instead. And we also get to scry 1. Either way, if that permanent dealt damage by Torch would die this turn, exile it instead. So a very efficient removal spell. Just doesn't go face, but goes pretty much everywhere else. I guess it also doesn't damage battles, which could be relevant for Constructed. But yeah, Unlimited, this is an excellent removal spell. Um, potentially dealing 3 damage for just 1 mana. Easily C+, might even inch its way into the B range. Yeah, you know what, I think I'm convincing myself that this should get a B, just because of its pure efficiency. Next is Twisted Fealty, 2 and a red for a sorcery at Uncommon, and this is one of the few Act of Treason type effects in the set. So gain control of an opposing creature, untap it, it gains haste, and on top of that we also get to create a Wicked Roll token attached to up to one target creature. Unlikely to want to enchant the creature we just stole, because then they would still have that aura attached, but uh, yeah, definitely a nice upside on kind of a classic act of treason. Now, the one thing I will note, there aren't a ton of ways to sacrifice regular creatures, while bargain sacrifices enchantments, artifacts, and tokens. It doesn't sacrifice just your regular old creatures unless they happen to be artifacts, which there aren't many of in the set. So it's not like you're going to have an easy time sacrificing opposing creatures. Once we get to the enchanting tales uh, enchantments, I think there's at least one in black that can let you sacrifice a creature for one or two mana. So that could be a combo with Twisted Fealty, steal an opposing creature and then sacrifice it before giving it back. So those are the synergies you're looking for. But I actually think Twisted Fealty could be good enough just as kind of a finisher in a very aggressive red-white or red-black deck where you just curve out, apply some pressure. Once the opponent tries to stabilize with a larger blocker, you just steal it and in addition also get to pump up a creature with a wicked roll. So I think this actually will work out totally fine without any sacrifice synergy. So I'll give it a C plus. Next is Two-Headed Hunter, four and a red for a giant at uncommon. Could just be a 5-4 with Menace, but we probably want to use the Adventure. Twice the Rage is 1 and a red for an instant, giving a creature double strike until end of turn. So that can add up incredibly quickly. Just thinking at common and red, we've got a 3 mana 4-2. So imagine the opponent just at some point doesn't block it, then now they're taking 8 damage, and then we'll still be able to play a 5-4 Menace afterwards. So yeah, this card seems pretty exciting to me, and I'll give it a B. Also pairs well in the blue-red spells deck, where we can maybe pump up some of our creatures and then double their power afterwards. Or, well, not quite double their power, but double strike to double their damage output is close enough. And uh, there might be more synergy with the instants or adventures as well. And then we have the Unruly Catapult 2 and a red for an 04 artifact creature construct at common. As Defender, can tap it to deal 1 damage to each opponent. And whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, untap the catapult. We've uh, definitely seen effects like this in the past. I think going all the way back to Return to Ravnica, there was like an 04 that did something similar. Now I will note this is an artifact creature. So one of the few artifact creatures that could be sacrificed to bargain. So this is maybe what you want to steal with your Act of Treason to get it out of the way and then sacrifice it to bargain. Although it's going to be a little bit uh, expensive to set up. But uh, either way, very effective in a blue-red spells deck where you can consistently untap the catapult to keep pinging the opponent. C plus overall. Um, outside of blue-reds, probably not at its best. But in blue-red specifically, I'm very happy to have as many of these as I can get. And Catapult also synergizes with Virtue of Courage. 5 mana Mythic Rare Enchantment, saying whenever a source we control deals non-combat damage to an opponent, we may exile that many cards from the top of our library, and then we may play those cards this turn. So, could be a nice source of card advantage. 
works well with the catapult maybe alongside flick a coin damage the opponent for one so we not only draw make a treasure but also exile the top card so those are the types of synergies we're looking for and there's also a handy adventure we can play first Embreath Blaze, one on a red instant, dealing a two damage to any target. So it's kind of like the Stomp from Bone Crusher Giant, but instead of a 4-3, we get a 5-man enchantment. So, yeah, not going to be amazing in every deck if you don't have any synergies with the enchantment half of it, but just the adventure by itself is almost good enough to run in most red decks. I would land this somewhere in the C plus range at the very least, but some decks may be incredibly happy with that uh, enchantment ability. Witch's Mark is one in red for a sorcery at common. Can discard a card if we do draw two cards, so kind of your thrill of possibility at sorcery speed. And we also get to create a wicked roll token attached to up to one target creature we control. So definitely makes sense why this isn't an instant, otherwise we could pump up our creature at instant speed. Still very nice, just getting that roll token in addition to the discard and draw. Especially good in a blue-red deck, where you'll just want to fill the graveyard with cheap instants and sorceries, and then casually getting plus one plus one is always appreciated. So, Witch's Mark, C+. And then we've got the Witch Stalker Frenzy 3 and the red for an uncommon instant. And it gets a 1 mana discount for each creature that attacked this turn. So you could even play this second main phase and still get a discount. And then it deals 5 damage to target creature. Think of this kind of like a uh, Ember Cleave almost in how it gets a discount. But it also applies to opposing creatures attacking you. So let's say the opponent attacks with 3 creatures. Now you can cast Frenzy for just a single red mana. So this is about as efficient as it gets for removal spells. And uh, yeah, this should easily get a B as a very nice instant. Okay, I think that was our last red card. So time to move on to green. Our first green card, Agatha's Champion, for in the green for an uncommon human knight, a 4-4 with bargain and trample. If it entered the battlefield, if it was bargained, it fights up to one target creature we don't control. Yeah, 4-4 four, four with trample and potentially a fight. Seems like a great deal. This gets a B. And next is Beanstalk Worm, 4 in the green for a 5-4 plant worm and common with reach. And we can also use the adventure plant beans for 1 in the green, which lets us play an additional land this turn. Okay, so this is a pretty effective way of ramping if our deck is playing a high enough land count. So hopefully we've got like 18, maybe 19 lands even, if we want to consistently make use of the plant beans as a ramp effect. And then, yeah, getting a 5-4 reach afterwards is a good way to stabilize. Can cast that on turn 4 already if we manage to ramp successfully. So, very playable card probably don't want it outside of red green and blue green that's where i see this being at its best and uh, blue green specifically so i'll give it a c still not the most versatile card out there and the adventure is not always great and then we're just left with a pretty mediocre but certainly playable creature next is bestial bloodline one and a green for an aura at common, so I think this is the third and final actual aura in uh, the main set. Enchant a creature, giving it plus two plus two, and then for four and a green we can return it from our graveyard to our hand. While it has a bit of recursion, it is incredibly expensive, seven mana to essentially redeploy. So it's still a pretty big commitment to enchant a creature with it. Yeah, I'm not super interested, seems a bit slow. And I don't think the payoff is necessarily there. Quite a few bounce spells in blue we've seen already. On the bright side, if the opponent tries to uh, curse our creature, then it will still get plus 2, plus 2 on top of being a 1-1. One, one. So I guess that's nice, but yeah, still not super interested in the bloodline. Next is the Blossoming Tortoise, which is 2 and double green for a 3-3 three, three turtle at Mythic. And when the tortoise enters the battlefield or attacks, we get to mill three cards and then return any land card from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. 
so pretty likely to ramp us the turn we play it. And then activated abilities of lands we control cost one less to activate. As we'll see in the lands and artifacts section, we've got the return of creature lands, and land creatures we control get plus one plus one. Narrow in scope, there's not that many land creatures or activated abilities of lands. So it's mostly just a four drop that can maybe help us ramp when it enters and or attacks. Which, yeah, is not a bad use for four mana. So seems playable, but I don't think quite gets into the B range. A Bramble Familiar, one and a green for a 2-2 two -two Elemental Raccoon at rare. Taps for green mana. Can also pay one and a green, discard a card to return the Familiar to its owner's hand. And why would we do that? Well, because it has a pretty powerful 7 mana adventure, so if we played this early to help us accelerate our mana, then late game, once we no longer need that extra mana, we can still pick it back up and then cast the adventure, milling 7 cards, and then putting a creature, enchantment, or land card from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. Hopefully we can find some expensive creature with it. We're also limited to how many times we can really realistically use fetch quest so it's not like we can keep playing familiar picking it up and casting the seven mana adventure because we're going to run out of cards in library at some point but even just the two mana two two that taps for green would be quite serviceable so this has a whole lot of upside making it a b brave the wilds single green for a sorcery at common and if we don't bargain it, we can search our library for a basic land, put it into our hand after revealing, so it can help fix our mana there. And then if we do bargain it, we can turn a land we control into a 3-3 elemental creature with haste, and it's still a land. So yeah, the bargain certainly upside. Sometimes you'll be fine just playing this in a base green deck to help you splash a third color, thinking of those teamer adventure decks you might be blue-green splashing red and then having Brave the Wilds can help get your red mana if you need it so that's useful but uh, yeah still not particularly exciting even with bargain. Commune with nature single green sorcery look at the top five cards of your library to reveal a creature card and put it into your hand. Now this does have a fail rate like your deck maybe consists of 17 lanes we've got hopefully 15 plus creatures when including commune with nature, but we still have some other non-creature spells. So there's a pretty realistic chance that commune with nature just reveals creatures and other non-creature spells, and then you're going to be incredibly disappointed. So that's the risk of including this in your deck. Why would you potentially play this? Maybe you're playing a couple blue and or red cards that care about casting instants and sorceries, and this is a cheap way to enable those and maybe your deck has some bomb creature that you absolutely want to find, then those are the use cases where commune with nature might be worth the potential risk. But otherwise I would leave it to the wayside, so I'll give it a D. Curse of the Werefox is 2 and a green for a sorcery at common, creating a monster roll token attached to target creature you control, and when you do, that creature fights up to one creature you don't control. So first we get plus one plus one and trample, that bonus will be permanent, and then we get to take out an opposing creature in the process. Now it is a fight, so not quite as good as one of those bite effects where it just deals damage equal to the creature's power, so we better have something that can win the fight, but plus one plus one goes a long way in helping uh, kind of trade up for potentially a larger creature or take out something without risking our own creature in the process. So Curse of the Werefox gets a B. Next is Elvish Archivist, one on a green for an Elf Artificer at rare. An O1, but it doesn't stay that way for long, because whenever one or more artifacts enter the battlefield under our control, we can put two plus one plus one counters on the Archivist, only triggers once each turn, and whenever one or more enchantments enter the battlefield under our control, we get to draw a card, also only once each turn. So this will be at its best in a black-green food deck where we can reliably make food tokens to give it plus one counters and we might also have some roll tokens to enable the card draw ability. Um, I guess in green-white we're more likely to have enchantments than artifacts but we might still have a bit of overlap with the food synergies. Either way just be on the lookout for artifacts and enchantments and then archivists will take care of the rest. 
so easily a B. Feral Encounter, another kind of removal spell in green, so double green for a rare sorcery. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may exile a creature card from among them, put the rest on the bottom, and then we may cast the exiled card this turn. We do need to have enough mana to both cast Feral Encounter as well as the creature. So early game, not very useful, but at the very least, at the beginning of the next combat phase this turn, target creature we control deals damage equal to its power to up to one target creature we don't control. So this is kind of the bite effect I was referring to earlier. Don't actually fight with our creature, just deal damage equal to its power. And a late game, if we have enough mana, this can not only find a creature, but still act as removal. So pretty flexible, and uh, yeah, I like it. Double green can be a little difficult on the mana sometimes early on, so that's potentially a drawback. And it's not an instant, so it's not quite instant speed removal, but still has a lot going for it. Ferocious Werefox is 3 and a green for a 4-3 Elf Fox Warrior at common. It also tramples. And it has an adventure, a guard change is an instant for one and a green, creating a monster roll token attached to target creature we control, giving it plus one plus one and trample. Yeah, another very flexible adventure creature by itself as a 4-3 trample for four, it's not the end of the world, and the adventure certainly adds a lot of value here. C plus for the werefox. Then there's a graceful takedown, one on a green sorcery at uncommon, any number of target enchanted creatures we control, and up to one other target creature we control, each deal damage equal to their power to target creature we don't control. So this is our third removal spell in green we've seen so far. None of them are instant speed. This one has kind of the fail safe of multiple creatures dealing the damage, so even if our opponent removes one in response we might still be able to take out an opposing creature with it. Not quite as exciting as the common counterpart, I would say, that gives us a plus one plus one roll token. So I'll give this a C plus. Then there's the Gruff Triplets, and oh boy, a six mana, three three Satyr Warrior at rare. It has Trample, and it enters a battlefield alongside two tokens that are copies of it. And then when the Gruff Triplets dies, Put a number of plus one plus one counters equal to its power on each creature we control named Gruff Triplets. So no matter if the real triplets or a token dies, we'll get to give those plus one counters to the other two. And then we'll be left with essentially two six six triplets. And then if one of those dies once again, we'll be left with a 12-12 trampler. Yeah, this card's ridiculous. Six mana does take a little bit of work to get to, but in green that's not a problem. And uh, yeah, answering this with spot removal is not going to be the way to go. So you better have a sweeper or some flying creatures to win the game before this uh, will end the game for you. And adding 9 power and toughness right away is a pretty good way to stabilize the board. So this gets an S. Hamlet Glutton, the preview when discussing Bargain, 7 mana, 6-6 six, six, common giant, with Bargain making it too cheaper, it tramples, and when it enters, it gains 3 life. So this is perfect, a big creature, gaining a life helps you stabilize, so you're not instantly dead, and you've got more time to make use of your large creature, and uh, yeah, if we cast this for 5 mana, it's literally a bargain, so sign me up, C+. Hollow Scavenger to an green for a 3-2 wolf at common, but we can first use the Bakery Raid, 1 mana sorcery, creating a food token, so that's a very nice adventure. Again, we may not have lots going on on turn 1, so making a food token early is perfect for enabling bargain and other food synergies. And once we deploy the Scavenger, we can pay 1 mana, sacrifice a food, and then the Scavenger gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn and can only use that once each turn. But the threat of activation, turning this into a potential 5-4, means the opponent's unlikely to block it early on, and then you can just keep getting in for 3, and keep your food token for later. So this card's awesome, and uh, great in the food decks. Red-green, also very happy to have this. There's not many decks where this wouldn't be a great fit. Howling Galefang. 2 and double green for a 4-4 beast at uncommon. It has vigilance, already pretty decent, 
And it also has haste as long as you own a card in exile that has an adventure. So at its best in blue, green, and red green, where you'll have the highest density of adventure cards. And then a 4-4 with vigilance and haste seems absolutely amazing. So this card gets a B. The Huntsman's Redemption is a two and a green for a rare saga. First, we get to make a 3-3 green beast creature token. Next, we may sacrifice a creature. If we do, search our library for any creature or basic land card, reveal it and put it into our hand. And finally, up to two target creatures each get plus two plus two and gain trample until end of turn. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. Ideally, we have something cheap for one or two mana that we played early in the game, so we can sacrifice it to the second chapter to then search up whatever bomb we need. And by sacrificing something cheap, we're also more likely to play a 4-drop on curve, so we can curve 3-3 three, three into 4-drop and then pump up both of your creatures. So if you can curve out perfectly and get the full use out of the second chapter, this card seems bomb-worthy. Um, somewhere between a B and an A. I'll go ahead and give this an A. I think it has enough going for it if we account for all three chapters that I'm willing to go there. And then there's a Leaping Ambush, single green instant at common. Target creature gets plus one plus three and reach until end of turn, and we also get to untap it. I've seen a couple of these effects in the past. I've seen plus two plus two untap and reach recently. This plus one plus three, not a huge difference. So all these effects are quite playable. You can potentially set up a surprise blocker if the opponent's not careful playing around your untapped green mana. So we'll give this a C. Don't want a lot of these in your decks, but as a one-off it can certainly come in handy. Knight of the Sweets Revenge is three and a green for an uncommon enchantment. And when it enters the battlefield, create a food token, and all foods you control can tap to add a green mana. So the food token we generated can immediately tap for green mana, and any other food tokens we have, or even some non-token foods, there's a few in the set. And then at some point we can pay 7 mana, potentially tapping those foods in the process, sacrifice Knight of the Sweet's Revenge, and then creatures we control get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of foods we control, only as a sorcery. So the fact that our foods are potentially tapped to pay for the 7 mana ability doesn't matter, unless I guess we have a food creature that would want to attack. But yeah, an awesome way to close out the game, especially in your black-green food decks, and a way to ramp into your other expensive spells as well. So this has a lot of cool applications, and at the very least a C+. Doesn't fit into every green deck necessarily, but uh, yeah, hopefully will be a nice finisher for your food deck. Red Tooth Genealogist is a 2 and a green 2-3 elf advisor at common. When it enters, create a royal roll token attached to another target creature you control. So it cannot enchant itself, would make it a little bit too strong. But uh, yeah, giving another creature plus one plus one and ward one seems quite powerful, especially if you can put this on your one or two drop and curve out, and then later can maybe sacrifice the aura to a bargain effect. So powerful card. Um, if it could enchant itself, it would have, of course be miles better, but uh, even the way it's printed, at the very least a C, kind of verging on C+. Plus. Um, yeah, I'll stick to a C for Genealogist, but uh, wouldn't be surprised if this one overperforms. Next is a Red Tooth Vanguard, one and a green for a 3 1 Elf Warrior with Trample at Uncommon. And whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under our control, we can pay 2 mana. If we do, return a Red Tooth from our graveyard to our hand. So a recursive threat. Uh, it's essentially 4 mana to redeploy if it died. But it is a 3 1 Trampler, so it's the type of card that is pretty happy to keep attacking, can back it up with pump spells, and still potentially connect with the opponent. So, fine card. C+, plus. also pretty good at setting up double blocks, and then we can still get it back later. 
Return from the Wild to an green sorcery at common. Can choose two between searching our library for a basic land, putting it on the battlefield tapped, creating a 1 1 human token, or creating a food token. So, probably want to ramp and then our choices between a 1 1 human or a food token. Either way, a nice way to ramp in our blue green, maybe green red decks as well, while potentially fixing our colors can also come in handy. And then uh, maybe if you're black or green, the food token will be quite valuable. So I'll go with uh, C+, pretty flexible sorcery. Root Rider Fawn, one and a green for a 1-3 Satyr Scout at common. Can tap to add green mana, and can also pay one, tap it, and add one mana of any color. So it can potentially fix our colors as well, although then it won't necessarily uh, be ramping the same way as if we just make green mana with it. So, nice 2-drop, especially for those uh, kind of rampy decks that want to hopefully get a big threat in play as soon as possible, which blue-green and red-green certainly fit that description, but any green deck realistically is going to be happy with extra mana. So, at the very least, a C-plus for the fawn. Next is Royal Treatment. One mana uncommon instant, a creature we control gains hexproof until end of turn, and we create a royal roll token attached to that creature as well. So future removal spells will have to pay one extra mana to target our enchanted creature. Pretty solid trick, especially in green where you might have some large creature that the opponent's happy to remove, then now you get to protect it for one mana. So that can be a nice tempo play, and uh, we'll give it a C+. Next we've got Sentinel of Lost Lore, 1 and double green for a rare 3-4 elf knight. And when it enters the battlefield, we get to choose one or more. So we can potentially choose all three modes if we want to. And return target card we own in exile that has an adventure to our hand. Could be useful if we want to redeploy the adventure half of the card. Can also put target card we don't own in exile that has an adventure on the bottom of its owner's library. So if the opponent used an adventure earlier, we can now prevent them from casting the creature and put it back in their library instead. So that's pretty mean. And finally, exile target player's graveyard can also come in handy, especially when facing black decks that might have ways to recur some of their creatures. So overall, not a bad package for three mana, three, four, already decent enough stats and has a lot of potential upside, so at least gets a B. Then there's the Sky Beast Tracker, 3 and a green for a 2-4 Giant Archer at common, has reach, and whenever we cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater, we get to make a food token. Okay, so there's quite a bit to like about the tracker, and uh, I'll give this a C plus as well. Will be excellent for black-green food decks or blue-green ramp decks especially. Spider food is two and a green for a sorcery at common, can destroy up to one target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying, and we get to create a food token. I don't mind main decking one of these in most of my green decks, especially if I'm a light on reach creatures. So, gets a C, but not every deck is gonna need one. Stormkeld Vanguard is six mana for a six seven giant warrior at uncommon. Also as an adventure, bear down one and a green sorcery, destroying target artifact or enchantment. And then the 6-drop is a 6-7 that cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. Pretty useful ability on a large creature that doesn't inherently have trample. Of course a good recipient of a potential monster aura. There's a lot to like about it, I'll give it a B. Then we've got the Tangle Span Lookout, to an green for a 2-3 Satyr at Uncommon, saying whenever an aura enters a battlefield under our control, we get to draw a card. You've got my attention. So plenty of aura roll tokens to go around, probably at its best in green-white, but there's plenty of other roll tokens across every color. So just gonna be on the lookout for those when playing with a lookout. At the very least, C+, plus, but uh, in the right deck this could feel more like a B if it can keep drawing cards turn after turn, but uh, we'll stay with a conservative C+, plus for now. Then there's the Territorial Witch Stalker, one and a green for a 2-3 wolf at common, has defender, 
put at the beginning of combat on our turn. If we control a creature with power 4 or greater, it gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn and can attack as though it didn't have defender. So it can attack as a 3-3. Three, three. Pretty decent, a good early defensive creature. Can help out against those aggressive red-white or black-red decks. And then later in the game can still potentially turn sideways to start attacking. So playable 2-drop if you need a 2-drop. That's about it. Then there's a Thunderous debut, 8 mana, Sorcery at Rare, has Bargain. Get to look at the top 20 cards of our library, revealing up to 2 creature cards from among them. If it was bargained, we can reveal those cards and put them on the battlefield, otherwise just put them into our hand. Okay, so kind of like your Tooth and Nail, 8 mana is a little bit pricey, but by the time we get to 8 mana we probably have something we can bargain. And then uh, hopefully we can hit our two most expensive creatures in the top 20. C+, plus if we can ramp into this, especially in like a blue-green ramp deck with a lot of expensive adventure creatures that still offer the flexibility of their adventure, but if we happen to hit them with debut, then uh, it's nice to get them in play and get the creature side in play right away as well. Then Titanic Growth, another one of the few reprints in this set. One on a green for an instant at common, giving a creature plus four, plus four until end of turn. So, very flexible, good on offense and defense, can help close out games. So there's a lot to like about this. So as far as two mana comma tricks go, this is kind of the gold standard, but still gonna just give it a C. Then there's a Toad's Tool Admirer, single green for a 1-1 one, one. at common, has a ward, two, can pay four mana to give it a plus one plus one counter. It is a mana sink. We will see in the Enchanting Tales there is hardened scales to maybe synergize with it, but for the most part I would leave this out of my decks. So we'll give it a D. And then there's Tough Cookie, one on a green for an artifact creature, Food Golem. So this is one of those few uh, foods that aren't necessarily food tokens. And uh, this uncommon 2-2, two, two, when it enters the battlefield, creates a food token. So we get two foods for just two mana. That's a bargain. And then for two and a green, target's non-creature artifact we control becomes a 4-4 four, four artifact creature until end of turn. So it can turn food tokens or maybe even treasures into 4-4s. Four, and the cookie itself, much like food tokens, can pay two mana, tap itself, sacrifice to gain three life. But hopefully we can keep it around to turn artifacts into 4-4s four as much as possible. So yeah, another very nice 2-drop, and even later in the game still has great utility. So there's a lot to like about the tough cookie, and uh, yeah, I'm even willing to go up to a B for it. Then there's a troublemaker, one on a green for a 2-2, two, two. at common has bargain, and when it enters the battlefield, if it was bargained, exile target artifact or enchantment an opponent controls. So potentially a main deckable disenchant effect to deal with some of those bomb level enchantments we've seen across multiple colors. Not the most exciting to drop admittedly, if we're sacrificing something to bargain, still only left with a 2-2 two, two creature afterwards. So hopefully we've got better main deckable disenchants, but if you're low on two drops this will do in a pinch. I'll give it a C. Up the Beanstalk is pretty exciting, one on a green enchantment at uncommon, and when it enters a battlefield, and whenever we cast a spell with mana value 5 or greater, we get to draw a card. So even if we just play this for 2 mana, and then at some point sacrifice it to bargain, feels pretty decent, and uh, hopefully we can just keep it around and draw multiple cards in our ramp decks. So at the very least C+, but I'm gonna be optimistic and give Up the Beanstalk a B. Verdant Outrider is 2 and a green for a human knight at common, a 4-2, and for 1 and a green it cannot be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less this turn. So it has a bit of an evasive ability. Not as exciting as the red adventure 3-drop, that's a 4-2 I think. The adventure seems a little bit better here, but it is still a cheap way to enable those kind of ferocious synergies that uh, we haven't seen a ton of payoffs for, so it's not the biggest sub-theme in the set. Uh, Red Green is just happy casting quality creatures and maybe ramping them out ahead of schedule. And this could be another potential enabler for some of those synergies. So fine playable, but nothing particularly exciting. Then we get Virtue of Strength, part of the Mythic Rare Enchantment cycle. 
this seven mana saying if we tap a basic land for mana it produces three times as much of that mana instead okay so it rem reminds us of a uh, nix bloom ancient which uh, you know in limited once we get to seven mana do we really need 21 mana probably not but i guess it's nice to have and the excuse for playing Virtue of Strength is that it also has an adventure. Garen Break Growth is a single green sorcery, returning a target creature or land card from our graveyard to our hand. So I think I'm still okay including this in most of my green decks, just because the adventure at least is still somewhat useful. And on occasion, if we cast the enchantment and happen to have a mana sink, it can uh, win us the game. So I'll go C plus on Virtue of Strength. Definitely not as exciting as the black or white enchantment. And then there's a welcome to Sweet Tooth, one on a green saga at Uncommon. First we make a 1-1 human token, then we make a food token, and finally put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on a target creature we control, where X is 1 plus the number of foods we control. So if we still have that food token from the second chapter, hopefully we do, then uh, that's at least 2 plus 1 counters. So once again, we're getting a ton of value for just two mana, and I'm loving these cheap sagas, so this one also gets a B. And yeah, that's our final green card. So time to move on to artifacts and lands. First up is Agatha's Soul Cauldron, two mana legendary artifact. It's mythic, saying we can spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate abilities of creatures we control. Haven't seen a ton of activated abilities throughout the set, Creatures we control with plus one plus one counters on them have all activated abilities of all creature cards exiled with the cauldron. We haven't seen a ton of plus one counters, but there's a couple, mostly because plus one counters have been somewhat replaced by those aura roll tokens. But uh, we can of course enable cauldron itself by tapping it, and then we get to exile target card from a graveyard. When a creature card's exiled this way, put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. So that's how we can generate those plus one counters. And the more creatures with abilities we exile, the more we can kind of spread around with the cauldron. Not exactly sure how to rate it. It does require a bit of setup if we don't have a full graveyard to uh, keep exiling creatures from, then this doesn't really do much. Um, but if we can get let's say three or four uses out of this for only a two mana investment that's a good deal as we get a bunch of plus one counters and potentially some abilities as well so i'll be kind of uh, optimistic about this and go c plus on soul cauldron next is candy trail a one mana artifact that also has the food subtype as well as the clue subtype and it's a, a common when it enters the battlefield we scry two can pay two mana, tap and sacrifice to gain three and to draw a card. Okay, so played early and then can potentially enable some uh, food synergies if we just need a random food to potentially sacrifice to one of our abilities. As an artifact, we can sacrifice it to bargain. So that's potentially a use for it. So it's kind of like a three mana investment to cycle it and gain three. And uh, maybe it enabled some synergies in the meantime so not an exciting card um, but if you're light on bargain enablers this might do the trick and maybe in a food heavy deck you just want as many food sources as you can get your hands on still not a high priority card i would give it a d but uh, i could see myself playing it in some narrow scenarios collector's vault is a two mana artifact that uncommon can pay two mana tap to draw a card and then discard a card, creating a treasure token in the process. So a bit of card selection while making treasures, so almost like it only costs us one mana to activate, but we can also store up all those treasure tokens to ramp out something more expensive, and we can play this in any deck. So this would pair very nicely alongside a food fight, uh, if you can keep making treasure tokens turn after turn to then sacrifice to deal two damage. So maybe this is how Food Fight becomes worth it. Give this probably a C, but uh, being colorless means we can play it in any deck. So has a lot of various use cases throughout. Next is the Tempting Apple, 4 mana uncommon legendary artifact. 
It's also food, so it can be sacrificed to potential food synergies. And when it enters the battlefield, we essentially act of treason, gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap it, it gains haste until end of turn. Again, not too many ways to sacrifice opposing creatures in this set, but we can uh, sacrifice the apple itself for two mana to either gain three or make the opponent lose three life. So again, in an aggressive deck, if we just use the act of treason without sacrificing the creature afterwards, we can still get a nice hit of damage in, and then the apple itself is potentially three more, essentially burn to help close out the game. So this may not need that sacrifice synergy to be worth including in some of your aggressive strategies. So I think I'm uh, giving this one a C as well. There are potentially some enchantments in the enchanting tales section that can help us sacrifice the creature afterwards. So those are more synergies to be on the lookout for. And Ginger Brute is back as well. Of course, a very fitting reprint. One mana, one one artifact creature, food golem at common, has haste. For one mana, cannot be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste, and can be sacrificed like any other food to gain three life. I think Ginger Brute actually got better in this set. Thanks to all those aura roll tokens, there's even more ways to enhance the Ginger Brute and turn it into a 2 2 evasive attacker, and then later can still be sacrificed as a food creature. That's an artifact. It can also be sacrificed to bargain, unlike some other uh, cheap creatures in the set. So it has a lot going for it, and I'll end up giving this a C plus at its best, and of course the more aggressive decks or black green food decks as well. Then we have Hilda's Crown of Winter, and this is the card you absolutely want to pair with Hilda herself if you're lucky enough to get both. A three mana rare legendary artifact can pay one mana, tap the crown to tap target creature, and this costs one less to activate during your own turn. So only one mana during the opponent's turn, and can activate it for free during your own turn. So you can easily set up those sequences where you tap down the opponent's largest attacker, take your turn, and then tap down their second largest uh, creature to set up your own attack. And that can be very effective. And then, as if that weren't enough, we can also pay three mana, sacrifice a crown, draw a card for each tapped creature your opponent's control. So it can also turn into a nice source of card advantage, although I don't imagine too many scenarios where you would want to sacrifice it unless you happen to draw multiples, since it is legendary. So this is an awesome enabler for the blue-white deck that wants to tap stuff down, but honestly every deck is going to be very happy to include this, and being a colorless card means it slots into any deck. So this gets an A, bomb level card, don't sleep on it. And the Iron Crag, one of my favorite cards in the set because it's very versatile, especially in Historic Brawl as another two mana, a ramp artifact. And in a singleton format, it doesn't matter that it's legendary. So two mana, a rare artifact, taps for a colorless mana. And whenever a legendary creature enters a battlefield under our control, we may have the Iron Crag become a legendary equipment artifact named Everflame Heroes Legacy. If we do, it gains the equip for 3 ability, and equipped creature gets plus 3 plus 3, and then the uh, Iron Crag loses all other abilities as well. So a very nice equipment. Uh, don't misread this thinking the creature loses the abilities, it's the equipment itself that loses the abilities. So just plus three plus three for three mana, once you no longer need the extra colorless from Iron Crag. So yeah, awesome card, and it's been a long time since we've seen a two mana ramp artifact in standard as well, so we'll have uh, lots of constructed applications, not only in Brawl and in Limited. This card's awesome too, helping you ramp, and then later still being a nice way to power up some of your creatures. So overall, give this a B. Then we've got Prophetic Prism, one of the ways we can potentially fix our colors. A two mana artifact that draws a card when it enters, and then we can filter our mana through it. Also great to sacrifice to our various bargain cards. So Prophetic Prism has a lot of different roles to play, making it a pretty sought after common, so easily C plus territory. And then the Scarecrow Guide, not quite as exciting as a Prophetic Prism, a two mana, two one, Artifact creature at common with reach 
that can pay one mana to make one mana of any color, so it can filter our mana once each turn. Not very exciting, gets a D. And then Soul Guide Lantern, another reprint. Graveyard Hate, that's not all that uh, important for limited, more of a constructed plant, I'm sure, but could sacrifice it to bargain in a pinch. The problem is it only draws a card if you sacrifice the lantern itself, not when it enters, so it's not the best uh, enabler for those bargain synergies. So this one gets a D as well. And then a Sir Ginger, the Meal Ender, a 2-mana 3-1, a legendary artifact creature, Food Knight at rare. And Sir Ginger has Trample, Hexproof, and Haste, as long as an opponent controls a Planeswalker. There's only one Planeswalker in the entire set, so unlikely to come up. And whenever another artifact we control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus up a swank counter on Sir Ginger and scry one. So perfect alongside our various bargain cards and other food tokens we might end up sacrificing. And then we can also pay two mana, tap Sir Ginger, sacrifice it, and gain life equal to its power. So if we didn't put any plus one counters on it, it's going to be three life most likely, but could be even more in the late game. So it's an even better food token. I'm sure it will be delicious. Either way, uh, as far as rating goes, probably start at a C plus at the very least, but in the more dedicated food decks where you can consistently put counters on it, it might go up in value slightly. And then three bowls of porridge is a two mana uncommon artifact, also food, and can pay two mana, tap it, and choose one of the three modes that hasn't been chosen. Probably first want to either tap down a creature or deal two damage to target creature, and finally gain three life. Although we can also just keep it in play to maybe sacrifice to some other food synergies. So pretty flavorful card, but uh, as far as a two mana colorless artifact goes, it's quite flexible. You can also enable your blue-white synergies where you want to tap opposing creatures down, and then two damage could be enough to kill some pesky flyer, for instance. So overall. I think uh, C plus for the three bowls. And then we get to the lands, starting with Crystal Grotto, another reprint, common land. Get to scry one when it enters battlefield, but in order to fix our colors we need to pay one mana and tap it. So yeah, it's not the best mana fixer around necessarily, so I'm not all that excited. Give this a D. We've got the edge wall in, this is better mana fixing, enters the battlefield tapped, after choosing a color, and then it can make one mana of the chosen color, and has the extra utility of potentially sacrificing it late game to return a card with an adventure from our graveyard to our hand. So perfect for the multicolor adventure decks out there, and we'll give the edge wall in a C+. Then Evolving Wilds is back as well, so I'm happy to run multiple copies of Evolving Wilds even in a two-color deck for mana fixing. Uh, I think two copies is probably a good place to be. Uh, even in a two-color deck, just to smooth out your colors a little bit, because uh, there's no worse feeling than being stuck on a single color when uh, you're unable to cast your spells. So yeah, limited mana bases tend to be pretty weak in general, so any way to improve them is a welcome sight, and Evolving Wilds fits that description nicely. But of course, in any three-plus color deck, Evolving Wilds will be at a premium, so C-plus at least. And then we get to the creature lands. A restless bivouac is the first one. A red-white land that enters battlefield tapped. Makes, uh, of course, red and white mana. And then for one, a red and a white. The bivouac becomes a 2-2 creature. Until end of turn, it's still a land. And when it attacks, we can put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature we control. Could be on the bivouac itself, but could also be elsewhere. So it's a very flexible creature land. Awesome for both limited and constructed alike, and I'll give all the creature lands a B. The Cottage turns into a 4-4 black and green horror creature until end of turn, it's still a land, and when it attacks it can create a food token and exile up to one target card from a graveyard. 4 mana to activate this one, it's a bit more expensive, but we get more uh, power and toughness and some more useful abilities as well. Then there's the Restless Fortress, 4 mana to activate, in black-white, makes a 1-4 black and white nightmare creature on ton of turn, still a land, and when it attacks, defending player loses 2 life and we gain 2 life, so it can still damage the opponent even if they can block the 1-4 successfully. 
and then a Restless Spire. Yeah, I don't think we've seen any quite this cheap to activate as far as uh, multicolor creature lands are concerned. So a blue and a red to turn it into a 2-1 blue and red elemental creature. And as long as it's our turn, that creature has first strike. And when it attacks, we also get to scry one. So yeah, this one's incredibly cheap to activate. So I love all the creature lands, Spire included, and expect them to see heavy constructed play as well. The Restless Vinestalk is blue-green, and for 5 mana turns into a 5-5 green and blue plant creature with trample, still a land, and when it attacks, up to one other target creature has base power and toughness 3-3 until end of turn. It's also quite versatile, can shrink down an opposing large creature, but can also pump up a smaller creature we have into a 3-3. So both modes are very useful indeed. We're technically done with the main set, but much like the Mystical Archives and Strixhaven, and the Multiverse Legends in March of the Machine. We've got a bonus sheet, and these are cards that will appear in every booster pack, at least one of them. And uh, the rarities range from uncommon all the way to mythic, so no common enchanting tales as they're known. And uh, yeah, there's a few stinkers in there for sure. They're not all premium cards like uh, maybe in some of the other expansions, but uh, yeah, there's definitely some exciting ones among them. So we'll start with the White Enchanting Tales. Blind Obedience, two mana rare enchantment with Extort, so we can pay black and or white mana whenever we cast a spell to make the opponent lose one life and we gain that much life. And artifacts and creatures our opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. So pretty useful little enchantments. If we ever have any extra mana, we can turn it into extra life gain and drain. So we'll give this a C+. Dawn of Hope, another recent uh, reprint. Two mana enchantment at rare. Says whenever we gain life, we may pay two. If we do, draw a card. And for four mana, we can make a 1-1 one, one life-linking token. Bit of an expensive enchantment to get going. But once we get to the later stages in the game, this can certainly take over by making repeated 1-1 one, one tokens that can draw extra cards as well. The life gain is not the biggest theme that's like supported in this set, so that's keeping me from giving it a very high grade, but at least still a C. Grasp of Fate, a solid 3 mana removal spell. It's an enchantment that when it enters, for each opponent we can exile up to one target non land permanent that player controls until Grasp leaves the battlefield. So, kind of an unconditional removal spell. The only kind of drawback is that it's double white to cast, so it's not always easy to have double white as early as turn 3. And it's also kind of a sorcery speed spell. People might have some disenchants in the main deck, so not quite as unconditional as some of the 4 mana black removal spells we've seen in the main set, but at the very least a C+. Then there's a Greater Oromancy, a 2 mana Mythic Rare enchantment, and Enchanted creatures we control also have Shroud, which means that unlike Hexproof, we also can't target our own creatures, but uh, yeah, still not super high on the Oromancy. Um, I don't think there's enough incentive to be running this, so I'll give it a D. Then we've got Griffin Airy, one and a white for an uncommon enchantment. At the beginning of our end step, if we gained three or more life, we get to make a 2-2 Griffin token with flying. Again, life gain is not a heavily supported theme, so outside of sacrificing food tokens, it's going to be difficult to enable Griffin Airy, and uh, food tokens is more of a black-green thing, so it's kind of difficult to always stretch your mana to include white as well, and uh, yeah, it just takes quite a bit of setup to get those first uh, Griffin tokens even though they can be quite powerful once we get a few of them. So I'm not super high on Griffin Airy, give it a D. Intangible Virtue, similar to some of my previous comments about there not being a lot of actual tokens in the set. Can I give them plus one plus one and Vigilance, but if you don't have a lot of actual tokens in the first place, it doesn't do much good. And most of the tokens are rat tokens in black, and black-white tokens is not really a heavily supported theme. So this one also gets a D. Karmic Justice, a 3 mana rare enchantment, says whenever a spell or ability an opponent controls destroys a non-creature permanent we control, we may destroy a target permanent that opponent controls. So we get to take a bit of revenge here, 
but uh, yeah, there's just not that many ways our opponent would enable karmic justice in the first place. It doesn't trigger off creatures being destroyed, so I think this one even goes as low as an F. Knightly Valor is actually a playable card in the set. Five mana enchantment at uncommon and aura. And uh, yeah, once again, one of the few actual auras in the set. Enchants a creature, giving it plus two, plus two and vigilance. And when it enters, we also get to make a 2-2 two, two vigilant knight token. So for five mana, we get to enable celebration by making two non-land permanent. And uh, yeah, also pretty solid as far as our various bargain synergies and other token sacrifice synergies are concerned. So this one seems pretty decent. Um, I'll go with C+, plus Knightly Valor. At least it also leaves behind an extra creature token, so it doesn't feel as bad if the opponent ends up removing the creature we enchant. Then a land tax is a very interesting one. So one mana Mythic Rare Enchantment saying at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards, reveal them and put them into your hand. So you're never gonna miss a land drop ever again. Uh, sometimes you'll make weird plays to enable land tax, such as missing your land drop for the turn. This of course much better if you're on the draw compared to if you're on the play. There's not that many kind of payoffs for discarding cards from your hand, which could maybe synergize with a land tax, but uh, I'll still go with C+, at least. Seems like a pretty nice card, especially if you're trying to play multiple colors and searching up lands can fix your mana. Then there's a Leyline of Sanctity, strictly kind of a sideboard or a weird main deck card for some combo decks in Constructed, but absolutely should not be in your limited decks. And then a Phyrexian Unlife is another very strange one. It says, for a three mana, a rare enchantment, we don't lose the game for having a zero or less life. And as long as we have a zero or less life, all damage is dealt to us as though its source had infect. So if a three powered creature would hit us, if we're at zero or less life, then we take three poison. So definitely adds up pretty quickly. So Phyrexian Unlife is almost like you would gain like 10 extra life. Um, sometimes a little bit more, depending on when the opponent deals that initial lethal damage. So yeah, it kind of works out like a, a weird life gain effect without actually enabling your life gain synergies. So I don't think I'm uh, particularly interested in running Fraxion on life. I'll give it a D, maybe some control decks just want the extra 10 life to work with. And then they can uh, take over with all their card advantage, who knows. Then we've got Rest in Peace also making a return here. Another sideboard card for Constructed, not a card we want in Limited. Maybe there's some weird circumstances where the opponent's heavily relying on the graveyard and you'll board this in if you happen to have it, but not a card you should prioritize taking. Smothering Tithe, known to be very powerful in multiplayer games. In one-on-one, -on -one, it still does something. Occasionally it'll make a treasure token, not a card I'm particularly excited to run. Uh, if the format ends up being incredibly slow, maybe it gets more than a D and inches closer towards a C, but I would probably start this out of the main deck and in the sideboard. But uh, yeah, could be an interesting way to ramp if that's what you're looking for. Then we get to the blue enchantments where we have as foretold to an a blue for an enchantment at rare. And this does some interesting things that we probably aren't interested in, so I'll just give it a D and move on. Next is Compulsion, one on a blue for an uncommon enchantment, can pay one on a blue, discard a card to draw a card, or one on a blue, sacrifice Compulsion to draw a card. Unfortunately, it doesn't draw a card when it enters the battlefield, otherwise it would actually be a good bargain enabler. And as far as looting effects are concerned, we've got a better one at uh, uncommon as an artifact that also makes a treasure token. So this one feels pretty weak to me. I'll give it a D. Copy enchantment for Tuna Blue, a rare enchantment. Enters a battlefield as a copy of any enchantment on the battlefield. But uh, a lot of the enchantments will just be aura curses. There's a couple mythic rare enchantments I wouldn't mind copying. But uh, yeah, overall, not a huge fan of copy enchantments. This one also gets a D. 
Curiosity can be an interesting one when paired with cheap flying creatures. So it will be at its best in like a blue-black fairy deck or maybe blue-red with a few cheap blue flyers enchanting a creature. And then when it deals combat damage to an opponent, we may draw a card. I should rephrase, it's not simply combat damage, it's just any damage. So there are potentially a few combos with Curiosity that I didn't think of right off the bat. Like the uh, there's a blue-red um, adventure creature that deals one damage to the opponent whenever they cast a spell with mana value three or less, I believe. So if you put a Curiosity on that creature, it will also draw a card whenever it damages the opponent. So that's potentially a combo. And then it also works with a Catapult, which can deal one damage to the opponent potentially multiple times in the same turn. So yeah, blue-red seems to be the best home for Curiosity, and then maybe blue-black, where we've got some cheap flying creatures. And uh, overall, we'll give this a C+. Then there's Forced Fruition, 6 mana for a rare enchantment, saying whenever an opponent casts a spell, that player draws 7 cards. So this one is uh, incredibly interesting. So it only affects the opponent. So we're letting the opponent draw 7 cards. Seems like that would be a bad thing. But as it turns out, we only have 40 cards in most limited decks. And uh, yeah, after drawing 7 two or three times, you may not be able to draw seven or you end up decking. So this essentially puts the opponent to the test. Can they close out the game without casting more than three spells? Of course, they get to see most of their deck doing so. So if they have a disenchant, they can take out your forced fruition and then have pretty much their entire deck in hand or at least the best cards after discarding to hand size. And then it's going to be pretty difficult to win from there. If they don't have a disenchant and they don't have enough pressure in play, then this can be your win condition. So it's a, a very strange card to play with and against, and will lead to some pretty interesting stories, I'm sure. As far as overall rating is concerned, it is a bit of an all-in strategy. If it works out, it wins you the game. If it doesn't work out, you just let the opponent draw a million cards. So that's uh, not going to be all that great for you. But uh, I'll go with C+. Plus especially if you can back it up with a few counter spells. I think this could be a solid win condition. Then there's Fraying Sanity, two and a blue enchantment aura curse at rare. Now, as I mentioned, Mill is not really a heavily th supported theme in the set. Fraying Sanity is one way you could potentially mill the opponent out, but most of the mill effects end up milling yourself instead of the opponent. So there's just not that many reliable ways of uh, winning the game by milling. Uh, that being said, Fring Sanity could also trigger without specifically milling the opponent, just by cards ending up in their graveyard. That being said, I'm still uh, not very interested. There might be like one in a million decks that ends up being the perfect mill strategy somehow, but uh, I wouldn't count on it. Next is Hatching Plans, one in a blue enchantment at Uncommon. And when Hatching Plans is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, draw three cards. So this is the ultimate bargain enabler, played for two mana, kind of forget about it for a while, and then as soon as you can cast a bargain card, you get to draw three. So this seems pretty sweet, as long as you've got enough bargain cards to go with it, of course. So I'll go C+. Intruder Alarm is a strange one to win a blue enchantment at rare. Creatures don't untap during their controller's untap steps, but whenever a creature enters, untap all creatures. So this is known as kind of a combo enabler in some elf decks where you can tap elves for mana, keep playing more of them and drawing more cards. We're not playing Constructed here in Limited. I don't think this is particularly playable. Give this an F. Kindred Discovery is an interesting one here. Five mana Mythic Rare Enchantment. As it enters, choose a creature type, and whenever a creature we control of the chosen type enters a battlefield or attacks, we get to draw a card. The creature type that jumps to mind, of course, is fairies. Blue-black fairies is probably going to be quite happy with a kindred discovery, as they tend to have lots of cheap evasive creatures that can uh, keep attacking unopposed to draw you more cards. So that's the best home for it. There might be some other creature type worth naming, but haven't gone through the entire list yet to see all the different creature types that come up. But uh, even in just a blue-black fairy deck, uh, that's maybe enough to give this a C plus rating overall. Then there's a Leyline of Anticipation, another card I'm not particularly interested in. Unlike Leyline of Sanctity, 
It could actually be somewhat useful in a game of limited, letting you play stuff at instant speed, especially if it starts on the battlefield, but I still probably wouldn't put it in most of my decks, so it gets a D. Omniscience, another fun constructed card that doesn't really have any meaningful interactions in limited, so it gets an F. Then there's Heuristic Study, another all-star in multiplayer games, two in a blue enchantment at Mythic, saying whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays a one mana. In Limited, this is still somewhat interesting, uh, forcing the opponent to essentially pay one extra mana for all of their spells. Um, if you're facing a very aggressive deck, then they could just ignore it and still kill you anyway. If you're playing against a ramp deck, they can probably afford to pay the one extra mana. So there are certainly situations where it's not going to be great, but assuming both decks are kind of mid-rangey in nature, which is most limited decks, the extra one mana is going to add up over time. So yeah, I'll give Rhystic Study C+. I'm curious to see how this one plays out. Then there's Spreading Seas, one on a blue enchantment aura at Uncommon, and this can be incredibly rude if you're uh, capable of mana screwing the opponent with it. So this enchants a land, turning it into an island, and when it enters the battlefield, draw a card. So if you enchant the opponent's planes, it no longer makes white mana, it now only makes blue mana. So if you can uh, correctly guess the opponent's land that they only have one of, that could potentially seriously mess up their plans. And uh, of course, at its best when facing opponents that aren't playing blue, but even against, let's say, a blue-black deck, Enchanter Swamp. Now they may, may not have black or double black to cast some of their spells. And we also got to draw a card in the meantime. Can always sacrifice Spreading Seas to bargain as well. So even if it's not successfully mana screwing the opponent, it can still help your own plans as well. So there's a lot to like about Spreading Seas. Mostly if you're the one casting it, C+. Then we get to black and we start with a bang. Bitter Blossom, one on a black, tribal enchantment, fairy at mythic. I believe this is the second tribal card that will be added to arena after the uh, Lurgoif artifact. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life and create a 1-1 one, one black fairy rogue creature token with flying. So especially if you can play this early in the game, this will generate an army of fairies that will essentially win the game by itself unless the opponent happens to have that uh, black-white uncommon giving your team minus one, minus one, that would hurt. But yeah, the life loss does add up, but the 1-1 one, one flyers more than make up for it, since they can usually get more than one damage across. And then there's a few payoffs that can maybe pump your team, especially in black-red. Going wide with a bunch of tokens has a lot of synergy. And then, of course, blue-black fairies, also very happy to have plenty of fairies, since the enchantment itself counts as one. So, yeah, this is an absolute bomb. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, verging on an S, but there are still scenarios where you top deck this late and then it doesn't really do anything anymore, but at the very least an A. Next up, we have Dark Tutelage, two in a black for an uncommon enchantment, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. You lose life equal to its mana value. So this is doing a good dark confident impression. It is three mana compared to the two mana two one. And uh, yeah, an enchantment is not that easy to interact with. So it's not like you can easily uh, destroy it unless you have a bargain card, I guess. So yeah, I, I guess I take it back. If you have a lot of bargain cards in the deck, this can be an interesting source of uh, card advantage. And then once you start getting too low on life, you could always sacrifice it to one of your bargain effects. Um, that being said, most limited decks tend to have kind of an average mana value around 3, and uh, even counting for lands, this is still going to end up losing you like 1.5 to 2 life per turn, um, which does quickly add up. So I'm not sure if it's necessarily worth the extra card advantage, but whenever you reveal a land to it, that's pretty nice. I think I'm um, starting with just a C for Tutelage, might end up closer to a D in the end. Uh, there might just be more efficient, less painful card draw engines out there, uh, but it might be worth a shot. Then there's a Grave Pact, one and triple black for a mythic rare enchantment. Says whenever a creature you control dies, each other player sacrifices a creature. 
So this can be incredibly effective in some strategies, can also sacrifice your own creatures potentially uh, to various bargain effects and make the opponent sacrifice. But uh, yeah, as long as you can keep producing creatures, it's going to be very difficult for the opponent to keep anything in play until they answer Grave Pact itself. So this is bomb level enchantment. Triple black can be a bit challenging on the mana base, but it's certainly worth it once you cast it. Leyline of the Void, another sideboard to graveyard hate card for constructed. Give it an F for limited. Necropotence, this one is also incredibly interesting. Triple black mythic rare enchantment saying skip your draw step. Not too happy so far, but it does get better. Whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. Okay, I guess we don't really care about that too much. But now we get to the exciting part. Pay one life, exile the top card of your library face down. Put that card into your hand at the beginning of your next end step. Yeah, this turns into a very interesting card draw engine where you can kind of front load all your card draw and hopefully by curving out perfectly and finding the right interaction or potentially life gain, you can keep uh, fueling the necropotence. But it does have some drawbacks as well, skipping your draw step. If you're low on life, you may not be able to use it and triple black not being the easiest to cast. So an incredibly powerful card from Magic's past and... Uh, very interested to see how this one plays out in Limited as well. I'll start out with a conservative C+, but uh, we'll have to wait and see how it actually plays out. Could end up being a total disaster for all I know, since it's been such a long time that I've seen it in action. Very powerful in the right deck, especially if your deck is somewhat combo-oriented. Then there's Oppression, one and double black for a rare enchantment, saying whenever a player casts a spell, that player discards a card. It is symmetrical, and uh, we're investing the three mana enchantment for starters, although the opponent's more likely to be the one discarding first. Uh, not a huge fan of oppression. There's a couple, I guess, uh, edge cases where it could be nice alongside waste knot, which is also part of this sheet. Um, but yeah, let's just give this a D and move on. Oversold Cemetery, another weird enchantment. Two mana rare, saying at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have four or more creature cards in your graveyard, you may return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So it requires a bit of setup, and uh, the payoff may not always be there, but it is relatively cheap to get on the battlefield at least. And then hopefully you've got some maybe self-mill effects to fuel the graveyard, or some cheap creatures you can keep getting back. We'll play well with like cheap death touch creatures, like the one mana... Uh, warehouse Tabby, for instance, I can think of. So, definitely has its uses. Not super high on it, so we'll just go with a C here. Then there's the Polluted Bonds, a 5 mana rare enchantment. It says, whenever a land enters a battlefield under an opponent's control, that player loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. So, the effect is powerful. The problem is, Polluted Bonds costing 5 mana means the opponent has plenty of opportunities to play lands already. So they may only need to play two or three more lands for the rest of the game. And sometimes they can just ignore the polluted bonds altogether. So not a huge fan. Gets a D. And then there's Sanguine Bond. Five mana rare enchantment. Whenever we gain life, target opponent loses that much life. Life gain is not a heavily supported theme in the set. So not going to be all that exciting for limited. But uh, yeah, in Constructed can set up some fun two-card infinite combos. And then a Stab Wound, a three-mana uncommon enchantment aura, and enchants the opposing creature usually, giving it minus two, minus two. And at the beginning of the upkeep of Enchanted Creatures Controller, that player loses two life. So this can just be a straight-up removal spell if the creature is small enough. But what's usually more fun is to shrink down a creature that's maybe like a 3-3, three, three, Turn it into a 1-1 that you can, for the most part, ignore if you have some evasive creatures, perhaps. And then slowly watch as the opponent bleeds to death with their own creature, losing them two life turn after turn. So that's kind of the idea behind Stamp Wound. And yeah, can be a very interesting uh, win condition slash removal spell. So at the very least gets a C, might even get to the C plus range. And then Vampiric Rites is the sacrifice outlet I mentioned earlier. When talking about the various Act of Treason effects, one mana uncommon enchantment can pay one on a black, sacrifice a creature, 
gain one life and to draw a card. So we'll play well with your Rants aggro deck where you can sacrifice your tokens turn after turn and potentially keep making more of them. Could also play well with those active treason effects. So those are the types of synergies you're looking for. Cards that replace themselves with more tokens essentially. Um, otherwise it may not be worth the initial investment. Although at least as a one mana enchantment you can always sacrifice it to bargain. So at the very least a C might even go into the C plus range. Definitely playable. And then there's a waste knot to go with your other discard effects. There's not many of them. We saw the one common in black for four mana to discard two. And then we saw the uh, oppression, the three mana enchantment. So those are the types of cards you want to pair with waste knot. Saying whenever an opponent discards a creature, we get to make a 2-2 black zombie. Whenever an opponent discards a land, and double black. And whenever an opponent discards a non-creature non-land card, we draw. So just a discard payoff. And I don't think it's going to be easy to make that work in limited, so I'll go with a D. Then we get to the red enchantments, starting with Aggravated Assault, saying for 5 mana, untap all creatures you control. If it's a main phase, there is an additional combat phase, followed by an additional main phase. You can only use it as a sorcery. So extra attack steps after an initial 8 mana investment. So kind of pricey. Uh, the payoff could potentially be there, especially when paired with some flying creatures that can maybe keep attacking. Um, yeah, not super high on this, but the power level is undeniable once it gets going. So I'll give it a C. A Blood Moon. Not very good in limiteds when most people are just playing basic lands, but uh, could have some interesting applications in Constructed, punishing greedy mana bases, and uh, especially uh, before we get fetch lands on Arena, which can potentially fetch a basic lands to get around it. Otherwise, non-basic lands are mountains. So now your blue-white dual land only makes red mana, which is going to make some people very sad. Uh, as far as limited is concerned, just an F. Don't think about it. A dragon Mantle, a one-man enchantment aura at Uncommon, enchants a creature. When it enters, we draw a card, so it replaces itself, assuming the opponent didn't kill our creature in response. And then the enchanted creature essentially gains fire breathing, can pay a red to give it one extra power until end of turn. So this is perfect for your celebration decks as a cheap permanent, also good to sacrifice to bargain, and it's also just a useful effect to maybe put on an evasive creature to deal more damage, pairs well with any first strike or double strike creature as well. So there's a lot to like about a dragon mantle, give it a C+. Fiery Emancipation's back, 6 mana, a rare enchantment. Says if a source we control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals triple that damage to that permanent or player instead. I believe this used to be a mythic rare, so they downgraded it. So we might see more of it in action. And yeah, this card's pretty sweet in any aggressive strategy. This can be the finisher you need to close out the game. Plays very well with burn spells, uh, and also very nice with cards like the uh, Catapult, now dealing a lot more damage with each activation. So Emancipation, at the very least a B, um, could be convinced to give it an A. It is still a 6-man enchantment that requires a bit of prior setup. It doesn't always have an immediate impact at the turn we play it, but in the right board state this can just end the game the turn we play it, which is of course the preferred outcome. Then there's a Goblin Bombardment, 2-mana rare enchantment, and this is another sacrifice outlet to pair with your Act of Treason. Sacrifice a creature at any point to deal 1 damage to any target. So that can pair very well with any effects that steal opposing creatures. Of course, as a rare, we're not going to encounter it very often. But also just good in your red-black rat deck, where you've got plenty of tokens to sacrifice. Maybe the opponent blocks one of your many attacking rats, and then at least the one that's being blocked can still be sacrificed for 1 extra damage. So pretty flexible in the right deck. And I'll go with B for Bombardment. Impact Tremors, also a card that wants to be played in a token deck. Two mana, uncommon enchantment, saying whenever a creature enters the battlefield under our control, Tremors deals one damage to each opponent. Doesn't necessarily impact the board, but it can potentially impact the opponent directly. Somewhere between a C and a D. I'll start with C for Impact Tremors. And uh, maybe this is 
the finisher you need for the rat decks if they can successfully attack. A Ley Line of Lightning is uh, partially playable in limited, I suppose. Can pay one extra mana when casting a spell to deal one damage to target player or planeswalker. So maybe this can also pair with your uh, uh, Virtue of Courage enchantments at Mythic. But for the most part, I would avoid it and give it a D. Mana Flare. Now this one's incredibly interesting too. Two in a red for a rare enchantment saying whenever a player taps a land for mana, that player adds one mana of any type that a land produced. So this essentially doubles your mana produced from lands, which this is uh, of course a double-edged sword. We're also giving the opponents double the mana and they get to untap with all that extra mana first. And that doesn't sound like a great plan. Although if you build your deck around Mana Flare, where you've got a ton of expensive payoffs, then maybe you can break the symmetry and make it worth it. So yeah, definitely look to play this in kind of a teamer adventure value deck where you've got some ramp and then some expensive payoffs to make use of all that extra mana. And then hope that the opponent doesn't kill you after untapping with all their extra mana, of course. So yeah, a risky card, but... I think it's actually playable under the right circumstances. So I'll give it a D still, but this is one I'm more excited to try out myself. Then we've got a Raid Bombardment, another payoff for having lots of small creatures. Three mana uncommon enchantment saying whenever a creature we control with power two or less attacks, Bombardment deals one damage to the player or planeswalker that creature is attacking. Is this better or worse than Impact Tremors? At least with Impact Tremors, you don't have to attack with anything to deal the damage, so you can just kind of sit there, maybe sacrifice some of your tokens that you produce. With Raid Bombardment, you're committed to attacking, could still maybe sacrifice them after attacking, and it can also have an immediate impact when you play it if you turn the team sideways, whereas with Impact Tremors, you need to play stuff afterwards. So they're about on the same level, I would say. Um, so we'll go with C for Raid Bombardment. And then a Repercussions, another very strange one. One and double red for a Mythic Rare Enchantment, saying whenever a creature is dealt damage, Repercussion deals that much damage to that creature's controller. So what does that mean? It means that you don't want your creatures to take damage, otherwise you're gonna feel it. And it is once again a symmetrical effect, so it also impacts you the same way it does your opponent. So yeah, it's gonna be difficult to break the symmetry. Maybe you've got a few burn spells, and then you can damage the opponent's creatures while damaging the opponent directly. So it's kind of doing an impression of the 4-mana legend we saw earlier as well. Um, of course, could be fun in commander games where you pair it with Blasphemous Act, but that's not a card we have access to, sadly. So yeah, I'm pretty skeptical about Repercussion. Is it a D or is it an F? Uh, I guess we'll go with a D. Maybe there's some weird scenario where it's still worth running. Then there's Shared Animosity, 3 mana, a rare enchantment, saying whenever a creature you control attacks, it gets plus 1 plus 2 until end of turn for each other attacking creature that shares a creature type with it. Outside of fairies, there's not a heavily supported uh, creature type in any deck. Um, going over the red cards, might be a couple goblins and maybe some humans. But again, not a heavily supported theme, so I don't think Shared Animosity is going to be worth it at the end of the day, so it gets a D as well. So yeah, lots of uh, pretty poor cards for Limited at least in this uh, extra sheet, but there's of course a few very nice ones as well. Sneak Attack I don't think is one of them for mana Mythic Rare Enchantment. Can pay a red at any point and then put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. That creature gains haste and sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Are there situations where this could be good? Sure, if you build your deck around it full of expensive creatures, but usually you prefer keeping those creatures in play, and a lot of the creatures kind of cap out at six or seven mana anyways, so you're not too far from just hard casting them once you get sneak attack in play. It's not like we're cheating Eldrazi onto the battlefield in limited. So yeah, sneak attack also gets a D. And then we get to the green enchantments, Defense of the Heart. I do like quite a bit for limited, a four mana mythic rare enchantment saying at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls three or more creatures, 
sacrifice defense of the heart and search your library for up to two creature cards putting those cards onto the battlefield and then shuffle so it seems pretty easy to meet that requirement and then you just get to find your two best creatures and put them in play so sounds like a great deal to me and i'll give it an a Doubling Season, one of my favorite magic cards, 5 mana Mythic Rare Enchantment, doubles tokens, counters, doubles the fun pretty much. Now there's not a huge amount of creature tokens in the set, especially not in green, but there are a couple of counters and uh, there are also the aura roll tokens which count as tokens which we can actually double with Doubling Season as well. Um, only the one Planeswalker which we can ultimate if we uh, play it with Doubling Season out. So again, there's a lot of ridiculous scenarios you can get yourself into with the doubling season in play. And I highly recommend giving it a try. And uh, hopefully you end up with enough synergy. Otherwise, you'll have to just try it out and construct it instead. But uh, yeah, doubling season, I'll give a B. Maybe in black green, you have both food tokens and rats you can double. That might be a good home for it. Then we get Garrick's Uprising. This is a pretty nice payoff for that red green deck that I kept mentioning wanting creatures with power 4 or greater. And now whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters, we get to draw a card. All our creatures also have trample. And when we play Uprising, if we already controlled a large creature, we get to draw a card. So yeah, a nice card draw engine for those red-green decks specifically. And uh, as such, maybe give it a C. Still kind of narrow, not too many decks will want it, so you should be able to pick it up pretty late. Ground Seal, one and a green for an uncommon enchantment. When it enters draw card, cards and graveyard can be the targets of spells or abilities. Just kind of a cheap cantrip to enable your bargain synergies. Not much more than that. Gets a C. Then we've got Hardened Scales, but as we mentioned, not too many plus one counters in the set. So it's going to be difficult to get a ton of synergy going with it. So also gets a D. Leyline of Abundance has two or three mana creatures that can synergize with it. Otherwise, an eight mana mana sink to put a plus one counter on each creature you control. Kind of expensive to activate, so a D for Leyline. And Nature's Will, four mana a rare enchantment, saying whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, tap all lands that player controls and untap all lands you control. Pretty weird effect as well. Um, I guess if you have some evasive creatures or tramplers this can kind of double your mana in some way still a bit awkward to set up and i don't think i'm all that interested to be fair so i'll give it a d and then parallel lives is the slightly watered down version of doubling season but it only costs four as opposed to five and since there aren't a ton of counters in the set to begin with parallel lives might actually be the better of the two just because it's one cheaper still doubles all our tokens so doubles creature tokens as well as aura tokens and that we might be able to generate also works with treasures so has quite a few synergies still just need to be on the lookout for them so i'll give this a b as well and then primal vigor completes the doubling trifecta now primal vigor is also kind of a double-edged sword since this applies to both our tokens and counters as well as the opponents. So this one is not quite as free as uh, Doubling Season or Parallel Lives, but still pretty fun if you can play it in the right deck, I think. So I'll give this a C, but uh, this one comes with a bit of an asterisk where it can be dangerous against a specific opponent that has a lot of tokens or counters themselves. Prismatic Omen, one on a green rare enchantment saying lands we control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. So it can kind of fix our colors in a weird convoluted way. I would rather play a Prophetic Prism. And then a Season of Growth, one on a green enchantment and uncommon. Rewards us for targeting our creatures as we now get to draw a card when we cast a spell that targets the creature we control. Not that common in the sets, since if we make an aura token, it's not actually a spell that's being cast that targets our creature, I believe. So that doesn't necessarily do it, and there's very few kind of regular auras in the set. Um, but we can still scry one whenever a creature enters under our control. So maybe that's good enough. Um, still seems kind of questionable in most decks. Give it a C. 
and then a natural growth can be a nice finisher kind of similar to a fiery emancipation just uh, can end the game if you already have a significant board presence that's ready to attack by doubling the power and toughness of each creature you control also happens during the opponent's turn at the beginning of combat so also good on defense of course quadruple green being the main hurdle so hopefully you've got some mana fixing to help out but if you get it down it can certainly do a lot of damage so i'll go c plus on a natural growth this one may be a bit more challenging to cast despite being cheaper than the fire emancipation and then utopia sprawl last but certainly not least this card might be the card with the biggest impact on historic as a format as a one mana accelerant that can't easily be taken out by removal does have to enchant a forest but still works with your uh, shock lines as well so enchants a forest for a single green as it enters choose a color and whenever enchanted forest is tapped for mana its controller adds an additional one of that chosen color also works very nicely with any effects that untap your lands as you can make two mana now with that one land and uh, in limited this also seems awesome a one mana accelerant that fixes your colors just need to make sure you've got that turn one forest and then also an enchantment you could sacrifice to bargain once you no longer need it so i think i'm maybe going crazy but i'll give this a b this one seems awesome okay and that kind of uh, sums up our entire set review this set has a lot going on the enchanting tales should add a lot of replayability to the set so i'm definitely looking forward to trying it out as always if you want to support the channel and want access to the spreadsheet which includes all the card ratings we discussed today which i will also keep up to date as time goes on since i'm sure some of these ratings might fluctuate over time then you can head on over to my patreon page or become a twitch subscriber maybe using your free twitch prime that's always very much appreciated but for now i want to thank everyone for watching hope you enjoyed and as always have a nice day i also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd